If you're anything like me, you probably discovered the Kid Leroy from his Lyrical Lemonade music video for the song Let Her Go. Maybe you were on him even earlier and discovered him through Juice World or that snippet that Lil Skies posted about a song they have together. But regardless, once I listened to that song, it was the same reaction I had when I heard All Girls Are The Same. I just knew this kid was going to be huge. But I wanted to know more and during my digging, I was able to find a dark side of the Kid Leroy that he's never spoken on and actively tried to suppress. If you're unfamiliar entirely, the Kid Leroy, whose real name is Charlton Howard, is an Australian rapper who's 16 years old and signed to Columbia Records, which is a division under Sony Music Entertainment, which is an important detail as we'll get to later. But he's also signed to a deal under Lil Bibby and his brother G Money's Grade A Productions. In an interview with XXL in 2019, where Lil Bibby talks about going from rapper to record label executive, he hints at signing the Kid Leroy and putting a plan together to help him take off. Similar to what he did with Juice World, he made some calls and got the Kid Leroy on Lyrical Lemonade because of the close relationship he has with Cole Bennett, since Lil Bibby is from Chicago and someone that Cole listened to growing up knew that scene very well. After all, Famous Dex was the first rapper that really elevated Cole's presence online. This interview was released in September of 2019, and we don't know when it was recorded, but let's say it was recorded in the beginning of September. He said he was trying to sign this Australian kid, which is the Kid Leroy, for an entire year, which means he was trying to sign the Kid Leroy since 2018. This Australian kid I'm very excited about, I think. How do you end up with an Australian kid? Um, I heard his music, and... That shit just blew me away. I've been trying to sign it for a whole year. <laughs> and everybody was on it, but we got it. And now we gotta put a plan together to make it. But the Kid Leroy really was not huge when he was 15, which would be 2018. And it makes sense for Lil Bibby to hear Juice World because Juice was in Chicago and already had a big song. All Girls Are The Same and Lucid Dreams were doing some fairly big numbers on SoundCloud, close to a million. It's not a huge stretch that someone would show that to G Money and it reaches the ears of Lil Bibby, but for a teenager from Australia, the absolute other side of the earth to reach the ears of Lil Bibby is very fishy. As a matter of fact, the entire come up of The Kid Leroy is fishy, and here's why. The EP that The Kid Leroy had was titled 14 with a Dream. This happened before he was signed to Bibby and he released it at age 15 but the songs were written and recorded while he was 14. What doesn't make sense is how does this 14 year old kid have these producers working on this project with him as well as this really good quality mix. He's in a pretty decent studio setup. At the age of 14, this is not normal. And the first thought that you might have that I had as well was that he was a rich kid and his parents were paying for him to get the studio time and engineers, producers, all of that. But that's not the case. In an episode of No Jumper that wasn't an official interview, the Kid Leroy says he grew up poor, which is actually true, but Adam asked him a very good question which was, how did you start recording? Because he had heard some of his songs on YouTube and SoundCloud that were released some years back, and this was the Kid Leroy's reply. When I was like young, I always used to take my mom's like, like iPhone 3 or whatever the fuck it was and just place it and just find YouTube beats and just rap over them, post mm -hmm. them on Facebook. And, you know, and then eventually one day when I was like 12, I posted a video and this guy um, locally in Sydney was like, oh, I have a studio, come through, like, you know, you can use it for free whenever you want. Like, you know, we got producers here, da, 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 da. The engineer would just record me and it was, it, I mean, he wasn't even a proper engineer. He was just like a guy who just was like learning how to record. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd go through and just pick beats, YouTube beats, just go on them and just make songs. And then I would just post them to SoundCloud. And the guy um, ended up becoming, I guess, like kind of like a manager or whatever. So we are just working on way, just posting it and seeing what it would do. He was very dismissive and borderline insulting at this guy whose garage he apparently used to record in. But I knew this was a key point in figuring out how the Kid Leroy developed because when it comes to young rappers, especially as young as he was, 13, 12, 13, 14, there's absolutely no way in hell they're doing everything themselves. Chief Key, for instance, had been releasing music since he was around 12, if I recall correctly. 
but in his case, he had a DJ Ken, who was a recording engineer and producer who would make the beats as well as get Chief Keef recorded and then put out these songs. He was that older figure that knew the process and music, and Chief Keef just had to rap, and this is who I needed to find, and I managed to find him and get all of the details of his relationship with the kid Leroy and how he helped build and shape him as an artist. Basically, Dr. Dre to this kid, and how he was left behind with nothing at all. The guy's name was Marcus, who also went by the name DJ Lady Killer. This is his Instagram on the screen. And he was a DJ living in Adelaide, which is a city in southern Australia. He would be throwing parties and events as well as DJing them, just bringing people together. And after he had finished high school, he came into contact with the kid Leroy, who was just going by the name Charlton in 2015. How this happened was that Marcus started to learn how to make beats and giving them to some friends. And people reached out to him on Facebook all the time because he was promoting these events and had a fairly well-known reputation in his city for being a DJ. One of the people that messaged him was the kid Leroy, but he didn't really pay attention to his Facebook messages. But there was another young girl who was fairly popular that sent a message to Marcus, and he looked at her message which said something along the lines of, you should let my friend Charlton perform at one of your parties, and if Marcus did that, then she would help him promote the party because she was popping online. This isn't the first time Leroy was going to use a female to get attention from a figure he wanted to use. A very clever tactic even at a young age. This is also the first inconsistency with the kid Leroy's telling of his come up story because in his official No Jumper interview he says that when he was 12 years old he posted a video on Facebook about him rapping to a beat and he got hit up by this guy who's Marcus which is wrong. He not only contacted Marcus first but when he didn't get a reply he sent a popular girl to contact him for him. Not only that, but he says the guy who reached out to him was in Sydney, another lie. Marcus was in the city Adelaide, which is far from Sydney. But anyway, the weekend that this party was going to happen, Marcus met up with Leroy, and before that, he took him to his home studio setup, which is the one that Leroy briefly mentioned, and tried to brush over in his first and second talk with Adam22. Marcus had some Logitech speakers, the demo version of FL Studio, and a Rode microphone, but he recorded three songs of Leroy during that session, and they were off to the party. The kid Leroy performed at the party, and Marcus was surprised, as was everyone else. He had a really great performance and stage presence. People loved him. He saw talent in the kid, no pun intended, and decided to work with him and develop him. Marcus himself wasn't a rapper, so he started pushing the kid Leroy and telling people that's his artist, like a Dre and Eminem. All the clout that Marcus had as a local DJ was rubbing off on Leroy as well. Every weekend, Leroy would come to Marcus's house and spend the entire weekend working on music. Keep in mind that Adelaide is west of New South Wales, which is the southern region of Australia where Sydney is that Leroy claims he's from, although he only spent some time there. Sydney to Adelaide is over a 14 hour drive, so it was impossible for these guys to work every weekend, and that's because Leroy wasn't from Sydney. He was living in Broken Hill, which is west of New South Wales as well. Leroy would eat at Marcus's house, sleep there, and record. But when they first started, Leroy didn't really have any songwriting ability or understand making the music. He just knew how to rap in the traditional way because, as he said in interviews, he really looked up to and grew up on rappers like Eminem and Tupac and Kanye, which is probably shocking if you listen to any of the Kid Leroy's music now, because it's barely any actual rapping and more just melodies and singing. This was 2015 though, and Marcus saw the wave shifting to more melodic styles with rappers like Young Thug and Travis Scott taking off. So he encouraged Leroy to start using autotune, which Leroy was heavily against. And once again, this is shocking because that's all of his music right now. But he listened and Marcus even started writing songs for him, which is why in his early music, he was rapping about more aggressive topics. Here's a short clip of a music video they did over a young MA's Ooh beat. So they're working together all the time for about a year and Marcus was fully invested in this kid. He changed all of his names on social media from DJ Lady Killer including a SoundCloud to Dream Team, which was their group name. They were doing more performances, some weddings, and even got a sponsor from a shop in Adelaide. And at one point, Marcus decides to visit the Kid Leroy and his mom 
at their home in Broken Hill, Australia, which was a very, very poor area. They were pretty much living in a church, and during this time frame that they were working together, like any kid, Leroy wanted all of the attention on him. Marcus considered working with other rappers, producing for them, recording them, but Leroy always pushed against it. And as Marcus even told me, there is a lot of racism that goes on in Australia, and he knew other rappers, African rappers, that were more talented than Leroy. But a young white kid that was doing this, rapping over there, was really unique and had a much higher chance of blowing up, so he decided to go all in on him. They were consistently making covers to popular songs, and Marcus told them that one day they were going to meet these artists whose songs they were remixing. If you look on YouTube, you can find one that was re-uploaded of Drake's non-stop, but many have been deleted, and one of them was Future's Codeine Crazy. And you can clearly hear in the track Leroy shouting out Dream Team multiple times. Things began to change in early 2016, when Marcus was hit up on SoundCloud DM by a DJ by the name of DJ Ziggy, who had heard their music and gave them the opportunity to come out to Sydney and perform it and they would spin it at a radio station that Ziggy hosted for Sony Music. This was a massive opportunity because Sydney is the big city in that region and the place to be when it came to music. They went to Sydney and didn't meet Ziggy right away, but met one of the executives who worked at Sony Music and they performed some of their songs in front of him at an Airbnb and he was impressed but told them that hip hop wasn't really big in Sydney or Australia. But he knew a couple of people at the record label that would be able to help them. They also recorded a music video to their song Every Day in Sydney, which I'll play you a short clip of right now. Now who is DJ Ziggy? He's an important figure in all of this when you're trying to put all the pieces together. Ziggy is Ziganor, who is both a tour DJ, performing DJ, with a focus on R&B, hip hop, and Afrobeat, which is where Leroy and Dream Team fell under the umbrella of. But he also does management. He runs Art Management Group, who if you go to their website, it shows two artists currently, Manu Crooks and Creed the Kid. But on his LinkedIn, you can see that he also managed the Kid Leroy, but doesn't anymore. And even in the first talk with Adam22, Leroy clearly says that his manager was Ziggy. Just keep this in the back of your mind for now, because they didn't meet with Ziggy when Marcus went there, just a person at Sony Music. Marcus was heading back to Adelaide to meet and speak with his family. He thought they were all going back together, him, Leroy, and Leroy's mother. But Leroy's mother said that they had to stay in Sydney. Marcus had family things to tend to. Keep in mind he had graduated high school the previous year and had taken a year off just to focus on this music and developing Leroy. He needed to explain things to his family, let them know that this was about to take off and all of this effort he put in was finally worth it. He asked Leroy's mother how this was going to work when it came to recording and putting out music. And she said that it wasn't an issue. Leroy was just going to record and send the vocals to Marcus. He says okay, but he doesn't hear from them for about two months or so. And people on the Dream Team page start asking what's going on. Was there going to be new music from them? What was happening? And he had no idea what to say. This is where I believe things went sour and where I start putting together a storyline that makes sense. At some point while in Sydney, either DJ Ziggy or somebody at Sony Music told Leroy that he didn't need Marcus, that he was the star, he would make more money, everything that Marcus was offering, they had better engineers, better producers, and better studio equipment than he had. And he followed along and abandoned Marcus. He used him as a stepping stone and left him behind, unappreciative of everything he had done for him. This is where he started recording his 14 with a Dream EP, which is an EP that DJ Ziggy has reposted to his SoundCloud until this day. Not only did they leave Marcus behind, but they didn't even bother to tell him that Leroy was going to pursue a solo career. They just strung him along. It was six months after he had been in Sydney without getting a reply back from them and Marcus decided to release a solo song, and even though he wasn't a rapper, he would start doing it. But this is when Leroy's mom hit him up and told him to take down the song and video because Leroy wasn't in it. She was actually angry and told him to delete everything about the kid Leroy that they had ever done together and put on social media or she was going to hit up their lawyers 
and force him to do so. This is where all my sayings about how record labels try to erase an artist's entire past history is proven correct. Because if you google the Kid Leroy, you can't find anything that I've shown you in this video. You can't even find any music before 14 with a dream. And that's exactly what they want. But she had no legal right for this to be removed. Because she didn't own any of it. Marcus had possession of them and sent me what I've shown you today. And if you want to see the full music videos to all of these songs, just follow me on Twitter at the mind of HY. It should be on your screen right now. I'll put them on there. But he was still scared, so he deleted all the stuff on social media, SoundCloud, and their Instagram page, but kept a lot on his hard drive. My theory is that at this point, they were already signed or getting funding and direction from a record label. Because in the beginning, I said he was signed to Columbia Records, which is a division of Sony Music. And to remember that, because DJ Ziggy had that radio station for Sony Music. And they went to perform for an executive that worked at Sony Music. Leroy even said that Ziggy was the one that let him use the studio. In an interview, no jumper. They would record him. And he lied, saying that he was doing all this stuff by himself up until that point. Which is clearly false in every way. Ever since then, Leroy's mother was acting nice to Marcus with the ulterior motive of getting this footage that he had. She would always mention the question and say she wanted the music videos that they had recorded for a documentary they were going to make. But he resisted it and knew it was fake. The Kid Leroy also joined this competition in Triple J called Unearthed High in 2018, and he was one of the finalists. This is where the narrative that they want to have planted before he gets signed is. Keep in mind, he was already recording in Sydney for at least a year at this point when it came to his project 14 with a dream. But his label has to create some sort of a story for people that ask, okay, how did this kid blow up? And the story, if you just Google him, you'll come to the conclusion of, oh, he joined this competition for high school kids on Earth at High. He was a finalist and someone at a record label heard his music and decided to sign him. When you know that's not the truth now. One of my thoughts was that the song Winning was about his relationship with Marcus, just from this clip. It adds up because they really were close like glue. He was spending weekends at his place and making music for a year or more, and he switched up on him and left him behind with absolutely nothing. Then says it's not because he wanted to, and it might have been the pressure from either DJ Ziggy or Sony Music that said, it's either you sign with us and we blow you up, or you stay with this guy and we're not interested. And he decided to do what's best for him. When it comes to the little Sky snippet that he posted on Instagram, it's obvious that was done through some sort of connections. And how Lil Bibby found out about him was likely through the same process. Someone from Sony showing his music to Bibby, which led him to wanting to sign him. And the touring with Juice World is obviously because he signed with Grade A Productions, which is the same record label that Juice World is on. Yet Leroy says on his interview that Lil Skies randomly hits him up to do a song, and when he posts it on his story, Cole Bennett hits Leroy up. I don't believe that BS for a second. He connected with Cole because of Bibby, but on his official interview with No Jumper, he says that his manager is Pete, which is not Ziggy anymore. And the Pete he's referring to is likely Peter Jadongo, who was Juice World's manager and got his start in Chicago booking shows for local artists. Pete is with Grade A Productions as well. So clearly between last year and now, Ziggy is no longer in the picture, which is why Leroy isn't on the art management website anymore. And my theory is that they might have bought him out of the management deal or something because there's no way that Ziggy didn't get any paperwork with him and gave him all his studio time just so he could get signed and profited off of by someone else. That was literally my goal for like the last two or three years was just, I want to get a video with Cole, want to get a video with Cole. So I remember when uh, like Lil Skies reached out to me and we like made a song and he posted it on his Instagram and Cole Bennett liked the video and then Cole Bennett followed me out. So was freaking, he like one of the first uh, people that was like a bigger artist he did a song with, with Skies? Yeah, Okay. no, 100%. What I don't get from this is, how can you just leave this person behind with absolutely nothing? 
None of these opportunities would have come to fruition if it wasn't for him and guiding your sound from just regular rapping to the type of music that you make now. The guy's a DJ, so you could have at least made him your touring DJ like Travis Scott did with Chase B. But my thoughts is that Leroy and his mother are just the kind that see people as tools to be used and take them to whatever goal they're trying to get to. After all, he said in an interview that he used these girls he knew that got invited to Ray Schremer's room to play their music and get them in there as well. And he originally used the girl to get Marcus to notice him and perform at his party. And these are only two instances we know of. He even said that he does this all the time. Like I remember um, Ray Schremer. Right. When they came, I was waiting at the front of the hotel, trying to find a way in. And then eventually, like, a girl we knew was invited to one of the homies' hotels. And then we ended up going through like that because she cut on the music in the room. was like, these guys are from Australia. They're downstairs. And there was wow. just some funny shit. Like, yeah, we do, like shit like that every Sending time. Sending a girl as a mole up into the ho- rapper's <laughs> hotel room to play your music is the most fire shit I ever heard. If in his No Jumper interview, Leroy said that Marcus was sort of a manager. And in hindsight, of course, Marcus should have gotten him on paperwork. But like most people, he didn't think that he would be abandoned after having done so much for this kid for such a long time. And the sacrifice he made really pausing his own life and not recording with other artists, not going to college, To invest into this kid and getting absolutely nothing in return or even a shred of credit for what the kid Leroy has become, pretty much getting erased from history. And as a person, that's not something I could ever be able to do or even live with myself. I personally hate being lied to and seen as an idiot and my BS detector is one of my biggest assets. And when it came to the kid Leroy, nothing from the story he was bringing up made any logical sense. And it's full of lies, as we just showed today. This video was never supposed to happen. I had zero plans of making a part two. But I really want to thank our sponsor for motivating me to make this. And our sponsor today is none other than the Kid Leroy's DJ slash producer that decided to name himself after a French Montana ad lib, Han. This is the DM exchange that I had with this individual that I'll quickly run through. He said, yo bro, your video was inaccurate, but I can give you some insight. Nah, if the kid Leroy wants to come on for an interview and answer questions, he's welcome. I'm not interested in talking back and forth with the sidekick. LOL, he doesn't care about it. I care though. You're putting out false information with no real evidence. It's cool if you want to keep deleting my YouTube comments, but be careful what you say on future video because there's a difference between discussing opinions and trying to slander someone's name for clicks. The next day, the original Dark Side of Kid Leroy video was taken down on a copyright strike, and the guy DMs me with a bunch of laughing emojis, pretty much gloating that he took it down, and he even replied to one of the comments saying, you would take down a video too if it was spreading lies about you, laughing emoji. Clearly this idiot admitted that he took the video down not because it violated fair use in copyright law, but because it was lies, which it wasn't and that's illegal to false copyright strike, so brilliant move there. Not only that, but I hid this guy's Instagram name when I made the video about receiving a copyright strike because I have the courtesy and don't want people spamming his comments because I don't like when people go harass someone. But what does this idiot decide to do? He decides to message all of these Kid Leroy stamp pages and gather all of his fans and have them spam my Instagram comments and my Twitter replies. So I don't care about hiding his Instagram anymore. And I hand out blocks left and right. Now we're at what, strike two here? Maybe even three? Then there was the thinly veiled threat, the false takedown, the spam, and gloating over it. So I give this guy one more lifeline. And I tell him, I'm giving you one chance to remove the false strike on the original video because it's getting lifted regardless. 24 hours from when I sent the first message to lift the strike. I expect it to be up by then. Well, it's been a hell of a lot longer than 24 hours and the video isn't up. So, the Kid Leroy, I know you're watching this. You can thank this genius on your team for the fact that this video even exists. Also, shout out to Housephone for mentioning the original video on the No Jumper podcast. 
and also roll this quick clip from Cam Girl. Bro, how about the fact that Kid Leroy, I, I seen that people are making videos about oh. his old videos. Hello, you seen. And they're getting fucking taken yep. down and it's everything. Strike, my boy. Bro, yeah, I was shit, finding out that. about everything. It just seems like industry plan-ish. Industry plan-ish. Hmm. You've got quite the hunch there, Cam Girl. So I decided to get on my Nardwar and really do some digging. You're going to get information with undeniable proof that even Marcus didn't know about. And the rabbit hole all starts with this one article from the Sydney Morning Herald back in March of 2004. Music helps smiling April cope with pain of TJ's death. The girlfriend of Thomas TJ Hickey, the young man whose death sparked the Redfern riot, is on the brink of being signed up for a recording contract. It sounds cool, let's see how it goes, 14-year-old April Seisman said after meeting music entrepreneurs last week. Sloane Howard, the Kid Leroy's mother, of She Artist Management contacted April after reading in the Sun Herald how TJ's death had affected the teenager. April said her 17-year-old boyfriend's death after he was impaled on railings when his speeding bike spun out of control meant she did not dream anymore. But last week, Miss Howard, wife of music producer Nick Howard, said, She is absolutely beautiful and I really believe we can do something together. Perhaps she can start dreaming again. Miss Howard has just started her own record label and manages Pop Stars winner Scott Kane and Hot 30 winners Gemini. Her husband has produced and written music with Bardot, Sophie Monk, Delta Goodrum, and Selwyn. She will tomorrow take April to meet with industry professionals, including rap artist P. Diddy's producer, to establish the direction of April's musical career. A lot of rappers come out of Harlem and have real stories to tell. In Australia, they are mostly just copycats. April, on the other hand, has a story to tell from the heart, Miss Howard said. It is a message that will reach out to people through the music. We will get professionals from within the industry to help April all the way. When I read the story in Sunday's paper, I really felt I wanted to do something with her. Now I have met her, I am really vibed. It's very exciting. TJ's mother, Gail Hickey, said, I have seen April singing and dancing at home, and she's really good. This is a great opportunity for her, and it's really the first time I've seen her smiling like that since TJ died. April is also excited at the prospect of emulating her idols, Kellis and Missy Elliott. This is all freaky. It's great, she said. If you haven't already, please give this video a like. We're about to get into some good stuff, and it's very appreciated. Now that we read the article, we really gotta break it down. TJ was this aboriginal teenager who at 17 years old died after being impaled on these railings while riding his bicycle really fast. And people didn't believe that it was an accident. They believed the police were pursuing him and that led to his death. So riots sparked after this. The Kid Leroy's mother, who is Sloan Howard, and don't worry, there will be plenty of proof to corroborate this other than just the last name. She was the wife of a music producer named Nick Howard. And she was managing Scott Kane, who was the winner of this show, Pop Stars, that was basically the American Idol before American Idol in Australia. In 2003, he was the host of a show every morning, AMTV on D with Scott Kane on the Disney Channel in Australia. And he even went touring with Hilary Duff after making a song titled after her when she went on the Australian leg of her tour to over 12,000 people in the crowd. Now for Nick Howard, you see those names and maybe you'd think who the hell is Bardot, Sophie Monk, Delta Goodrum, and Selwyn. Or maybe you recognize a couple of the names. I didn't. Well, Bardot was an Australian girl group that was formed from the reality TV series Pop Stars in 1999. Both their debut single Poison and their self-titled debut album charted at number one in the Australian and New Zealand charts. Sophie Monk was one of the members of the group Bardot. But after they split in 2002, she released her own solo album, Calendar Girl, in 2003 that didn't do amazing, peaking at number 35 on the Australian albums chart, but the single, Inside Outside, performed well, peaking at number 5 on the Australian charts. She would continue to have a successful career in entertainment with roles in movies like Click, winning The Celebrity Apprentice Australia in 2015, a judge on 2016's Australia's Got Talent, starring in the third season of The Bachelorette Australia in 2017, and hosting Love Island Australia in 2018. Delta Goodrim was, and likely still is, a bona fide superstar, 
in that country. Her debut album, Innocent Eyes, released in 2003, was on top of the Australian charts for 29 consecutive weeks. She's had nine number one singles and 17 top 10 hits on the Australian charts, selling over 8 million albums worldwide, winning an MTV VMA award, and she's one of the coaches on The Voice Australia almost every year since 2012. This is who the Kid Leroy's father was writing or producing music for. I don't think it can possibly get any more industry than that. But I was able to find his dad's credits that shows the projects he's worked on. And man, is this a long list. But we'll just get through the names you guys will likely recognize. Keep in mind a majority of these credits are technical, which could mean a whole bunch of different things from engineering to transferring audio from one medium to another as they classify it on this site. You can see on your screen. But he had one hell of a list in the early 2000s. He has credits on Nelly's Hot in Here, Fat Joe's Loyalty, Nelly's Nellyville, Common, Go Common Classics, Fabulous, Pump It Up by Joe Bunning, and tons more. Also a quick side note about the Kid Leroy's sidekick Han. He didn't come into the picture until at least 2017 or 2018 when Ziggy was managing the Kid Leroy and he was back out in Sydney, who also got left behind. So the only things he knows are what Leroy and his mother told him. He has no idea what the history is and he's of course going to do anything he can to protect his golden goose. That's his meal ticket. Moving forward, where is the proof that Sloan Howard or Nick Howard are Leroy's parents? Well, here's some proof. Sloan Howard continuously promoting the Kid Leroy and Dream Team. Dream Team, Australia's hottest new talent, Charlton Leroy and DJ Lady Killer, aka Dream Team. Another great track from songwriter and artist Charlton Leroy and DJ Lady Killer, artist, producer, DJ, I Want It, Dream Team. Oh, I'm not done yet. She also ran this page Mama Capone Management because she was trying to be a manager and doing a whole bunch of other things we are going to cover a bit later. Most of these articles she shares are now defunct, of course. I'm so proud of you guys and you're done it all on your own. Keep up the great and hard work, boys. As you can see, it pays off. Going straight to the top. Charlton Leroy and Tiger, US approaching young Australian talent for opportunities abroad. Wake up, Australian record labels. Great talent is gone before you even knew that they existed. Charlton Leroy, DJ Lady Killer, aka Dream Team, are going straight to the top. Stay tuned and watch how it all unfolds. Then she shares a song you can no longer find, produced by Marcus, titled Work It Out. The whole Mama Capone management page was very scuffed alongside a couple of other things. And if you watched part one, something that might have made you side-eyed because it definitely had me thinking, yeah, that's a little weird, is that Leroy's mom was letting him at age 12 spend weekends and working on music at a 17-year-old's house. That's not something that most mothers would do even if you were really into music and they were supportive. And not only that, the amount of support both on her personal page and these other pages that she puts to pushing Leroy's music and career is similar to that of those child actor moms or pageant moms in America. Usually a supportive parent would just let them explore music as a hobby and not push for it as a career. But it wasn't too surprising when I found that she had countless posts of Kylie Jenner, Kendall Jenner, Kris Jenner, and how much she admired the Kardashians and what are the Kardashians other than Kris Jenner pushing her kids into fame. That really made more sense of the situation. There had to be some point in time that her management career didn't do well and she had a separation from her husband. My theory is that she got that management job of Scotty Keane originally through her husband. That's just a theory. And there have also been other people that said there were some things that she did that made the husband leave her. I'll just let your imagination try to think of what because I have zero proof on that and not going to put some wild accusation like that on somebody. But regardless, she was continuously running something else I found odd. On a post, she said model development contract opportunity. We're looking for a teenage girl aged between 13 to 17 who can be an ambassador and role model for teen girls in regional Australia, etc, etc, etc. And she had a bunch of these posts under so many different companies 
one of which was Pro Talent Australia, which is a defunct site. And on the Twitter page says, a professional acting and modeling agency in Broken Hill, New South Wales. The agency finds work for actors in all forms of media and provides on-site training. She had this one thing called She Organization, standing for Sloan Howard Entertainment, that she updated as her cover photo in March of 2019. There was also Underground Global Empire, that she was some sort of scout to get modeling talent and saying that these girls would get contracts to go overseas. But all of these things are defunct. And someone with a sustaining company isn't going to have five different ones with basically the same function in a span of three years. Not to mention she has like four different Facebook accounts with the same name. It seemed more like a hustle, if not something else entirely. His mom also made a post saying, My dear friend Eugenio, home in LA, you are by far the most stylish and inspirational man I know. I will be back next year while my son makes his record. Look forward to seeing you. This article wasn't a broken link, so I checked it out and damn, it's basically a video of this guy flexing his home. And in the article it says, photographer Jim Goldberg shows us around the home of Latin America's most prominent contemporary art collector. Born into a bottled fruit juice empire, he's the heir to the Jumex empire of juice. Eugenio Lopez Alonso changed the meaning of the family business forever when starting in the 90s, his Jumex collection revitalized the contemporary art scene in Mexico City. Then in 2013, the opening of his David Chipperfield designed Museo Jumex brought the city onto the global art circuit. At his house in Beverly Hills, Lopez has built a refuge for himself and some of his most loved pieces by contemporary masters including Andy Warhol, Jeff Koons, Bryce Martin, John Chamberlain, and Luis Bourgeois. Here we see Eugenio's collection through the eyes of world-renowned photographer and filmmaker Jim Goldberg. This guy is filthy rich, and Leroy's mother is really close friends with him as suggested by that post. And I mean, she even said she would be visiting him. Doesn't seem like a close friend that a dirt poor family growing up in project housing would have, huh? There was also the whole narrative that they're trying to paint that Leroy was really poor, especially in that Ghettos of Australia video from No Jumper where he says he grew up in basically project housing and was homeless. And to be fair, Marcus also said when he visited them in Broken Hill, he was living in what looked like a very poor area, basically in a church. And this may have been true for a small period of time, but I don't know, man. This kid grew up in a good family. Definitely from his father's side, who they conveniently never mention. The assumption people might make is maybe the father abandoned them, or he grew up without a father, neither of which are the case at all. It's actually quite the opposite. Here's a picture of the father with Leroy and his brother fishing. A picture from 2015 of them mini golfing with their dad in Terry Hills, which is a suburb north of Sydney. Leroy went to a private Catholic school in his early life. And there's another picture of him with his father and mother for seventh grade to interview for a boarding school. His father's always sharing his music. He shared the post from Acclaim magazine that has the interview where he talks about how he connected with Lil Skies. He shared a Juice World show that Leroy performed at, another interview with Leroy by Purple Sneakers, several photos from the Enmore Theater at the Juice World performance that the father may have took the photos himself and was there, another photo from that same performance in black and white that looks like it was taken by one of the photographers, one about Rolling Loud where he says, Rolling Loud Miami in May, great achievement mate. Very proud of how hard you work and how dedicated you are to your music. Can't wait. Another interview shared with Leroy sitting on a bench with Redfern written on it by Triple J. The only Aussie hip hop artist on the first iteration of Rolling Loud New York is straight out of Redfern. A very proud dad moment for sure. Is that a not enough proof that he's his dad? One of a picture in New York. The kid in NYC. We're all missing you so much, but very proud of all you're doing. Can't wait to catch up with you soon. Does that sound like someone who wasn't in his son's life? Sounds like a very supportive dad to me. He shared the song Too Much, posted a picture of Leroy and Bibby with the caption Times Square, NYC. He updated his profile picture twice to promote the song Diva that Leroy had with Lil Tecca. 
He had a post in June 2019 with this tag saying, Son, dream, love, truth, peace, dad, X. This is not the behavior of someone who just abandoned or forgot their son. So why is the mom always mentioned but never the dad? Nick Howard also runs his own studio, and he put up a picture saying, making music in the studio for the next six months. Woohoo! And you can see guitars surrounding him. In the live stream that Leroy did in his backyard, he pointed at the guitar and made sure to let everyone know that he knows how to play guitar. And I wonder who taught him how to play guitar. Hmm. In the interview with No Jumper, Adam explicitly asked Leroy, how did your parents feel on you doing music? And he says his mom was really supportive, but he never mentions his father. He doesn't want people knowing that his dad was as industry as it gets, having worked with some of the biggest stars in Australia, because it would shatter the entire narrative and the rags to riches story he's trying to cosplay. His family owns a damn boat. The perception of Lil Uzi Vert is usually that of a really nice, fun, cool rapper. He's usually very patient with his fans, doesn't do anything negative towards them, and other than his satanic imagery and references sometimes in the past, he's managed to paint an overall positive image of himself, especially when he made himself look like a victim in the year leading up to the release of Eternal A Take, with Don Cannon and DJ Drama being painted as the villains. Lil Uzi Vert does have more of a dark and manipulative side that many people, especially his fans, seem to conveniently ignore, and that's what we're going to cover today, alongside his actual come up story, which is very hazy. If you watch my video on what happened to the real Uzi, which you should definitely watch, it'll be in the top right cards and linked in the description, I tell you guys how I accidentally found Lil Uzi Vert in early 2014 on Twitter searching for someone else. This was still after his Purple Thoughts EP, which was his first official project, and he would soon take off. But how did it happen so quickly after his first EP? Lil Uzi Vert talks about how he really started rapping, but one of the individuals responsible for discovering Lil Uzi Vert was DJ Diamond Cuts in Philadelphia. Uzi used to go to her studio all the time with his friend. His friend was the actual rapper, and Lil Uzi was just tagging along. But one day, he decided to go to the studio himself and record. This was when Diamond Cut's fiance was there, and he told her that he really liked this kid Samir, who was Lil Uzi Vert, who at the time just went by Uzi Vert. She checked his music out and met up with him, and she really liked him too, and they started making songs together, two of which are the songs What Do You Want and the song Uzi that's still up with the music video. Now Diamond Cut's said she played one of those songs on the radio, and that's when Don Cannon hit her up asking who the kid was that she just played during her set. And she said it was an artist she was working with. She had him under management at the time, and Cannon wanted to meet him. And apparently, Kanye was interested in signing him too, according to her. Keep this in the back of your mind though, because things get a little hazy and we get two conflicting stories later on. But moving forward, Don Cannon doesn't want to lose Lil Uzi Vert to Kanye West, or whoever else was trying to sign him. So he invited Uzi to come out to Atlanta with them in drama to see what they got going on. And once Lil Uzi Vert went to Atlanta, he really just stopped talking to Diamond Cuts and her husband altogether. She called Cannon asking what's up and he said that Uzi didn't really want to talk about what was going on. And then she ended up hearing from a third party that Uzi got signed to Atlantic Records via their joint venture partnership with Generation Now that is run by DJ Drama and Don Cannon. Atlantic ended up paying Diamond Cuts and her husband to get out of the management contract, and since then, she hasn't spoken to him in years. She even talks about how depressing this was to her. She put all this effort into building Uzi up for him to just be swooped by some others, and he himself abandoning her, using her resources as a stepping stone. This is where the story usually ends, and it's obvious from here DJ Drama and Ken and pushed him the rest of the way. But there is a very key individual that is rarely mentioned that had as much if not more of an important role in building Lil Uzi Vert than Diamond Cuts, and that is Reese LaFleur. Who is Reese LaFleur? Reese was a really good skateboarder growing up and built most of his connections through that. He even dropped out of college just to focus on skateboarding and he was living in Atlanta. Stevie Williams, 
The legendary skateboarder who's also behind the clothing brand DGK, or Dirty Ghetto Kids, started a skateboard slash boutique shop with Don Cannon in Atlanta called Skateteak. Keep in mind this was in 2008. In the grand opening that was on October 17, 2008, you can see on your screen from the Transworld article that they had performances by Flo Rida, Ludacris, Neo, Rich Boy, and other celebrities that showed up, including a performance by The Cool Kids and Asher Roth. This time period was also when Gangsta Grills, which is the legendary mixtape series hosted by DJ Drama, that would work with rappers like T.I., Jeezy, Lil Wayne, and many more was super poppin'. This meant that the boutique was always full of famous people and huge rappers, and this was a place that Reese would always chill. He was a great skateboarder and people took a liking to him as a person as well, and he built up a network with rappers, as well as a very close relationship with drama and canon. Keep in mind that Reese was not a rapper, but he got into rapping because of none other than Dom Kennedy. During the MySpace days, his homegirl sent him his music from 25th Hour The Project, specifically the song Still Lookin'. He went out to LA, Reese that is, and the girl linked him up with Dom Kennedy, and the two of them got really cool with each other. Reese still wasn't rapping, but he was a hype man for some of Dom Kennedy's shows, and he thought it was cool, so when he went back to Atlanta, he told Cannon and Drama about Dom Kennedy. One day while at the shop, Cannon was playing some beats, and Reese started freestyling. They rocked with it and encouraged him to rap, but he was still a bit hesitant and said that if he was going to rap, he was going to make a mixtape in a couple of days. Reese's friend bet him $200 if he could make a whole mixtape and it being good. So Reese took that as motivation and made a mixtape in four days, and they actually really enjoyed it. This was the beginning of 2011, and Don Cannon had hosted the mixtape, so it got some more attention. And what was the name of this mixtape? Reese vs. The World. Sound familiar to Lil Uzi Vert's mixtape title years later? During that time, at a sneaker store in Atlanta, Reese would run into Curtis Williams and Fat Man Key, also known as Key, when they were handing out CDs, and they linked up and made some songs together under the name 29. You should realize that early in Lil Uzi Vert's career, he was very close with Key as well. The next year, Reese would release his second mixtape of the series, Reese vs. The World 2, that was hosted by none other than Don Cannon, once again. One of the songs from this mixtape was Molly. And ASAP Yams was speaking to Reese and told him that he should do a one-two punch with music videos, like ASAP Yams had done with ASAP Rocky releasing Peso and Purple Swag. Reese released a video for Molly that was popular, and he was going to release another track, but he started having disagreements with Key, and it didn't happen. Yams' idea was that they would get Reese popping first, and then he would push Key and tune on like Rocky did with Ferg and the ASAP Mob but perhaps Key saw it as Reese was going to get all of the popularity or something of the sort, but there was a disagreement and they sort of went separate ways. Now we're at some time in late 2013, and Reese was friends with Lyle LaDuff, who is a producer for Don Cannon. He was at his crib, and Lyle told him he should check out this guy named Lil Uzi, and the song was Uzi. So this was likely made after he was working with Diamond Cuts. Reese thought it was great and asked where he lived, and Lyle said in Philly. Reese found his Twitter and Uzi had like 50 followers at the time, but he hit him up and told Uzi to call him on his number, and when he did, Uzi was fanning out, saying he loved the Molly music video and Reese as a rapper, as well as his swag, he was even trying to draw up his Tims like he did. This is where we get the conflicting stories, because Diamond Cuts and Cannon said that they discovered Lil Uzi Vert playing on the radio while Cannon was in Atlantic City. But Reese says that he was the one that put them onto Uzi. But Lyle LaDuff, who was the producer that showed Uzi to Reese, corroborated the original story, saying in an interview, How did you and Lil Uzi Vert meet? How did you begin composing music and beats for him? Don Cannon, his cousin, and I were headed to Atlantic City for a DJ gig Cannon had, and we were listening to the radio on the way. We hear the song named Uzi by a kid named Lil Uzi, and it was crazy. And the DJ kept yelling, he's from Philly, on air. The sound was so different from anything we've heard from the typical Philly rapper. Me and Cannon's cousin were telling Cannon he had to find this kid. Turns out the DJ playing the song was DJ Diamond Cuts, and she knew him. Cannon knew her and reached out, and after a week or so, we all FaceTimed him. A few weeks after that, Cannon went to Philly and met him. 
About a month later, Cannon told Uzi to move here, and he never left. But moving forward, he was sending Uzi a bunch of beats and doing music together. Reese was on the Under the Influence tour with Wiz Khalifa, thanks to DJ Drama, and Lil Uzi Vert got on that tour partially because of Reese LaFleur, and it was also how he met Don Cannon and Drama, according to Reese. He introduced them to him, and Uzi and Reese even had an album together called Home Economics that apparently never released. And there were two songs though that are still out there, that were released before the project, The Real Uzi, and that is Pretty Boy Anthem, featuring Lil B, and their song Faded. There's even a video of Uzi doing an interview where he says, that's the homie Reese, and teases his new mixtape, The Real Uzi. Cool. We, we made a studio. That's my boy Reese right there too. We made a studio. <laughs> we made a studio. And, um... This was in July 31st of 2014. So I'm guessing he was still cool and close with Diamond Cuts because he shouts her out and speaks fondly of her as well as saying she is his manager. Lil Uzi Vert is buzzing during this time and he had Meek Mill trying to sign him to Dream Chasers out there in Philly as well as Drama and Cannon trying to sign him. He had respect for Reese so he asked him what he should do. Reese told him that Drama and Cannon are like family to him, but Uzi should make a decision on what he felt was best for him and his future as an artist. Uzi was joking around via text with Reese saying that he should get both a Dream Chasers chain and a Don Cannon chain by making them think that he was going to sign to them. And Reese played along with the joke saying in a text, F what they talking about, go get that chain. And what Uzi did was he only screenshotted the part of the text thread and he sends it to Cannon and Drama. Of course, they're angry. Drama calls Reese and tells him to pull up to the studio. He berates him, calls him unloyal. He tells him that he knew they were trying to work a deal with Uzi and that he was going to sabotage that after they've known each other for over five years. Drama showed him the screenshot, but then Reese showed him the entire text thread with context. But they were still acting weird towards Reese as if he had betrayed them when he was clearly just joking or so he says. He hit up Uzi and asked him why the hell did he do that? And Uzi got really defensive. This was really manipulative behavior by Lil Uzi Vert. He wanted to get Reese out of the picture and get into the good graces of canon and drama because Reese was still their favorite. He was like family to them. My theory is that he saw Reese as a threat. But regardless, Reese fell back because he thought it was lame. But then, while Uzi was growing in popularity, he continuously kept tweeting crazy to Reese and throwing jabs at him online, but Reese continued to let it go. He stopped talking to Uzi and he stopped being around Uzi and Drama and Cannon and they distanced themselves from him even though they were legitimately like family with Reese having shown up for Thanksgiving dinners with them. Don Cannon and DJ Drama had told Reese they were going to blow him and Uzi up, but they took all of those resources instead and poured them towards Lil Uzi Vert. Slade the Monster, which was a producer on the track Chicks off of Reese vs. The World 2, was now working with Uzi, and so was Lyle LaDuff. They were supposed to sign Uzi and Reese, but they only signed Uzi. So what happens is that there's a show in Dallas on May 30th of 2015 that was Reese LaFleur, Post Malone, and Lil Uzi Vert. In order to promote the show, Post Malone, who is really just buzzing up right now from White Iverson, posts a flyer on his social media, so does Reese. But when Uzi posted the flyer, he had someone put a red X on Reese's face. So what Reese does is he hits up Uzi and told him that he was going to talk at the show. But when he walked up to Uzi, he said have a good show and asked him why he's doing all that stuff, really patronizing him on social media. And Uzi just played it off as a joke as usual. So Uzi continued doing this online though. And then this was when OG Mako blew up. And started tweeting saying that people don't give him or Reese LaFleur credit for what they've done for upcoming rappers when it came to the rock star stuff. Because Uzi used to hang around both of them in Atlanta a lot. Then Uzi jumped into the conversation and said, that's why you be acting weird like the nigga I punched. Which was a total lie. He never hit Reese. Reese tweeted him back and asked him if he was out of his mind. There was an upcoming g Easy and ASAP Ferg concert where Drama and Cannon told Reese he should squash his issues with Uzi. And Reese tries to dap Uzi up and squash it, but Uzi doesn't shake his hand, he walks away. When he sees all this attention on him, he takes it as an opportunity to make a lot of noise, coming back, acting like he's about to fight, which he doesn't. Reese soon after gets a phone call from Cannon's cousin, saying that Uzi was working on a mixtape called Lil Uzi Vert vs. The World. 
a copy of the mixtape Reese had done in 2011 and 2012. The guy even told Reese that he tried telling Cannon and Drama that was Reese's thing, but Uzi didn't care and they said it had nothing to do with them. Not to mention the fact that I said earlier, which was that Cannon had hosted both Reese vs. The World 1 and 2, but he was executive producing Lil Uzi Vert vs. The World now. Lil Uzi Vert stands will probably be smashing their keyboard or the screen on their iPhone saying something along the lines of, oh Uzi got it from Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, although I highly doubt Uzi's fans who are mostly children even remember that movie. Oh, He loved that movie. And the, that argument really is fine if it wasn't a mixtape series that was already done by a close friend and was hosted by the same guy that signed you and you now kicked that friend to the curb after using it. Reese didn't say anything and wanted to see if it was actually real. And when it released, he felt really disrespected that canon and drama did him like this. They took his entire blueprint and gave it to another artist, which led to Reese dropping the diss track towards Uzi titled 180 Seconds that sheds on everything that happened between them, and he absolutely washes Uzi. Uzi FaceTimes Reese the day the song came out from Cannon's cousin's phone, laughing and telling Reese, you know I'm not going to respond, right? Because he knew it would make Reese more popular. And Reese told him he wasn't going to respond because he couldn't rap. Uzi said he wanted to fight him and Reese sent the address, but Uzi didn't pull up. So he says. Now it's Day and Night Festival on August of 2016. Lake Show, who is now Uzi's new manager, came up to Reese and dapped him up because they were cool. And Reese knew if his manager was there that Uzi was somewhere very close by. So Reese walks off the stage with his homies, and then Uzi tells one of his friends to pull out the camera and start filming him. And he starts yelling as if he wants to fight Reese, but doesn't do anything. Uzi walks off and goes to perform. But this clip goes viral, and this is what Uzi planned. He never wanted to fight Reese, but he wanted to make it look like Reese was scared of him, which worked. He even corroborated this story saying that Uzi really didn't want to fight, he just wanted the attention and he had people recording him. But everyone believed it online and Reese never really took off after that. They would reconnect in 2018 with a picture but now Lil Uzi Vert had already thrown two people under the bus. And next up was Drama and Cannon. Lil Uzi Vert had no problem and was really close with Drama and Cannon, especially with the success of EXO Tour Life and then Love Is Rage 2. But in January of 2018, things began to change, starting with a tweet sent out by Uzi telling artists not to sign, then clarifying saying, and if y'all do sign, sign to a major, don't sign to a rapper or a DJ. It's just easier when the time come for that fake stuff. And then four days later on January 16th, 2018, Lil Uzi Vert clarifies saying, Don Cannon real as hell, F the rest of them niggas. We're not even going to get into the topic of Rich the Kid who jumped in during this, but this is Uzi painting the picture that he's in a bad deal and it's drama who is the problem. Things pretty much cool off for the rest of 2018. Uzi's just doing a bunch of performances, festivals, and teasing the album. But it starts again on January of 2019 when Uzi posted a caption on his IG story saying, I want to take the time out to say I thank each and every one of my supporters, but I'm done with music. I deleted everything. I want to be normal. I want to wake up in 2013. I called this out as BS in a video while it was happening. Uzi was once again trying to paint himself as this victim to the public. Who do you think the fans are going to blame for Uzi wanting to retire? Of course, canon and drama. And he's going to use the fans hatred of them as leverage to get what he wants like he's done with Diamond Cuts and Reese LaFleur. On March 20th, 2019, Nav addressed why the song Habits he had with Lil Uzi Vert didn't end up on his Bad Habits album and he went to Instagram with this post. I know y'all wanted habits on the album, I had an open verse for the longest, and Uzi blessed us with one. Unfortunately, DJ Drama and Don Cannon won't clear his verse legally. I used to be a big fan of them since Gangsta Grill's mixtape and always thought they support new artists. I guess it's all about the money for them now. It's crazy, but it's true. 
It's funny how someone who raps about pretty much nothing but money says it's all about money as some sort of degradation to others. Some sort of irony there. Four days later on March 24th, DJ Drama comes out in an Instagram comment and says, Uzi should put EA out tomorrow or any day he wants. He has me and Cannon's total support and blessings to drop it. The next day, Uzi posts an IG story with the caption, If you want your album to drop, number one rule, don't hang with the boss girlfriend. At this point, if I was drama, Uzi is going on the shelf, regardless of how much money he generates. Perception is greater than reality, like I always say. And both Uzi and Drama know how people will perceive that comment that Uzi made about hanging with Drama's girlfriend. It's ridiculously disrespectful, and neither Drama nor Cannon have ever done something like that publicly to Lil Uzi. Three days later, on March 28th, two things happen. Lil Uzi Vert releases a new song and music video titled Free Uzi that Atlantic Records called a leak, and he also signed with Rock Nation for management. And isn't it funny how Rock Nation and Jay-Z are always telling artists they have some problem with their record deal? He was apparently trying to help Uzi get out of his, offer to help Wayne get out of his situation, and once Megan Thee Stallion signed to Rock Nation, she started going off on her record label that put her in that position that she was perfectly fine with before. It's either Rock Nation is such a good-hearted company that they're signing and helping all these artists get out of bad deals, or they're whispering in their ear like a serpent and getting them to turn on their labels to get better terms so that Rock Nation can collect more money. On March 31st, Uzi released two new singles, Sanguine Paradise and That's a Rack, and admitted that Rock Nation's legal team was trying to renegotiate his contract with Generation Now because he felt like he was being exploited. Keep in mind the entire story you've been given so far. Lil Uzi legitimately had zero fan base between Drama and Canon. Nothing at all. And he abandoned his first manager to rock with them. And his first manager was the reason they even found out who he was. And then they built him and promoted him from the ground up, giving him all of these producers, getting him that original feature from Wiz Khalifa, that was his first big feature, as well as him getting on that tour, thanks to them and Reese. But now that he was making millions, he was suddenly being exploited, when the terms of that deal were the same since day one. It was the same situation as Diamond Cuts and Reese. Uzi was so big now that he knew he didn't need drama or canon, but he was locked to them due to a contract, and he wanted out of that so he could get paid more money from a different deal. Fast forward to Thanksgiving Day, the day after as well in 2019. Uzi goes off on a tweeting spree and deletes a lot of these tweets. He starts off by saying, I want to let my family know, and I say family because all the fans left a long time ago. Only family stays, so if you stayed, I'm thankful for you. We are gonna party so hard in no time, EA. I love you, I swear, time's just been crazy, I'm okay now. And then continues on saying, F DJ drama, he broke. Niggas need me to drop to pay bills. My best friend Mean got more money than drama, I swear on everything, he not even in the industry. And aimed at Cannon saying, I still got love for Deion Cannon with his fake ass. Ah, you snake ass nigga, I want to be just like you when I grow up. Then Lil Uzi Vert goes in on one of the most unlikely people ever, replying to someone who asked for some Molly Raw and Uzi songs, saying, Molly Raw is snake too. He tried to run off with 20,000 back in the G, wonder what that turned to. To anyone who has listened to Uzi for a long time, you would know that Molly Raw is the OG producer when it comes to Lil Uzi Vert. He helped build the entire song that got Uzi poppin', and the sound as well. He has tweets going as far back as February of 2014 promoting Uzi music that he produced. Not only that, but he has produced some of Uzi's breakout hits like Money Longer, Do What I Want, Canadian Goose, High Roller, and many, many more. I mean, if you were an Uzi fan, automatically knew once you heard Dabby Molly Raw, you just knew it was going to be a fire song. His production is all over every single Lil Uzi Vert project, including his mixtape The Real Uzi, except for Eternal A Take, where there isn't a single song by him. Molly Raw cleared things up on an interview a bit, where he said that all the information is false and not true at all, and he explains that there was a disagreement between Molly Raw and his former manager, that also happened to be one of Uzi's homies. He says he never stole or took anything from Uzi, and it was a misunderstanding. But he never got the opportunity to give his side of the story to Uzi, 
and this story of him stealing from him was given to Uzi by Molly Raw's former manager, likely in an effort to get Uzi to stop rocking with him, which clearly worked. And this makes sense because if Molly Raw fired his manager, he doesn't have a moneymaker anymore, and he has to get in the good graces of Uzi somehow to probably be one of his weed carriers, and he feeds him this lie. I'm just not inclined to believe Lil Uzi Vert on anything when it comes to the relationships he's had with other individuals. Except for maybe Cardi, who has his own history. Uzi's a master of manipulating public opinion of him and looking positive in the eyes of the fans, with him being the one that's taken advantage of. But that's clearly not the case. What's insane is that all of these allegations he made to Drama and Canon about them being snakes, he has never said a single thing in specific that they did dirty to him because the likelihood is that they didn't do anything bad. After all, their other signee Jack Harlow has no problem with them, and only speaks positively of both drama and canon, but to be fair, he's still in the honeymoon phase of his deal. Things might change as time goes on. It looks like everything is going great now. Eternal A Take was a massive success as an album first week, as well as the deluxe titled Lo Uzi Vert vs The World 2. Although we never got the details on whether or not Lil Uzi was actually able to renegotiate the terms of his contract since that's private information, he clearly isn't complaining about drama or canon ever since his album released. Today we're going to talk about Lil Mosey and his come up story. Dropping one of my favorite songs this year that I predicted was going to be a hit the day it released on my Twitter that you should definitely follow me on, he's been having tons of success. But Mosey is one of those rappers that has a really hazy come up story. The kind where they just instantly blow up. And that had me thinking for a long time, how did this all come together for a 16 year old at the time? So I got to digging. If you've known about Lil Mosey since late 2017, you would know that he was part of the SoundCloud rappers during that era but got on really quickly thanks to the music video that was uploaded to Elevator for the song Pull Up. What looked like a 12 year old holding what listeners would assume was a cup of lean with the way he was rapping, sipping on lean that's walk, talking about dealing drugs, rapping about pulling up and wetting the block, which was likely your neighborhood jungle gym. The contrast between that and his appearance concerning his age was big enough for it to spread, but people really liked the song as well. But how the hell did Mosey even get to this point? That's where the digging begins. And if you look into some old interviews that Lil Mosey did, we're going to reference the one he did with Complex in 2018 when they directly ask him about the song Pull Up. Let's take it back to how a lot of people first heard about you. How did the Pull Up video end up on the website Elevator? I just kept sending it into the website, the Twitter, the owner's Twitter, and then the owner, Brian, he seen it in the messages and he was just saying he wanted to drop it. It was like a Saturday. He said, I'm gonna drop it on Tuesday. Then it went crazy after that. This is a blatant lie and we'll get into why soon. Well, let's also look at who is Lil Mosey's manager. Lil Mosey's current manager is Josh Marshall, who's most known for managing Smoke Perp. So how is it that Lil Mosey, who's from Washington, has the same manager as Smoke Perp, who's from Florida? the absolute opposite corners of the United States. Also, how does Mosey catch the attention of this manager when Smoke Perp was actually popping during that time? I know it's hard to believe considering how irrelevant Smoke Perp is now. Well, the thing is, Josh Marshall wasn't the first manager that Lil Mosey had. I was able to find and reach out to Lil Mosey's first manager and get the entire story with proof of the events that happened pre-pull up. The guy's legal name is Logan or Dotwave Logan on Instagram. And in early 2017, he was at a house party when Mosey came up to him to show him his music. I gotta give Mosey his credit. He was really hustling and making moves. He was using this party to show as many people his music as possible. And Logan didn't really check it out at the time, but around six months later, he was on SoundCloud and one of his friends showed him Mosey's music. And he was rocking with it and reached out to Mosey to manage him. During this time, Logan was close with Stephen Cannon, who was a rapper. He even had a Lyrical Lemonade video back in 2017. But he was also close friends and co-founded Xanarchy with Lil Xan, who was also really going to blow up soon at that time. He was also shooting videos in Seattle. But him and Mosey got to talking, and that's when Mosey tells him that he has a song 
and the video already shot for it by Young Tata, who's the videographer. You can even see him in the credits of that video. Mosey wanted to get on a bigger platform because he thought it would go up. So as his manager, Logan started to work. These are some DM exchanges between him and Lil Mosey on November 28th, 2017, before Pull Up is ever premiered. What's the percentage you think of it being picked up by Elevator? I think pretty high. You want me to send it into anyone else? Who else you thinking? I sent it to Worldstar, but I doubt they'll see it since they get so many submissions. I'm gonna just let Elevator ride out a few days. Try to get tapped in with No Jumper too. But if Elevator picks it up, it's hot anyway, because then it's gonna spread hella crazy. For real, just push that shit, we gonna take over, bro. I'ma send it where I can too. Yup, say that. We gonna take over, huh? Logan was sending out mass emails to the public emails that these platforms have, but he knew that was unlikely to get read, so he began to do more and more digging to find the emails of people that actually worked and were movers and shakers on these platforms. And that's when he found Brian from Elevator on Twitter, and he sent him a DM with the Google Drive link to the video for Pull Up that they wanted to premiere on there, but he knew it would just get lost in the requests. So he also tweeted at him and told him to check DM. This is where Lil Mosey blatantly lied because he said that he did this when in fact he did not. And that's also why he says it was a Saturday and then it dropped on a Tuesday. He was very hesitant in his reply. On her screen is the DM exchange between Logan and Brian from Elevator. On December 5th, 2017, Hey man, I've sent countless emails with no response to the submissions page. If you could check out my artist's first video, I'm hoping you enjoy it and would like to premiere it on the page. He currently does about 40k a month plays on his SoundCloud with his top song with 370k. Below is a link to the Google Drive with the video. Thank you for your time, Logan. Hey, what's your artist's name? Not a bad video. His name is Lil Mosey, he's out of Seattle. We just made him a new Twitter, so his Twitter don't got many followers, it's Lil Mosey1. His Instagram is at 1320mosey. If you like his music and the video, we'd love to premiere it on your channel or something along those lines. And then the next day, on December 6th, okay, we're down, teams with it. Awesome, what day you wanna drop it? You wanna drop today? Yeah, I'm down. What time so I can drop the song on his SoundCloud too? And then it drops on December 7th, 2017. Logan posts about it on his story, tagging Mosey with the purple demon emoji and prayer hands, and Mosey replies back with the gold medal. Things start moving fast at this point. The video gets nearly 100k views in just a week, as he says in his Complex interview, and this time it's actually the truth. When did you notice that people were listening to it? Did it hit immediately? Yeah, everyone around me was just listening to it in my city, and it just kept getting farther, because the first day it hit 10k, second day it hit like 30, then it hit 60, then like 100, 180, then it kept going up to a million. While this is blowing up, Logan is getting calls from a man by the name of Hef, who was the A&R from Alamo Records and I believe he now works for 10k Projects. And he put him in contact with Zeke Hirschberg, who is VP of A&R at Alamo Records. This may have been how Josh Marshall got connected with Lil Mosey, because he was managing Smoke Perp, like I said, who was signed to Alamo Records. But that's just a logical guess. Alamo Records wanted them to go out to New York. They were really trying to sign Lil Mosey. Logan was trying to line that up, but he had no idea things were going to blow up this quickly. And this is very rare that something like this happens. And he hadn't gotten Lil Mosey into a management contract yet. So he hit Mosey up. It was getting harder and harder to get a reply from Mosey. But he replied and told Logan to drop off a management contract at his crib. This is where the interview with Big Boy and Lil Mosey comes in handy to explain the situation, or the timeline, where he talks about what happened after Pull Up and how he planned on dropping out of school and moving to LA with his producer Royce. And then like, I dropped the, my first music video. Mm -hmm. And then like, after a month, it was I like, I told my mom, I told my mom like, if this gets 30K in three days, I was like, I'm gonna give myself that. If it gets that, then I'm dropping out of school. Wow. And then it, it did that, but she didn't let me drop out of school. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then like, a couple weeks later, like I was on winter break, like it was December. I was on winter break. And then my, my producer, Royce David, he was moving out here already with his manager and shit. So I was just like, my shit's at like 100, 200K right now. I'm just going to do it. Convince my mom. I was like, yeah, I'm out of here. I can't. I got to do it. Amen, but. Wow. But when Logan pulled up to Mosey's house to drop off the contract, he wasn't even there. 
Lil Mosey had dipped out to LA without even telling him and he told him to drop off the management contract knowing he wasn't going to be there. Three months later in March, Lil Mosey drops a music video for the song Boof Pack on World Star Hip Hop and he was working on signing to Interscope Records. Logan hits him up again via text and Mosey responds and tells him that he was really sorry about the whole situation and he wanted a more experienced manager who was in the industry since Logan wasn't really experienced. Logan was cool with it, but then Mosey said he was working on this deal with Interscope Records and once he got that done, he would get Logan a spot on the team. Obviously, this didn't happen. And a week later, Lil Mosey just changed his number and ghosted him for good, as well as trying to delete any trace of Logan being the main guy to really help get Pull Up on Elevator, which was the song and platform that changed Lil Mosey's entire life forever. So let's do a little bit of a recap here. Lil Mosey was a hustler. He was already working with a producer and making music at 15, 16. Even got his own music video made for it. Had a couple thousand followers on SoundCloud, but it really wasn't taken off. He had built the infrastructure, but then he meets Logan, who helps him get onto the platform elevator that skyrockets his career. Unlike the Kid Leroy, if you haven't seen that video, you should watch the dark side of the Kid Leroy. It'll be in the top right cards in the description. I don't think Mosey really had any ill intentions. I think Mosey actually had good intentions. It was totally fair for Mosey to say that he wanted a more experienced manager. Even after he said, we about to take over, but to lie in the interview and take all the responsibility for that song getting on elevator is out of hand. The absolute least you could do is give the man credit for the job that he did for you instead of erasing him from history in what was the pivotal moment that brought birth to your career. Then promising that you were going to get him a spot on your team, just leading him on and just ghosting him after that, at least be straightforward. I'm not going to say you should have brought the guy with you. Not even he would say that. But all you had to do was not lie in the interview. And trust me, Mosey, I understand you're a rapper. Lying is a part of the job. I mean, an artist rapping the lyrics, pull up and wet the block, but having his chain snatched on camera and just standing there for 15 minutes getting punked is clearly lying in his lyrics. You got caught lacking. But you don't got to lie in an interview. Ain't nobody holding a gun to you in that environment. You make yourself look like a massive scumbag when you try to erase someone's entire history and involvement in your first big song blowing up and getting you that deal with Interscope that changed your life. It isn't hard to reply to the question of how did Pull Up get on Elevator by saying, yeah, my old manager, Logan at the time, was reaching out to all these outlets and managed to get the video on there. And even if they ask you what happened to make him not your manager now, you just say he was new to the industry and I just wanted someone more experienced since I was young and didn't know the business either, so we went our separate ways. It's that easy. Nobody's going to care or be mad because you explain the situation and it makes perfect sense. But no, you gotta lie instead. In 2018 on Drake's Talk Up track on his Scorpion album, Jay-Z would rap, I'm what Meech should have been, I'm what Supreme didn't become. If Alpo didn't snitch, niggas would be like young. I got your president tweeting, I won't even meet with him. Y'all killed X and let Zimmerman live. Shh, streets is done. What if I told you that the streets was done nearly two decades prior, involving Jay-Z himself, and an individual he worked and still works closely with? If you look up Desiree Perez, there's an article on Hits Daily Double in 2016, where they describe her saying, but after the defection of a string of executives, Title has its third CEO, who exactly is orchestrating these five-star exclusive artist plays. Sources behind the scenes say that person is Desiree Perez, a trusted close associate of Jay-Z for nearly 20 years who has a long track record running SC Enterprises, and with her husband, OG Juan Perez, runs Rock Nation Sports as well. Perez is known for being a fiercely tough negotiator and rabid numbers cruncher, and has a history and street rep that even Empire's own cookie wouldn't challenge. Dez is a boss. Simply put, insiders point out that she negotiated the Beyonce Formation Stadium Tour and had a strong hand in the Rihanna Samsung deal as well. Impressive. Perez is part of the Hova circle of influence that includes her husband, Jay Brown, Ty Ty Smith, Shaka Pilgrim, and Jana Fleischman. 
This is the collective running the entire operation of not just Rock Nation and its various wings of management, label operations and publishing, but the forces behind the operation of Tidal itself. There are a couple of missing pieces to the full bio of Desiree Perez, and I don't know if you really want to say street rep, but I've been eyeing on making this video for the past two or three weeks until 6 9 had to come out and really bring to a larger scale the reports that Desiree Perez, who's the current CEO of Rock Nation, was a government mole and informant back in the mid-90s. This isn't some new information, but it is the biggest scale it's ever blown up on, especially within hip-hop. In a Daily News article from 2014 is when I first remember it being revealed, and the article wasn't even about anything music-related. It was about Alex Rodriguez's suspension from Major League Baseball due to doping, and how Desiree Perez was advising him through what to do afterwards. The headline of the article was, Alex Rodriguez was set to quit baseball until former drug mole and ex-convict Desiree Perez convinced the Yankees slugger to fight MLB over PED suspension. In the article, it talks about how A-Rod was considering retiring and cutting a settlement deal with the MLB so he could just go away quietly after being caught through a test. He spoke with the president of the Yankees to explore an exit strategy, but he told him that his problem was with the MLB, not the Yankees. And Desiree Perez came in and forced him back on the team, according to a source. When Levine declined, telling Rodriguez that his problem was with MLB and not the team, Perez confronted A-Rod with demands to return to the field, according to one source familiar with the strategy. This is when Desiree Perez hijacked the process and forced him back on the team, the source said. At one point, after Rodriguez missed a minor league rehab game because of a tight quad and the Yankees asked him to return to New York for an MRI, Perez helped locate a doctor to review the test and find there was no strain, according to the source. The plan backfired when SNY and the news reported that the orthopedist, Dr. Michael Gross, had been disciplined by the New Jersey State Board of Medical Examiners for failing to adequately ensure proper patient treatment involving the prescribing of hormones, including steroids. This was her ploy to expose the Yankees and take retirement out of Alex's hands, the source said. She thought she had a gotcha moment when Gross said the MRI didn't indicate a strain. Despite the goof, A-Rod was apparently still taking Perez's advice on August 2nd, after smacking a home run in Trenton during his minor league rehab assignment, Rodriguez told the media that the Yankees and MLB were conspiring to push him out of baseball. I think that's the pink elephant in the room, said Rodriguez, claiming people are finding creative ways to cancel his contract. Rodriguez's attorneys knew immediately that his attack would derail the diplomacy required for a settlement. A day later, overtures from the Rodriguez camp were rebuffed by baseball officials. Desiree Perez was basically trying to go around the MLB to try and get Alex Rodriguez back on the field. This is clearly not a good idea when you've been busted for performance enhancing drugs and trying to negotiate a settlement deal with the MLB themselves for your multi-million dollar contract. So how did following Perez's advice work out for A-Rod in this situation? Two days later, Commissioner Bud Selig hit Rodriguez with a 211 game ban. They wanted to embarrass the Yankees, one source said. Cost them money. That dynamic. That is why Desiree Perez gave an ultimatum to A-Rod. That is why they wanted the Yankees to play him. The result was an all-out assault on the Yankees, MLB and Selig, Bosch, the Yankees doctor, the arbitrator that would hear Rodriguez's appeal of the suspension, the media, and anyone else they got in the way. At one point, A-Rod's supporters showed up at his arbitration hearing on Park Avenue with signs comparing Levine to the devil. There were accusations denied by Levine that his contract for a bonus if he could get the Yankees out from A-Rod's massive deal. Scratch the commissioner's eyes out and kick the Yankees in the shin, is how Rodriguez lawyer David Cornwell, speaking at Villanova Sports Law Symposium, described the strategy that led to Rodriguez's suspension for the entire 2014 season. Nothing was more important than the effort to smear, intimidate, and outspend Bosch. Discrediting the witness who knew the most about A-Rod's doping was a top priority and the best ammunition was to call him out for having been forced to cooperate with authorities. Bosch had his back against the wall and had no chance but to flip against his friend. It was a position Perez knew all too well. Taking Desiree Perez's advice got him the longest suspension in the history of Major League Baseball and the loss of over $20 million in base salary for that 2014 season. 
The Bosch that they're referring to is Anthony Bosch, who was the owner of Biogenesis. That was a massive scandal. It was basically an anti-aging clinic, but it really supplied performance enhancing drugs to not only professional baseball players, but anybody that wanted them. He himself was under fire after a 2013 article in the Miami New Times, where a former employee gave them documents that showed a massive list of professional athletes who were clients like Ryan Braun, Nelson Cruz, and of course, Alex Rodriguez. But the paper didn't want to give the proof to MLB. And what happened was that both the MLB and the Florida Department of Health took legal action against Anthony Bosch in order to get them to basically tell the people he worked with. And he agreed to work with them to have his name removed from the lawsuit. And in the end, he pled guilty to one charge of conspiracy to distribute testosterone. And he got sentenced to four years, but they cut his sentence down by 16 months for his cooperation with the MLB and giving them all the decoded nicknames they had, the messages explaining everything they needed, and this was the same period of time Desiree Perez was starting Rock Nation Sports. But let's get into what the article says about her snitching. It says, But multiple sources told the Daily News that A-Rod's last chance for a dignified exit ended when he turned to Desiree Perez, a Manhattan nightclub manager with a lengthy criminal record and close links to hip-hop mogul Jay-Z. While Perez is not an employee, officer, or agent of Jay-Z's new agency, Rock Nation Sports, Sources say she is a major behind the scenes influence. She's directly involved with the athletes, one baseball insider said. She has a lot of power. Perez is also a convicted felon, with a long and wild history as a DEA cooperating witness and then a fugitive. She wore wires to meet with major cocaine traffickers, according to federal court transcripts obtained by the Daily News. Perez declined numerous interview requests and did not respond to questions submitted to her attorneys about her past. If you never heard about this, it's sort of like getting hit so hard your head is just spinning. Your entire reality shakes up a bit, you get dizzy vision. How the hell is Jay-Z so close with an individual like this that is reported to have broken one of the most sacred codes that Jay-Z claims he holds? Dame Dash was even frightened by it. In an interview with Sway, he said, This is the one time that the paper did scare me. I read about his affiliation with an informant, that he's in business with certain people. It's tricky for me to say, but just based on where I'm from, I can't have nothing to do with that. There's no more business being done with me and him until I understand the situation. And court records were obtained by the newspaper, and they said as follows. Perez was a 26-year-old mother of young children in 1994 when she was arrested in New York for possession with intent to distribute 35 kilograms of cocaine, according to court records reviewed by the news. Federal authorities charged she was part of a drug conspiracy stretching from New York to Florida to Puerto Rico. She and co-defendant Amari Lopez faced at least 10 years in prison. Lopez was supposedly one of at least three men to marry Perez since the late 1980s. But Perez cooperated in return for telling the DEA everything and putting herself at substantial risk, as one prosecutor put it. She was sentenced to 30 months in a military-style boot camp program in 1995. Basically, they sent her to the adult version of the Girl Scouts. Many of the records in Perez's case were sealed soon after her arrest. But one transcript from a June 11, 1996 court hearing obtained by the news showed the feds were pleased with their star mole. The defendant has really worked closely with these agents, Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Bardfeld told a judge that day arguing to keep Perez out of jail. Miami-based defense attorney Alan Ross told the judge that his client wore a wire on no less than the four or five occasions when she's been down there in Puerto Rico. And I think the court knows from its experience that you just can't do anything more dangerous than wear a wire and go into an undercover meeting in Puerto Rico with a known violator, one who's suspected of or being investigated for a murder case down there. The transcript describes how a mutual regard and respect developed between Perez and the DEA special agent she worked with to bust Colombians moving cocaine shipments of 50 to 100 kilograms. She has gone the extra mile, an extra gold store, said Ross, adding that he believed the defendant was fully rehabilitated. Perez was released that July and placed on five years of supervised release. She began working at night spots in Miami Beach and was scheduled to meet her probation officer at one of them, Club Onyx, when she skipped town without notice in early August 1997. The fugitive resurfaced nine months later in Brooklyn, where she was arrested on March 5, 1998. 
Perez was charged with grand larceny, criminal use of drug paraphernalia, and criminal possession of a firearm. Her probation was revoked and she was sentenced to nine months in prison. Just nine months? And three years of supervised release. Oh, they cut her a pretty nice deal. A DEA special agent from the case, contacted by the news, declined to comment. Isn't that one hell of a story? In the excerpt, it talks about a bunch of her marriages, which I don't think a single one of them you could say was normal. The first man she got married to was Joel Reynoso in 1988, and she had two children with him. And their marriage ended with his death in 1995, when he died in a parachuting accident on Long Island. In Long Island, I should say. This information was brought to light in a separate New York Post article from August of 2004. The topic of the article is Desiree wanted to get married, but she went to get the license and they said she was already married to two other individuals and she said she had no idea who the hell they were. What made me scratch my head though is that Amari Gonzalez, as we saw earlier, was her co-defendant in that case. And this is the guy she was doing the crime with in 1994 while she was married to her original husband, a year before her husband died. And it's also the same guy she married in 1998, three years after her husband died of a parachuting accident. Because the majority of these articles back then referred to her as Desiree Gonzalez, not Desiree Perez, because she was married to Amari Gonzalez. I just found it really odd that the guy she was doing crime with while married to her husband and then her husband dies a year later and she marries that same guy according to the article three years later. Moving forward though, she was trying to get married in 2004. At the clerk's office, Gonzalez was told she was also married to two other men, but the clerk wouldn't tell her who. Gonzalez got Colbert involved and he learned that the other grooms were a man named Guillermo Gutierrez and another named Hector Saldariaga, two people Gonzalez didn't know. A private investigator was hired to find the men the judge refers to as the phantom husbands, but the addresses listed on the license were phonies, as were Gonzalez's address and signature on the forms, Colbert said. The city said it couldn't avoid the marriages without the phantom husbands and then questioned whether Gonzalez's divorce filings and her late husband's death certificate were authentic. Gonzalez declined comment and would not identify her fiance. She got a lawyer and managed to get it resolved. And as we can see, a recurring theme is that Desiree does not like speaking to reporters or the media ever. I can't really blame her. We know who her fiance is now, and it was Juan Perez, also known as OG Juan, who was a close friend of Jay-Z since 1996. But these are some really weird situations that Desiree Perez coincidentally keeps just falling into. But what isn't a coincidence is the poor business practices that were reported in the 2000s when she was part owner of Jay-Z's club named 4040. In 2002, the liquor license was listed under Desiree's father's name, Epifiano Gonzalez from the Bronx, as president, director, and 50% stockholder, with Jay-Z as the other 50%. Things just went smooth sailing from there, right? I mean, she had the whole marriage issue, she served a couple of months of time, when she ran away after having allegedly helped the DEA take down cartels in Puerto Rico and Colombia, it was time for no problems a new life, like the DEA said, fully rehabilitated. Well, not quite. 2003 was littered with lawsuits for the club that she was running by contractors who said they weren't paid, and here's the proof. On her screen is a document sent to Desiree Gonzalez, and it says, action for goods sold and delivered having the agreed price and reasonable value of $18,528.80, no part of which has been paid, except the sum of $5,420 by reason of which a balance of $13,108 remains due and unpaid. Action on a check returned for insufficient funds in the sum of $7,000. What happened was Ronald Mark Associates were supposed to be paid 18 grand to manufacture about 30 tables for the club. After they received the $5,000 down payment, they did the work and the company asked for the rest, like right before the club was about to open. And the club stalled for a week and then they sent them a check for only half of the 13,000, a little more than half, that they still owed, but the check ended up bouncing. <laughs> Club employees have since ducked phone calls, said Leslie Satz, Ronald Mark's chief executive. No one's done what these guys did. They played off the Jay-Z name and reputation and then tried to bully us, Satz said. My theory is that because of who he is, they think you'll feel blessed to have your stuff there. That's not the only one. 
On your screen now is papers filed on behalf of the Amerabuild Construction Management Company. At number six, ACM provided construction management services and materials, including but not limited to lumber and drywall, to 21s from January 7th, 2003 through February 25th, 2003, for use by 21s on a construction project at the premises. The construction management services and materials provided to 21s had an agreed upon and reasonable value of $8,114.59, for which ACM has not been paid. Despite due demand, 21s has failed and refused to pay said sum. As a result of the foregoing, ACM is entitled to a judgment against 21s for $8,114.59 plus interest from February 25th, 2003. So these guys supplied lumber and drywall to the club, and they also received a check in February for the amount of $8,145, but that check ended up bouncing too. And then they were told it's just an accounting thing. And of course, they didn't end up getting another payment before they filed suit. It wasn't just regular companies that were receiving checks that couldn't be cashed from the club Desiree Perez was running. It was also the state liquor authority. They gave them a check that bounced for $8,914 when they were applying for a liquor license. In the article, it says, Making matters worse, the club ignored an SLA notice regarding the rubber check wrap, which led to its application initially being rejected. State records show that Jay-Z, real name Sean Carter, is equal partners in the 4040 club with one Epifanio Gonzalez, a 67-year-old Bronx man. When contacted Thursday afternoon, 4040 club manager Desiree Gonzalez announced, I don't speak to reporters, before hanging up on TSG. This is also the document sent by the State of New York Division of Alcoholic Beverage Control to their office. Dear sir or madam, your check for your license drawn on Chase was returned to us because of insufficient funds. This was applied to your license 1134648. Please submit to this office no later than December 20th, 2002, a money order or certified check of $8,914 made payable to the New York State Liquor Authority. The check should be mailed to, and there's the address. Okay, this is terrible business practice. Why do they have insufficient funds when Jay-Z was rolling around filthy rich with commercials, a clothing line, and music? Who knows? But maybe Desiree Prez was just like this with contractors, and maybe the liquor authority. She was probably paying others, right? Well, it sounds like musicians weren't getting paid. On a New York Post article from June 26, 2007, that has also been scrubbed from the internet, but I managed to work around, it says, Mega stars Michael Jackson, R. Kelly, and more than a dozen music publishers have banned together against Jay Z's 4040 Club wrapping the Chelsea hotspot with a federal lawsuit for allegedly skimping on royalties. The popular 4040 Club, co-owned by Jay-Z and two business partners, has danced around licensing rules to entertain club goers with unauthorized public performance of musical compositions, according to a lawsuit filed yesterday in Manhattan Federal Court. Broadcast Music Inc. led the charge on behalf of Jackson and more than a dozen artists and music publishing companies seeking unspecified damages for copyright infringement from the club and co-owners Desiree Gonzalez, who has the primary responsibility for operations and management, and Juan Perez. Jay-Z, whose real name is Sean Carter, is not named. Jackson's, Billie Jean and Don't Stop, Thoya Thoing by R. Kelly, and Gold Digger by Kanye West. Kanye West too, man. Ray Charles and Reynold Richard were among seven unlicensed songs played at the club during a random visit by a BMI researcher on two nights in March 2006. Even singer Pharrell Williams, who was frequently collaborated with Jay-Z in the past, was not immune. His song Touch was also played without license. BMI spokesman Jerry Bailey said the company holds the licensing rights to 6.5 million songs, roughly half of those played in the United States and has tried unsuccessfully to license the 4040 Club since it opened in 2003. They said, yo, let's license you this music. And the club said, nah, 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 we're not paying for that. The lavish sports bar and lounge on West 25th Street boasts a $4 million multi-level space with dozens of televisions to view sporting events and several private VIP rooms. Michael Shen, a lawyer for the club, said he had not yet seen the lawsuit and declined further comment. Okay, okay. The contractors filed a lawsuit. The Liquor Authority suspended their license until they got their payment. BMI now filed a lawsuit for them not paying music royalties. All that's left is the employees. They gotta be happy, right? Well, no, it doesn't seem like that. 
On July 2, 2008, an article in the New York Post is headlined, Judge Raps Jay-Z Club in Lawsuit. A Manhattan judge has paved the way for a class action lawsuit against rapper Jay-Z and his nightclub 4040, ordering Brass to fork over the names of all employees over the last three years. The suit was filed in the name of Celeste Williams, a former waitress who claims the hotspot didn't pay overtime or minimum wage. This is a good day for restaurant workers all over the city, said her lawyer, Maimon Kirschenbaum, who will now try to reach out to hundreds of other club workers to see whether they want to join the suit. He said between 10 and 20 past and present 40-40 bartenders, waiters, and other workers are already on board. He doesn't know how much money they are entitled to because he hasn't been able to access 4040's records completely. Ron Berkowitz, a spokesperson for the Brooklyn-born rapper, said the club is not settling this lawsuit because they are innocent. We're taking this to court and we're letting the judge decide. Well, damn. You wasn't paying the contractors, the liquor authority, and now they're saying you're not even paying the employees? Not just overtime, but not even minimum wage? But don't worry, it gets better. Because less than a week later, on July 14th, 2008, which is now a deleted webpage, but of course, I was able to find a workaround, on the New York Post it said, Desiree Gonzalez, the general manager of 4040, told an employee she would F up his tax life for getting involved in the messy class action lawsuit staffers lodged against the Chelsea Club owned by Jay-Z, according to a letter filed in court by the lawyer for the workers. The hot-tempered boss allegedly told another staffer she'd lock him up if he didn't sign a release from the suit, which accuses the club of paying waiters, bartenders, and other staffers below minimum wage. Sheesh. These bullying tactics seem to be the bread and butter of Desiree Perez, because a YouTube channel and website by the name of Hip Hop News Uncensored were doing an interview with DeHaven Irby, who was one of Jay-Z's best friends back then, pretty much his best friend, he grew up on the same floor as him, and a large amount of lyrics on Reasonable Doubt are about him. They say they were pressured to take something down. How do you feel, feel about uh, Desiree Perez, Rock Nation? You know, um, there, there was a, um, obviously, you know, about what went down with the cartels and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually we actually did a story, <laughs> posted a story on um, our website. And Rock Nation lawyers sent us an email demanding us to take it down. You know what I mean? About her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a fact. But how do, you, how, do you feel, how do you feel about that? Um, about Jay Z appointing her head of Rock Nation, knowing her checkered past with the DEA, FBI, and all that. How do you feel about that? What else are you going to do? When <laughs> you working with him, what else are you going to do? You know what I'm saying? Um, she going to be around. You know what I'm saying? That's what's just like suspicious to me. You know what I mean? Um, Homegirl got a strong position in there. And it's crazy that you know her background and you know what we stand for. So it's just self-explanatory. You know what I'm saying? You 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 working with them or you you got to be working with them. As far as I'm concerned, Rock Nation is run by government. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Why, why, would, why would people think the government don't run businesses? You don't think by right now that they've got a major rapper that's a snitch, that's an informant? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You don't think it, in 2020 that they don't have a major rapper that's an informant? Come on, man. 6 9 recently spoke on how is Meek Mill, or as the game funnily called him, Mickey Mouse, going to be about this prison reform stuff and calling 6 9 a snitch, while he's very close with Desiree Perez, who is said to be involved with wearing a wire to send people to prison. 6 9 is of course in no position to speak because he ratted on an individual that he sent to do the crime for him. That's irredeemable. But we're not going to shoot down the message with the messenger. And I'm going to assume that Meek Mill didn't even know. But you know now. And if you continue without at least denouncing these actions, then your word and honor is absolutely worthless. This includes Griselda Records, who are admitted coke crack dealers specifically Benny the Butcher, who in an interview with DJ Vlad said he would burn his phone right in front of him if Takashi called him to do a song. I wonder if he's burning it when Desiree is calling that she got him booked for some money. Let me just play a quick clip of my thoughts that's summed up great by Benny himself. This shit, this shit bad out here. This shit bad, man. When these rats got the confidence to do what they doing, this shit bad out here. I'm happy I ain't in the streets no more. That's a fact, man. Streets is dead, man. You're right, Benny. 
it really is bad out here when these supposed rats got the confidence to do what they be doing, like running Rock Nation, the company you're signed under. Let's look at the list of, as they claim themselves, real street niggas on Rock Nation. There's Meek Mill, Max O'Cream, all of Griselda, Jim Jones, the big bad goon Casanova himself, and even Yo Gotti, CMG man, they had the benefit of the doubt of not knowing. But now they all know. They saw that live of 6ix9ine, guaranteed. And so I expect a statement or disavowal from every single one of these rappers because they got no problem talking about snitching when it's convenient. Your morals aren't tested when times are easy. They're put to the test when it's difficult. And if you can't say something for the laws that you signed up for and you propagate, then you're nothing but a hypocrite whose word means nothing that deserves to be ruled over by what you would call a rat. Bankroll Hayden is one of the upcoming young artists with an amazing song that released this year, Costa Rica. The hook is the kind that just gets stuck in your head all day. A lot of people are questioning where he came from, whether or not he's an industry plant, and he's really not an industry plant, but the narrative they're trying to advertise is, while it has true elements, it's just the convenient truth, not the whole truth. On the remix of his song, Costa Rica, he's in company with another individual we've explored who created an entirely fake narrative for his come up, and he raised 80% that's being generous of what happened, and that was the Kid Leroy. If you haven't seen that video, it'll be in the description and in the cards at the end. But if you thought the Kid Leroy was bad, oh man, Bankroll Hayden is far, far worse. The narrative of Bankroll Hayden is that he got into a deadly car accident where he barely survived, and then he released a song talking about it titled 29, after the date, November 29th, that the car crash happened. And then he blew up and had all these labels calling. But when I hear that, my BS detector is, it just starts going off. The video blew up on World Star Hip Hop. How the hell does Bankroll Hayden get a video on World Star after he was just spending a ton of time in the hospital? It's always fishy when an artist blows up out of one song. And just like the Kid Leroy, Bankroll Hayden had someone behind him as well who masterminded his entire music career. We can't fully understand the scope of Bankroll Hayden's come up without knowing how this person came up, met him, and helped him. That individual's name is Doms or DomsXO on Instagram. Doms had started making music back when he was in middle school, around 2008. In a post Soldier Boy era, he started making beats on FL Studio and uploading his music to MySpace. He was slowly getting a local fan base in middle school and going on into high school. He continued doing this throughout high school, and between 2011 and 2013 is when things really started to blow up for him. He had several self-produced music videos that went viral and got millions of views each on YouTube. In the early stages of music online, pretty much the Mac Miller era as well, especially around YouTube. This was before any rappers were really taking off on social media. He deleted a lot of these old songs, but there are a couple still on YouTube. For example, the Like You remix and his song Where You At that was re-uploaded. The viral success of his music on YouTube got him attention from record labels like Atlantic, Warner, and Universal. For someone who was basically doing this all at home, in Modesto, California, which is not a big city, it was a huge deal, and he would eventually sign and mainly became a West Coast artist. He would tour up and down California and doing shows here and there in Nevada, whether it's Reno or Vegas, and the occasional shows in Denver, Colorado. But then something very unfortunate and a turn of events happened on February of 2014. At 8.30pm, a man rang the doorbell to Dom's house. His mother answered, and he told her that they were looking for Dominic. They said he called and asked him to pick him up, but they told the man that Dom's wasn't home. Dominic was up north in the Bay Area with his girlfriend at the time. But when the man heard this, him and three other men wearing white bandanas forced their way into the home. One of the individuals stayed downstairs, holding Dom's father and his 11-year-old younger brother at gunpoint, while the others went upstairs and found his other brother, the 15-year-old, in his room, doing homework. They said, give us your beats, your Jordans, and your jewelry. They forced his 15-year-old brother Christian downstairs, and then one of the other individuals grabbed his mother, but this was when his father fought back. 
they decided to point the gun at him, but this was when the 15 year old Christian started wrestling with them while his mother and the youngest brother ran to the neighbor's home for help. They fired the shotgun and it hit both the father in the back and Christian in the arm, which he wasn't aware of yet. The father ran to the neighbor's door saying he's been shot and they applied pressure to his gunshot wound. Those individuals ended up taking $5,000 Doms had made from recently selling a collector Datsun 280Z, all his studio equipment and computers, as well as his mother's wedding ring and designer purses. His brother that was shot ended up wrestling the next day and winning, but he still has the bullet pellets in his arm today. This was a huge deal with news stations and everything, and this led to Doms really distancing himself from others and just continuing to produce music. He began drinking a lot more and everywhere he went in public, people would always question him about what happened that night. His father recovered, but after that home invasion, things were never quite the same. His father and brother suffered from severe PTSD after that incident, and they had to move while the original house had to get remodeled for the gunshots and bloodstains. But in this period from 2015 to 2017, he was uploading and selling beats online and wanted to really shift into more of a producer that was putting other artists on under him. Like a Taz Taylor, for instance. Around early 2017, Dom's youngest brother introduced him to his friend Hayden and said he makes music, and Hayden told him how he was inspired by what Dom's had done in music and for the city as well. Around May of 2017, Hayden had a couple thousand followers on Instagram. He speaks on this in interviews. He was doing freestyles in the street and posting them on there but very little actual music, nearly none at all. He had one song on SoundCloud under his actual name, titled Humble, and Doms decided to work with Hayden because he reminded him of a younger version of himself. He saw the potential, but he just needed the right person with experience in the industry to guide him, so he was helping him write music and record. Hayden was around the same age as when Doms was blowing up. They would talk on the phone every single day, he would tell him how to dress, how to maintain an image, and communicate with his fans correctly. If you haven't already, please give this video a like. It's all I ask and it helps a lot. All of these photos Hayden has now deleted on Instagram, but the majority of them had Doms tagged in them. He would not only take the photos of Hayden and edit them, but a lot of the time he was giving his own clothes because he knew the importance of having a look that the new generation was going to like. He was also giving him game on the right beat choices, how to flow, and how to record. This was taken away from Dom's own career as a producer, he was spending a ridiculous amount of time on Hayden. In September 2017, Dom's and Hayden were thinking of a name as a rapper that just wasn't his regular name, and to brand him, and they came up with Bankroll. Dom's designed the logo and he gave it to him for free. He encouraged him to sell merch with it to his small fan base on Instagram so he could have some money to invest in his career. And here's proof of two emails where he sent them the logo he still uses to this day, and the shirt company that they used. Hayden made a decent sum of money, and Doms didn't take or ask for a cent of it. He didn't sign Hayden at this point either. He was his younger brother's friend, and he saw him as family with how much time he would spend at Dom's home. In November of 2017, Doms told him they needed to get music videos done. So the money Hayden got from the merch drop he spent it on some clothes and shoes and a music video budget for the first song they wrote together, Ride With You, and Hayden's second song ever. His first being Humble, like I said, that was on his SoundCloud. They went to San Francisco to shoot it, and things started growing a bit. Hayden was selling a bit more merch, and this music video is still up today after dropping on November 22nd, 2017. But then seven days later was November 29th, the night the car crash happened. I just... That's my baby sister and my mom, both of them gone, said Joshua Cooley, the brother and son of the victims. His mom Sherry and sister Megan were both killed in a DUI crash Wednesday night just miles from their Modesto home. One person being irresponsible can cause so much pain, said friend Brittany Mack. The Modesto Police Department says a 16-year-old girl was allegedly under the influence speeding down Tully Road when she crashed into Megan and Sherry's car at Rumble Road. Their car flipped killing Sherry at the scene. Megan later died at an area hospital. The passengers of the suspect's car, a 14 and 16 year old, are okay. Hayden is the latter. It doesn't seem real. It's like, I'm fine one second, and all of a sudden I'm in tears, said friend Dana Klein. 
Sherry, who was 54 years old, is described as the glue that held the family together. She was good to everybody. She'd help everybody do anything. She was just a wonderful person, said Jay Cooley, Sherry's father. Megan was just 21 years old and was a selfless friend willing to drop everything for those in need. She was that friend you could call no matter what. It doesn't matter if you're six hours away and you need someone to pick you up. You can call Megan and she's going to do it without hesitation, said Magd. Family wants the tragic deaths to be a lesson. Don't drive under the influence. The driver of the car that caused the accident has been arrested and charged with two counts of gross vehicular manslaughter while under the influence. Hayden was with two friends, a 14-year-old boy and that boy's older sister, the 16-year-old girl. And they were smoking weed in her vehicle. And she was going speeding like crazy, going 100 in a residential neighborhood. And they crashed into another car that ended up killing that girl and her mother. Hayden took a lot of damage, way more than either of the two in the front. And Hayden says this wasn't his fault. He was in the back of the car. And he's right, but they were all smoking. They all knew what they were doing. And he knew that she shouldn't have been driving as well as she the girl that was driving was booked into juvenile hall on two counts of vehicular manslaughter while driving under the influence. She's still locked up to this day and is now being tried as an adult for killing that mother and daughter. Hayden spent six days on life support. He didn't suffer any legal issues. And once he was awake and slowly recovering, he had to undergo multiple surgeries. And from January to April of 2018, Hayden's constantly on the phone with Doms. At this point, they had Hayden on painkillers and Doms had to work during the day, so he gave Hayden a PS4 to keep him busy. But all Hayden wanted to do was make music, and he knew he needed Doms to do that successfully. Doms urged Hayden to just write about what happened that night, and they'll make it into a song. And eventually Hayden agreed, and they wrote the song together on FaceTime. It was difficult for them to actually record the song because Hayden had a back brace, so they would have to take breaks since it was so hard for him to breathe, and Doms would have to actually physically hold him up just so he could record the song. Hayden talks about it in an interview. He quickly changes it from saying we into I because he doesn't want to give any credit to Doms who was there by his side helping him while he was recovering. Doms was spending thousands of hours on FaceTime with Hayden since he had first met him and even more now that he was in the hospital. He was telling him how to flow on 29, how to rhyme, and he also did the mixing and mastering for the song. Here's an email with proof that he sent it to him on April 30th, 2018. Hayden still had some money from the merch that they could get a video made for the song. So they got that done, and Doms told him to wear a back brace in the music video. He realized that whenever Hayden had on the back brace in his freestyles on Instagram, they would get more views and traction because people had not heard him speak about the incident yet. And others who didn't know about the incident the car crash were intrigued by it. They got the music video recorded and it was uploaded to the director's page, Pro Exclusive. And it was doing pretty good numbers in the six figures. But Doms knew it needed to be on a bigger platform like No Jumper or World Star or Elevator and it would definitely blow up. Hayden is out of the hospital and this is when the aunt comes into play. He speaks about who took care of him in an interview, conveniently leaving out Doms. But he was staying with her at his grandparents' house because that's where she lived. There was an issue with Hayden's father that didn't allow for him to take care of him, and his aunt constantly kept him on the medication, or Hayden was constantly on the phone with Doms until 3 or 4 in the morning every night, so she didn't really have to do much. But Hayden would always ask Doms how come he couldn't think straight or why was his brain so foggy he couldn't rhyme like he used to. And he told him that it's those drugs and painkillers that she kept telling him to take. She might have thought it was a good idea. But he told Hayden he needed to get off them if he wanted to succeed. Because Doms had gone through the same exact experience with those drugs. Hayden basically took over Doms' entire life at this point. He would go over to the grandparents' house and bring clothes for Hayden. Taking pictures of him to put on Instagram. Even the captions and quotes write music and make beats, edit the photos, mix and master the songs, and now it's May of 2018, with Hayden feeling a bit better. They were talking and like I mentioned previously, Doms felt that the video needed to go on a bigger platform, like Elevator, No Jumper, or Worldstar. Fortunately for Hayden, Doms was able to get it on Worldstar Hip Hop, through a connection he had from his time in the industry. 
He told the guy at Worldstar about Hayden's story and how successful the music video already was on the director's small channel. Hayden had 18,000 followers this time that were dedicated and engaged followers on Instagram. And the guy agreed to put it on Worldstar, something that would cost over eight grand. And the song 29 blew up instantly. Dom's posted an Instagram of it the instant it uploaded that you can see on your screen. No audio, of course, because they're definitely going to try to take this video down. Dom's had told him many times that when a moment like this was happening, to buckle up and get ready because things were going to move fast. He had been through it before, and things were moving fast. Hayden went from 18,000 to 90,000 followers on Instagram in just two days, and now every single record label was calling them. Atlantic, Sony, Alamo, APG, they all wanted to talk and Doms was on the phone with them, letting them know the story and having these meetings the entire week after the World Star video. And the first label they went to meet was Atlantic Records. And these were the same exact people at Atlantic that had found Doms early in his career. And now, six years later, he had his own artist. There are two video clips of them at Atlantic. Then they recorded the song Best Friend, and I'm just going to show you a short clip of that right now. No, not it. Because uh, we be going rounds and rounds, don't make a sound, no pit up on my pound. Eh, that's from your stomach. Alright. We be going rounds and rounds. Yeah, like, like we be going around. You have it though. That one was going to be it. This was when the aunt began to see the opportunity according to Dom's, and started getting in Hayden's ear. After all, everything was already in place. What it is that Dom's was doing that she just saw was easy. I could do that. Even though she did absolutely nothing for Hayden's music career leading up until this point, which is the foundation and the hardest part. She began going around saying, oh, Hayden's my nephew. She's the one that manages him. And Dom said this was when Hayden really started changing and went from that humble kid that looked up to him and listening to getting full of himself, arrogant, self-centered, and very egotistical. Doms had told him before that when things went up, he can't become that because it's a recipe for disaster in the industry. But by July of 2018, he was full of himself, and Doms began to feel things become more distant. They were working on the next single, which was Best Friend, and they got the Eilner Banks collab, the ukulele guy, there's some behind the scenes footage. They met up with Adam22, Here's a short clip of it. They were in his vlog. And that's the same day they met with Atlantic while in LA. At this point in time, Atlantic took them to No Jumper because they had that record label joint venture with No Jumper, but that didn't end up happening. Doms was butting heads with the aunt and she was seeing that success was imminent. He felt the energy was different around her and she didn't see him as a factor in Hayden's success at all. He saw the writing on the wall, but things really fell apart when it came to the release of Best Friend. Hayden wanted to drop the song, but Doms told him it wasn't a good idea yet, and he should just wait it out a bit. The song Best Friend was a song with both Hayden and Doms' younger brother, who was one of Hayden's closest friends. Hayden wasn't listening anymore, so he just dropped his own version of Best Friend a week later on his own, and there are versions that were put on YouTube by other channels. And in the comments, you can even hear, well not hear, you can see people say that the quality goes to absolute trash after 39 seconds. And that's because Dom's never finished mixing and mastering that song. Hayden had no idea how to do that. He didn't even know how to export a song from Logic Pro when he had met Dom's. And this is where I really wish we had Hayden's perspective on things. And just like the Kid Leroy, he erases Dom's from history. He doesn't say I used to work with this guy who helped me and we parted ways because of differences or anything like that. Nope. He just left them in the dust and doesn't give him any credit after he had spent thousands of hours on Hayden, who would legitimately have nothing without all the game he gave him, both business-wise and music-wise. Now, for all of the retards that are going to comment, oh, you're not showing Hayden's side. This is so one-sided. Explain to me how I'm going to show Hayden's side on a topic he has not only never spoken on, but actively tried to suppress. I actually went one step further, though, and in preparation for this video, I sent him a DM and said, I'm working a video about you as a heads up. If you want to talk about Doms and how or why you split up, let me know. I'd like both perspectives, which is true. I want the entire story. 
but he didn't reply so there's really nothing else I can do at that point. Hayden went on to sign with Atlantic Records and Dom's left behind and this is something that it's really impossible to even relate to. In his comments it's constantly people from back then and here's an example of a random person saying yo I don't even know you but I noticed that Hayden tagged you in every post and stuff and you clearly helped him get to where he is today. I don't know what he did but you deserve more thanks from him and clout too. And another one. To those saying Dom's ain't relevant, his spotlight in Modesto was just like Hayden's. If not, Dom's was more respected. And as you can see from this video, he's a producer, the ones who always get slept on. Hayden is trash and tries to rap about being from the hood and trenches. Yeah, TF right. Dom's didn't have to talk about that garbage to be something and someone relevant. He did him. Hayden's light will dim very soon. You said it, Dom's was more respected. Back when he started and was recognized by Atlantic Records, when there was no Instagram or Facebook, kids didn't have cell phones, and definitely now or then, there was Facebook though. They could never do what he did or does. This guy made his own beats to his music, wrote the lyrics, made the videos, and started his merchandise, making his own logos. His fan base then were teens of his own age group. No one can stop him from doing what he loves. I just love the haters, they are definitely his motivators. They just can't accept he helped Hayden even before he was in that car accident. That kid wanted to give up, Dom's told him not to. He gave him the strength and was with him all of the way telling him what to do. Why do you think he started the merchandise? Yup, it was also designed by the producer too. This not only affected Dom's, but his entire family who was really hurt more than he was. His family saw all the work firsthand that he was putting into helping Hayden. The countless hours they would be on the phone. How Hayden was always spending time at their home. He was like a part of the family, and now he was just left behind. And imagine every time you go out in your city, people are constantly just asking you, damn bro, what happened between you and Hayden? He's out there rich in LA and you're still here over and over again. And this is Modesto. It's not like rappers really ever pop from that city like LA where it's every other week a new rapper pops up. So all the eyes were on them. And now a year and a half and well over a thousand hours later, you have nothing to show for it. This led to Dom's becoming really jaded from the entire situation and taking a break from music altogether. But after a while, he decided he was going to work and try to make the same thing happen he did with Hayden, except this time with his younger brother. His Instagram will be in the description. But it's just so crazy to me. I don't know what could possibly happen for you to want to leave someone behind entirely that not only sacrificed so much for your career, but never asked for a cent in return, helped you make money and cared for you for months while you were in the hospital after you had nearly died. But maybe this new generation is just built different. In a position to be successful. Right now, I'm, I'm working for Chance and I'm gonna work for him until we have all the Grammys in the world and sell out the United Center and be on a world tour and make a million dollars a day or something like that. I don't know. But yeah, that's that would be dope. But who knows? Maybe I'll get fired. <laughs> What's popping, y'all? Well, it looks like he did get fired. Because recently it's being reported that Pat Corcoran, who is the individual speaking in the opening clip, is suing Chance the Rapper for $3 million. This is one of the most interesting pieces of information to unveil in 2020 because it confirms nearly everything I've believed about Chance the Rapper for years. Back in 2017, I made this video titled, I Don't Trust Chance the Rapper, that you should check out in the description in top right cards. I'm not going to reiterate all of my thoughts on him, but I got a lot of pushback because back in 2017, Chance was still beloved. He was the rap game's golden boy, everybody's sweetheart. I saw through that, but ever since then he's continuously done things in public to make people turn against him, like they have today where he might be in an irredeemable position when it comes to getting back into the trajectory he was set to be on, which was superstardom. I was able to get a hold of the actual lawsuit and paperwork that was filed so we'll go through all of that and see what gripes the manager has with Chance the Rapper. If you're enjoying this video so far, just give me a like. It helps out a lot and it took a ton of time to put this video together and go through this entire court document. The iconic pair of Pat Corcoran and Chancellor Bennett, an artist-manager combo for over 8 years, 
Together reimagined and forever changed musical artists' ability to control their careers, electing to forgo the operational and financial support of a major label and choosing instead to rely on their own hard work and self-sacrifice, Corcoran and Bennett upended traditional norms, broke barriers, and redefined the music industry. The combination of Bennett's indisputable music talent and Corcoran's revolutionary management style led the duo to international and critical acclaim, including three Grammy Awards in 2017. Through Corcoran's calculated decision-making, including the money saved by foregoing a traditional music label relationship, Corcoran was able to maximize profits from multiple sources, including but not limited to sales and streaming revenue for master recordings, marketing opportunities, endorsements and branding deals, the sale of merchandise, and touring and other public appearances, which helped Bennett accomplish significant financial gain and international fame. Throughout this time, Bennett and Corcoran operated under a management agreement, where Corcoran earned a percentage of the net profits of the various operating entities established by Corcoran and Bennett relative to the CTR business, which is Chance the Rapper. Following fan disappointment in Bennett's most recent album and underwhelming fan support for its associated tour, Bennett replaced Corcoran with Ken and Taylor Bennett, his father and brother, and has now refused to honor the terms of his agreement with Corcoran. As a consequence, Pat the manager brings this action for all amounts due and owing and seeks all available remedies in law and in equity, including but not limited to compensatory damages and exemplary damages for breach of their agreement, related violations of the Illinois Sales Representative Act, and for its attorneys, fees, and costs incurred in bringing this action. Okay, to put all of this into much simpler terms, Pat's lawyer is putting forth the case in crafting the narrative that Pat has been working with Chance the Rapper since 2012, and he has been instrumental in helping Chance the Rapper not get caught up in the industry, but build his own independent empire, thanks to Pat's management skills and vision, as well as Chance's talent. They had a regular management agreement, but after this new album, The Big Day was such a massive flop in the eyes of the fans, not necessarily from a sales perspective, how it sounded. It led to Chance firing Pat and hiring his brother and father. So Pat is saying he wants to get paid all of what he's owed and should be owed in the future, according to him. The reason why I say that the lawyer is trying to craft this narrative and this isn't what happened is because we'll never really know what happened. And Chance's lawyer is going to spin all this information into the opposite to make it look like Chance was sabotaged by this manager who couldn't do his job and he needed to let him go or even blame the failure of the big day on the manager himself and say he needed to find new management to recover. They then bring forward the parties, which is a really important component that should not be looked over. Plaintiff Pat the Manager LLC, in which Pat Corcoran is the sole member of Pat the Manager. Defendant Chance the Rapper LLC, Bennett is the sole member of Chance the Rapper. Defendant Cool Pop Merch LLC, Bennett is the sole member of. And lastly, Chance the Rapper Touring, which is a corporation. For the first two LLCs that we're going to cover, single member basically means that Chance the Rapper owns 100% of the company, Chance the Rapper, and Cool Pop Merch. This is not good for Pat Corcoran. As we'll see a little later, what likely happened between their relationship is that these LLCs or companies that Chance owned were getting all of the money directly into them. And then they paid Pat the Manager company for services rendered, which is a disaster for Pat because he's not a partner of either of the companies, Cool Pop or Chance the Rapper. If Pat was a member of the LLCs that Chance owned, then he would be legally bound and entitled to a certain percentage. The split could be whatever they make it. So Pat could have been 50% of Cool Pop, and this legally meant he was entitled to 50% of the earnings. So if he didn't get that 50%, he has a really strong case and will win easily. Even if he had just 15% of both of those companies, which he should have had, I don't know why he didn't do that. The last one, Chance the Rapper Touring, we're not getting into because that's not an LLC, it's a corporation. And the structure of that is entirely different. It has shareholders and owners. It's too complicated to do a dive in for this video, but Pat likely doesn't have ownership in there either. The next part of the lawsuit, which is five pages long, 
It's just giving the entire backstory of how Pat and Chance the Rapper met and came to work together. And you're better off watching my video that I made earlier this year titled How Spotify Ruined Chance the Rapper's Revolution. It'll go through that entire story. I don't want to go through it again. It'll be in the top right cards and description. It's almost a verbatim to what's written out in this part of the lawsuit. So go ahead and watch that. One important new piece of information we get in this lawsuit is as follows. Corcoran's management and marketing expertise was exemplified in the new era ball cap, embroidered with the stylized number three, which became inseparably associated with Bennett and his third mixtape, Coloring Book. In a standard merchandising agreement, the artist would simply receive a percentage of the sales of the merchandise as a royalty. Corcoran instead negotiated a deal with New Era in which Cool Pop Merch LLC purchased the hats wholesale and sold them exclusively on ChanceRaps.com. This approach resulted in increased upfront risk for the business, but also resulted in massive profits when demand for the hat skyrocketed. The Chance 3 hat quickly became and still remains one of New Era's best-selling hats ever produced that is not affiliated with a major league sports team. This was a big move and shows how much of a boss that Pat Corcoran wanted Chance to be, but apparently not himself since he didn't have ownership in any of those LLCs. But if they did a collaboration with New Era, the benefit is that they don't have to worry about the inventory, storage, and logistics of shipping and returns, but they would only get a royalty, which was a small percentage in comparison to what New Era would get. So Pat said, nah, screw that, we're going to buy in massive bulk as wholesale up front from New Era. The reason why this was risky is they spent a lot of money up front, so they had less cash on hand in the businesses. They also had to deal with the inventory now, so if they didn't sell out all the product, they were stuck with it. But this meant that they had massive profits for every hat they sold. Chance the Rapper even said during his appearance on the Joe Budden podcast that those hats cost him $6 each to buy since he got them on wholesale but sold them for $50 or a little bit more than $50 and made over $6 million in total. But according to this lawsuit, this was Pat's idea. They then put out the coloring book release and how that album came together, which gives us a look into how differently the big day would subsequently be put together and released. It says that after he did all of the touring post acid rap release for damn near three years, Chance the Rapper went back to the drawing board to work on his next project and spent several months writing coloring book. And the lawyer makes sure you know how much work this was for Pat, saying it was his job to supervise the scheduling, recording, and mixing of the album, negotiate the clearing process with teams of multiple A-list artists who put up considerable resistance as well as their label. He had to deal with them to make sure this album could get released. Then it was released exclusively for two weeks on Apple Music, and they say that, the money they received from Apple, which was around $500,000, was used to pay the artists and clear the samples so they could keep ownership of the project and not share any royalties with Apple. Pat also handled the campaign for the song No Problem with radio, getting the song on the NBA Finals commercial, marketing and press, and the covers of magazines like Billboard and Rolling Stone, which Chance the Rapper didn't do the Rolling Stone one. Pat did the same thing for the merchandise around this album, but then they talk about the fallout between manager and artist in the next section, which I'll have to quote. Having enjoyed repeated success with the release of his first three mixtapes, 10 Day, Acid Rap, and Coloring Book, Bennett announced on February 11th, 2019, without consulting with or giving advance notice to Corcoran, that he would release his first studio album in July of that year. Given the significant amount of work, care, and attention needed to produce an album, Corcoran expressed serious concern with the projected release date Bennett had unilaterally announced for the album. Corcoran knew that in view of the commitments Bennett had in early 2019, including his own wedding, it was likely there was not enough time for the creative process that was involved in releasing an album, and Corcoran advised Bennett in that regard. This says a lot. This manager was more than just a manager with a professional relationship to Chance. He was, even though it wasn't under any legal documents, a partner in Chance the Rapper's business and a friend. They built everything from the ground up together. So for Chance to hop on social media and not only announce a project release date before he even started work on it, 
but doing that without even consulting with or letting his manager know is the beginning of the end of their relationship. He should be talking to his manager before nearly every decision, and definitely one as big as his quote-unquote debut album. Corcoran opposed announcing the release of any album before the recording or writing process even began, let alone was substantially completed. Compounding the issue, Bennett's recording efforts were comprised by unproductive and undisciplined studio sessions. Procrastination and lackadaisical effort perpetuated by various hangers-on uninterested in the hard work of writing and recording resulted in a freestyle-driven product of subpar quality, a complete derivation from the meticulous writing process that brought Bennett fame for his wordplay and wit. Bennett disregarded Corcoran's advice before and during the project, resulting in the forced release of a subpar product on July 26, 2019. While the album debuted at number 2 on US Billboard 200, it was panned by many influential critics and faded from the chart after just 19 weeks. The Big Day quickly became Bennett's least popular project to date, delivering a blow to the reputations of Bennett and Corcoran. Now this is really uncharacteristic of Chance, and it may give some insight to fans of his that were so surprised, or I guess the better word would be shocked, when they heard the big day. Pat is alleging that Chance the Rapper just hopped in those studio sessions and had no care in the world, just freestyling and throwing anything together. He said forget writing or planning or even thinking, you know, the things that got me to the position I'm currently in when it comes to my music career. I'm going to take a hard left, and although the album debuted decently well, it should have went number one with the hype Chance the Rapper had. It leaving the charts after 19 weeks is hard. 19 weeks may seem long on the charts, but just for comparison, an album that released the same week as Chance the Rapper, NF's The Search album that went number one that week, has been on the charts for 71 weeks almost four times as long as Chance's album, and he didn't get nearly enough mainstream push or attention like Chance did. The manager is saying that this was huge damage to both of their reputations, and he's not wrong. Everyone else in the industry must have thought, how could they let this happen? As with many album releases, Bennett and Corcoran initially anticipated touring in support of the new music. In that regard, Corcoran organized a 30-city global tour estimated to gross between 25 to 35 million dollars and began implementing advertising campaigns to build anticipation. Despite Corcoran's efforts to arrange and market the tour, the underlying album failed to generate excitement comparable to prior releases. Based on low ticket sales and poor attendance projections, Corcoran recommended that Bennett take down the big day tour and use the time to regroup and refocus. Such a momentous recommendation was made only after Corcoran had assessed the situation, analyzed the available data, and consulted with other touring and brand management professionals. Although Bennett first postponed the tour just days before it was set to kick off in September, several months later it was shelved altogether, with Bennett promising his fans that he would come back much stronger and better in 2020. The tour was never put back on track. Shortly before the Big Day's release, Corcoran and Bennett made new merchandise available for pre-order, which included an exclusive pre-sale for vinyl copies of Bennett's three most popular and critically acclaimed mixtapes in vinyl and compact disc copies of The Big Day, a plan that Corcoran and Bennett had discussed for months and was agreed upon by both. This decision was based on Corcoran's research into how other artists generated significant revenue from similar pre-sale events in adherence to proven industry standards. However, interference with the plan by the Bennett's tarnished Bennett and Corcoran's merchandise operations as well. This agreed upon plan was suddenly halted at the last minute after Taylor Bennett, Chance's brother, unilaterally decided that he disagreed with the sale and distribution strategy which had been in place for months. This abrupt shift puts a halt on the production of the goods and fulfillment of orders which could only be lifted through express authorization from Bennett. Taylor Bennett's meddling was but one example of Bennett's relatives' increasing efforts to manage the direction of Bennett's career. While Corcoran attempted to assess the fallout and analyze how Bennett's brand could recover from the disappointment surrounding the Big Day album, 
Ken and Taylor Bennett began pushing Bennett's career in a different direction under a different philosophy, despite having little or no experience in the music industry. This was beyond insanity, and I'm even shocked that Chance allowed this to happen. But he's allowing his brother, who was also a rapper, a failed one at that, to have input in which direction he takes his career over the manager who helped you build this successful career you currently have. If you're not familiar, Taylor Bennett has been trying to have a successful music career since at least 2014. You might have seen him posting his music in comment sections or anywhere on the internet saying that he was Chance's brother and you should check him out. None of this worked and at one point he even came out the closet. Not even that was able to give him a music career. He really pulled out the last trap card and it didn't work. So pulled out all the stops and failed. So what in the world is he doing giving Chance advice, but more importantly, why is Chance listening? Instead of acknowledging the numerous distractions and artistic compromises that inevitably resulted from time wasted in the studio, all of which contributed to a lackluster album evidenced by historically low ticket sales, Bennett ultimately blamed Corcoran for the judgment rendered by his fanbase, rather than accept that his own lack of dedication had doomed the project. With Bennett misdirecting the blame for the Big Day's poor performance, Ken and Taylor Bennett slowly eroded Bennett's confidence in Corcoran. From a purely operational standpoint, the Bennetts were inexperienced in the talent management space. Furthermore, they were seemingly more concerned with monetizing every available promotional opportunity for Bennett, rather than shoring up and stabilizing the Chance the Rapper brand for future success, both musically and financially. By contrast, Corcoran was encouraging Bennett to reduce public appearances and refocus his efforts on songwriting, productive studio time, attention to the business, and optimizing Chance the Rapper's management and decision-making processes. In short, Corcoran and the Bennetts had widely divergent views on the strategic management and future direction of Chance the Rapper. Eventually, against Corcoran's strong recommendation that Bennett step away from the public and regroup, Ken and Taylor Bennett continued to press for, and ultimately confirmed, Bennett's appearance on television programs such as Ellen, Good Morning America, and The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, which only forced Bennett to publicly address his album's shortcomings rather than generate excitement about a newly released album, which is what such appearances are calculated to do. These appearances served only to further exacerbate the failure of the big day. Zero accountability from Chance the Rapper. No surprise, he decides to blame his manager when he's the one that released the music. But good insight is given here when it came to Pat's vision and his idea was that, yo, Chance, we're having a disaster right now. You didn't listen to me when you announced the album. You didn't listen to me when I told you not to freestyle and put almost no effort into creating this album. You didn't listen to me when you actually released it, and now all the fans hate it. So we're in trouble now, and I gotta do damage control. So let's at least stop the bleeding. What's the point of doing all these appearances if they're only going to talk about the biggest talking point surrounding the album? Why does everybody think this sucks? And it's better for the brand long term if we just stop the bleeding. Don't do any press runs, don't promote the album anymore, and let it blow over with time then come back stronger, which is the smart thing to do. Continuously promoting something that did bad is just reaffirming people's beliefs and bringing it to the forefront of their minds when they might have forgotten about it. But his brother and father said, no, you're going to go on all these talk shows. And it did exactly what Pat said it would do. It generated zero excitement as evidenced by the ticket sales. And it only magnified how much of a failure it was. Despite several attempts at reconciliation, born out of Corcoran's desire to get Chance the Rapper back on a successful track and to rebuild the Chance the Rapper brand, on April 27, 2020, Chance the Rapper notified Pat the Manager that Chance the Rapper was terminating its engagement of Pat Corcoran and all entities controlled by Cat Pat Corcoran, effective today. After months of contentious interactions with Chance the Rapper in an effort to receive payment for all commissions due and payable, Pat the Manager presented Chance the Rapper with a list of commissions owed by Chance the Rapper, Cool Pop Merch, and Chance the Rapper Touring, including but not limited to, and he lists all of the commissions for streaming and sales of each project, 
alongside all the music released as singles, merchandise, and payment for what Chance received on the Netflix show Rhythm and Flow. He's saying that all of it totaled is in excess of $3 million that Pat is owed and still not paid. To which Chance the Rapper's father said that he was only willing to pay him $350,000 up front in a lump sum. Pat disagreed and said that would be a deviation from their long-standing agreement of 15% of net profits and a breach of their oral agreement where this really falls apart in my eyes and I have a hard time believing this will hold up. Despite months of outreach and efforts at reconciliation, Bennett has refused to pay Corcoran the amounts Corcoran is fairly owed under the party's long-standing agreement and well-settled course of conduct. Chance the Rapper's team replied to Pitchfork with the following. Mr. Corcoran has filed a suit for allegedly unpaid commissions. In fact, Mr. Corcoran has been paid all of the commissions to which he is legally entitled. Most of the complaint consists of self-serving and fabricated allegations that are wholly unrelated to Mr. Corcoran's claim for commissions and were plainly included in a calculated attempt to seek attention. Those allegations are wholly without merit, are grossly offensive, and we will respond to them within the context of the litigation. This looks like the typical response that you would get from Chance the Rapper's team, which is a surprise they even gave a comment, and remember when I said about narratives, they completely flipped it to serve their purpose, which is they're supposed to do. But they would probably need to do some damage control because his public image has been going to absolute trash the past year. Some people that are Chance the Rapper fans might be asking themselves, what the hell happened to the Chance that I used to know? He wouldn't do this. I'm sure Pat asked himself the same question and Chance the Rapper has done a lot of things publicly that have people and the fans looking at him like, this is not the person we knew or had presented to us back then. One example is how he replied to a fan interaction leading up to the release date of The Big Day in 2019. A fan said something about some dance video that Chance made. The original tweet is now deleted, but Chance the Rapper replied saying, No one cares, Bryce. Just learn how to dance and stop whining. I need something to dance to, my guy. We at the carnival. I really like the fair. Doesn't get my jitterbug going. Still excited for the album, though. This led another fan to drop in and give their two cents on how Chance handled this reply. People have different tastes and that's fine, but the way you're talking to fans who have been with you since 10 day is disappointing and that ego reflects in the quality of your newest music. This was even before the big day came out, so this guy might have been onto something. To which Chance says, eat a D. This turns into a back and forth with Chance and the same fan. It's good to see that your daughter in relationship with God turned you into a good man instead of someone who can't handle criticism. You're a spoiled child who thinks artists are making music for you. I never intended for you to find or like anything I made. If I knew you existed, I would have tried my hardest to keep you from being able to enjoy it. Now go eat a D again. The fans seemed really perplexed by this behavior. It's not congruent with this good boy image Chance has been trying to get everyone to believe his entire career. Things were unraveling. He said, Can't believe I used to love you. You've got the Kanye ego without the prowess. Used to love me? Why are you getting so heated if it's not that serious? The only person here being disrespectful is you. I don't think I was disrespecting either one of your accounts. I truthfully think you should go eat a D. Was it disrespectful that I don't take advice from you on how to make music? I don't understand what part was disrespectful. Even other fans started to look at Chance weird. They didn't do the usual behavior of fans, which is to hop in and just agree with the rapper and scold the criticism from the other fan. They knew this was off from their favorite rapper, and they made sure he knew that. He sure didn't used to act like that. Bro, I think he's hacked too. Doesn't even sound like him. Nah, it's me, which Chance the Rapper confirms, and then he tweets out on his own. It's really condescending when you talk about strides I showed and what suits me, lol. If I needed your help or taste to make music, I would have called you every time I hit the studio for advice. You don't know me or care for me. You just listened to songs I made a long time ago. And it looks like he did need their help because his album was received terribly by his longtime fans. And that sentiment spread throughout the rest of casual listeners who even aren't necessarily fans of him 
and it's almost universally seen as a dud now. But his fan just expressed one last tweet trying to wrap his head around why Chance was acting so out of character. Hey man, show me in my first tweet where I disrespected you. I just want to know why you came at me with all this toxic negativity instead of not replying at all. Because it's the internet. It's making me laugh hysterically every time someone has to read me telling you to eat a D, especially when you read eat a D. Ha 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 ha. This is bizarre world for someone who thought they knew Chance the Rapper, but I'm not surprised. Nor was I surprised. This was who Chance the Rapper always was. He just managed to hide it really well and not let it come to the surface. I was right again. But what Chance would realize is, just because he has had nothing but praise his whole career, people loved everything he did, it continued to fuel his ego and he thought he could do no wrong. After all, he even said in a song, I met Kanye West, I'm never going to fail, and then immediately proceeded to fail, just a month after this tweet exchange with the release of his project, The Big Day. Not only being outsold by the rapper NF, who is nowhere near as popular, or we could say made to seem as popular as Chance the Rapper, but his album was also hated and clowned up until this day. Chance still hasn't learned though because he might be worse than Meek Mill when it comes to social media presence. Earlier this year when J. Cole released a song in response to hipster rapper turned communist librarian No Name, unprovoked attack on him for not doing what she felt he should be doing, Chance hops on Twitter and says, yet another L for men masking patriarchy and gaslighting as constructive criticism. A fan replied, I know no name your peoples and Cole did not read the room before dropping that, but come on bro. They both my peoples, but only one of them put out a whole song talking about how the other needs to reconsider their tone and attitude in order to save the world. It's, it's not constructive and undermines all the work no name has done. It's not BW's job to spoon feed us, we groan. As absurd as this is, you can see the typical American ego in it as well thinking their issues are reflective of the entire world and also saying No Name is trying to save the world. She couldn't even save her own career. And Chance the Rapper couldn't even manage to listen to his manager and not sabotage his own career. Airline tells you to make sure your oxygen mask is on before anyone else's. Chance the Rapper has always been what you're seeing right now. He has never faced hardship in his music career. Literally everything has been smooth sailing. Critics praising him, blogs praising him when they were really important, fans praising him, peers praising him, his idols praising him. And he continuously soaked this up and thought he was greater than he really was. And when it all came crashing down, instead of thinking, maybe I need to humble myself even if it's behind closed doors, when his tour got canceled, he put out this statement. Hey guys, I've decided to cancel the big tour. I know it sucks and it's been a lot of back and forth with reschedules and rerouting, but it's for the best. I'm going to take this time to be with family, make some new music, and develop my best show to date. I'm deeply sorry to anyone with a ticket who has supported me this past decade by coming to a show and rocking out with me. And I feel even worse for anyone who is planning on making this their first chance concert. Thank you all for an amazing year. And a huge thanks to my team and family for being so strong through this whole year. I promise to come back much stronger and better in 2020 and hope to see some of you guys there. I truly love you and God bless. Well, the statement to put it simply was because his tickets didn't sell and the tour flopped. We got confirmation of this from the court documents earlier and the manager saying it himself, but it was obvious way before that. He had on tour with him Lil Yachty as his opener and also his brother, Taylor Bennett. And he even had a Cyber Monday sale selling two for one tickets trying to fill up these arenas. And they knew it was going to be empty so they had to pull the plug. I mean think of how terrible the press would be when they're losing money on a tour and you just see all these photos of the whole stadium half full, not even half full, probably a quarter. I think Chance's team figured that before the release that this album would come out, he would get so much positive press and promotion, it would elevate him to superstar status, which is what I expected too. He was set to be the next big star the way everything was coming together. And with all of that, 
if it came together successfully, which was not a hard task for it to happen, they thought he'd be able to sell out these arenas easily. But the opposite happened in every way possible. It was a disaster. Well, 2020 is almost over and Chance the Rapper most definitely did not come back any better or stronger. And by the looks of the way he still presents himself on social media, as well as him not reconciling with his manager, he's only dove deeper into the mentality of nobody else knows what they're talking about. There's clearly something wrong with them, not the music, if they don't like the big day, and I'm not going to change a thing. All I can say is, it will be one hell of a train wreck if he continues down this path of destruction, and for that tour, I most definitely got front row tickets. And that, that is the key. The key these days is... With all the music in your library, if I can say to you, if you like Jack Johnson, you may like this person that you've never heard of, and you absolutely fall in love with that artist, that, the, the company that can actually do that in a, in, in a great format will win, because there's nothing better than discovering new music that you love. You love. You love. What's poppin' y'all? Welcome to the Industry Plan Documentary. And in this video, we're going to be covering how industry plants are built, manufactured, funded, and then ultimately distributed to the masses. Some of you may be asking the question, well, what is an industry plant? And the definition is an artist that is made to appear as independent and have an organic come up and fan base, but has really been funded the entire time and or secretly signed to a record label. When we dive deeper into this topic, the definition definitely needs to be expanded to not just signed to record labels, because some artists are signed to other entities that operate in the same capacity, if not more powerful. It is deception and screams inauthenticity, especially if you're an artist yourself and recognize that there's no way someone comes out of the gate with a polished sound, look, and appeal without making several iterations while growing a fan base over an extended period of time. The moment when the term industry plant really went from a handful of people who closely followed music using it to a really big thing was with the rapper named Rory. Rory was an individual who came into the music industry around 2014, but the way he came in was so fishy it had red flags all over it. Before he had ever released a project, his song God's Whisper was already on the soundtrack to the movie Lucy. He had co-signs from Jaden Smith, Mac Miller, Wiz Khalifa, and Kanye West, all without even having 10,000 followers on Twitter by the time his first Project Indigo Child released. And from there, it's like everything accelerated. He was on the radio, he got all these interviews, he had a billboard write-up in March of 2014 where he premiered his first song, God's Whisper. It was announced much later that he signed to Columbia, but when people uncovered pictures from his old Instagram, he was at Sony offices a long time before that. And the fact he was signed was hidden to fake an organic come up, which we will dive into later. I know you've probably asked yourself the question, where did this artist come from and why am I seeing them everywhere? at least once in the past couple of years. And we're going to explore the entire system in place to push out these industry plants. And this video will cover many different artists and mainly the systems in place, but who better to start with than Global Superstar, who has had a very dark cloud about her come up story, Billie Eilish. I personally did not think Billie Eilish was an industry plant for a long time because she was a signed artist. Nobody was trying to hide that fact, so it seemed like, you know, the normal record label decided to push this young artist they had, and it ended up working phenomenally well. There was no deception there, but there is a lot that happened with Billie Eilish before she was signed that made me reconsider. Let's go over how Billie Eilish initially blew up or got on people's radar. And for that, I'll be referencing a YouTuber by the name of Progress's video on accusing her of being an industry plant. I'll have his channel and video linked in the description. You should definitely check it out. 
times. A lot of people who know Billie's music obviously know that the song that blew her up was Ocean Eyes, but I have a feeling a very small amount of people actually know how Ocean Eyes came to be. What I found was, uh... A complicated mess, I guess I'd say? Billy explains how Ocean Eyes came to be in two completely different ways between two separate interviews. In her interview with Vogue magazine, she says this. Last year, one of my teachers asked if I would either write a song or have my brother write a song to choreograph a dance to. And I was like, yes, that's such a cool thing to do. Then my brother came to me with Ocean Eyes, which he had originally written for his band. He told me he thought it would sound really good in my voice. He taught me the song and we sang it together along to his guitar and I loved it. It was stuck in my head for weeks. Weeks. We kind of just decided that that was the song we were going to use for the dance. But in her interview with Interview Magazine, she said this. It was weird because we didn't plan for it to do anything really. The reason we put it out when we did was that the whole song was meant for my dance teacher, because he wanted to do it for a dance. That's why the production is dance-esque, contemporary, and lyrical. And then it was done. And we were gonna wait until Friday to put it out. And thought, screw it, let's just put it out now. So in one interview, she claims that Ocean Eyes was a pre-made song by her brother and that the production was already completed to be able to do a dance to for her dance teacher. But in another interview, she claims that the song was basically made specifically for the dance and that all of the production was to go for the dance. Very different replies in my opinion. I don't personally chalk that up as a lie by Billy and I will never call her or her brother liars when it comes to this video because from all the research that I've done, they haven't really lied yet, unless you consider a mission lying, which I do not. But we know this all starts with this one song, Ocean Eyes, that her brother wrote for her. So that's where our journey begins. A good example of the narrative that is driven by media and Billie Eilish's team of her come-up story is this excerpt from a W Magazine article titled, Meet Billie Eilish, Pop's Terrifying 15-Year-Old Prodigy. Eilish and Phineas spent a week recording the song. We just sat in his room dancing to it, she recalled, and uploaded it to SoundCloud simply to have a shareable link for Eilish's dance teacher. Then the blog Hilly Dilly picked it up, and that led to Beats One tastemaker Zane Lowe voicing his support, and the track went viral. After a day, it had a thousand plays, and we were like, we made it, she said. We didn't think it would go past that. We literally just thought it was because my popular friend reposted it. Isn't it incredible how quickly everything goes up? But even they said they weren't sure it would get more than a thousand plays because their popular friend reposted it. And I don't know about you, but I don't think a blog picking something up will lead to suddenly getting the support of Beats One, Zane Lowe. But in this small paragraph, a lot of material we have to dig into starting with before Ocean Eyes and any label or industry connections Billy or her brother Phineas may have had. Billie Eilish and Phineas managers during the release of Ocean Eyes, and still to this day, are Brandon Goodman and Danny Rukeson of Best Friends Music. You can see both are still on the roster on their webpage. This is just a funny coincidence if you decide to look at it like that, but Danny Rukeson was a musician who was signed to Fueled by Ramen, that was a record label started by John Janik, who moved on and has been the chairman and CEO of Interscope Records since 2014 the record label that Billie Eilish is currently signed to. He said so himself in an interview on Polestar. Perhaps the most important thing I found in my research is that Danny played trombone in the hippos. Oh boy, that's true. We were the first release on Fueled by Ramen, which was owned and run by John Janik, who is now chairman CEO of Interscope. And then in addition, we signed to Interscope a couple of years later, well before John's tenor. But it's just kind of a fun circular moment for me personally. How does Danny Rukeson even get into contact with Billie Eilish and her brother Phineas? Well, in an interview with Music Business Worldwide, they asked, First things first, how did you start working with Billie Eilish? Billie writes everything with her brother, Phineas O'Connell. Years ago, he reached out to me about working with a producer client of mine. He sent me a very funny, sort of cavalier email. It caught my attention as it said, Eric Mother Effin Palmquist, which was hard to ignore. I listened to the music that he was writing and producing and I thought it exceptional, to, especially at his age, at 17 or 16. I connected him with my client and they ended up working together on four songs. Over time, Phineas and I became friends and I guided him a little bit with what he was doing with his band, a local kind of garage pop band. And then when he kicked off what he was doing with his sister, 
the music he was making perked up my ears. Ocean Eyes drove all of us to take notice. The next day I was with Phineas and his family with Billy, meeting everybody, talking about what they wanted to do. The song had already crossed into viral territory overnight. We discussed whether or not this was something Billy was really interested in doing or just a hobby. And we got to know and understand Billy. It was still early stages, but she had a vision of how she wanted what she was going to do to be put out into the world. Okay, so far this doesn't seem too bizarre. The band that Phineas had was called The Slightlies. And it's not like he reached out to some massive producer. In the case of Baby Keem, who said he randomly sent a beat pack to TDE and they decided to put it on the Black Panther soundtrack. This wasn't an instant relationship, as Phineas was working with this producer, Eric Palmquist, who still signed to Best Friends Music, as you can see on the writer-producer section of their webpage. How were you able to segue from Phineas asking for a producer to managing him and Billy? It was a year in the process. He reached out, I connected him with my producer client, they worked on an EP together, and it took time for them to finish it. Then he'd ask my advice on how to release it, who to release it through, what new media outlet to release music with. He didn't have much guidance in the industry, so I helped him along the way. I wasn't doing it because I wanted to manage him. It was just because I saw a very talented kid who had something great going on and I wanted to help him. Obviously, because my producer worked on it, I felt it was the responsible thing to do as well. The moment where things start getting confusing and we get conflicting stories is when Ocean Eyes happens. What they say in the Music Business Worldwide article is, Phineas had, obviously enough, also been writing songs with his sister Billie Eilish, including debut track Ocean Eyes, which he sent to Rukasin in 2016. Ocean Eyes drove all of us to take notice, remembers Rukasin. The next day I was with Phineas and his family and with Billy, meeting everybody and talking about what they wanted to do. The song had already crossed into viral territory overnight. This song was released in 2015 though, and if you remember in the W Magazine quote, it said that the blog Hilly Dilly picked it up and the next day it had a thousand plays. So this all happened in 2015, not 2016. Now what the hell is Hilly Dilly? Well, it is now defunct, but it was a music discovery blog. In an interview with Elevator Mag, founder says, It's a really simple idea, says Hillard, a place to share music with friends. Hilly Dilly was founded in 2007, and six years later, Hillard was approached by someone wanting to rebuild the site who would then become the lead developer of Hilly Dilly, Felix Gertler. This update allocated for more editorial work and playlists personally curated by Hillard. The partnership worked well at the beginning because it was important to both of them that there were no advertisements on the site. Hillard said that Hilly Dilly was never about generating clicks or sharing a song just because it was put out by a famous artist. Just, here's a dope song, take it or leave it. We don't care about our stats, we don't care if you come back. It's just people sharing great songs. The site had traffic but never really made any money. They tried to start a record label in 2016, but it was shut down within a year. And by April 2020, the entire site was shut down. A site that was responsible for finding artists like Daniel Caesar, Lord, Halsey, and Billie Eilish. Since the site is dead, you can't go to the link for the initial Eilish post, but I was able to get a screen capture for it, and this is what it looked like. The article was published sometime after the second week of November in 2015, and it reads, Time and time again, we mean it when we say that one track is all it takes for a career to be set. Almost like they knew. For Billie Eilish, a singer-songwriter from Los Angeles, she's not just one track evidencing our claim, though, but two. Sure, they're not instant radio hits, but how pure and unadulterated they sound will really take people by storm. On Ocean Eyes and Fingers Crossed, the two excellent tracks, the songwriter shows she has one of the most pristine vocal tones you ever may hear. This is especially the case on Ocean Eyes. She's only a total of three tracks to her name thus far, but the talent she's showing here on these two is obvious. And there's no doubt in our minds that once the word gets out about her, she'll be scooped up. There is absolutely no way Danny Rukasin, who was close to Phineas, had no idea this song dropped until 2016. There is a totally separate article that gives some criticism to the blow up of Billie Eilish as well as the blog Hilly Dilly, and the writer says, What's never remarked upon in the Billie Eilish origin story is that the blog Hilly Dilly, here is Eilish's first post, this is the post I showed just now, 
and certainly a number of others, are written by kids underpaid by record labels to be cheap A&Rs with little disclosure of their major label connections. Instead of blogs existing as they did in the 2000s, mostly independent outlets where people posted songs they liked, Hilly Dilly simply was a proxy for Interscope's marketing efforts. I harp on this because when the song was released, Eilish was already more connected to the music industry than many artists will ever be in their entire lives. This is a good point made, but it was the owner of the site Chad Hillard who wrote the article about Billie Eilish, and he currently does not work for Interscope, nor do I think he's ever officially worked for them. But funny enough, someone from Interscope just happened to see that blog post. In an interview with Darkroom CEO and manager Justin Lubliner, who Billie Eilish is also signed to, his record label Darkroom is partnered with Interscope. The article says, he found Billy after she uploaded a song to SoundCloud, Ocean Eyes, which was picked up by blog Hilly Dilly. An Interscope intern who also wrote for the blog showed it to a and player Nick Groff, who shared it with Lubliner, who then met with Billy's management team. I think the SoundCloud on Ocean Eyes only had a few thousand plays, he says of this very early period. Within one second of hearing it and seeing her photo, it just clicked. My radar went off. I felt like this was the artist that I've been searching for my entire career. I was going to make sure I did everything possible to work with her. This gives credence to the point that these labels have cheap interns that are supposedly a rs working at these blogs doing music discovery because there are too many individuals from Interscope surrounding Billie Eilish before Ocean Eyes even takes off for it to be a mere coincidence. And this is all still in 2015. There isn't enough proof to say that Interscope used this blog as a proxy to just make it seem like an organic rise for her song, but it is enough to start asking questions. And we need to take a deeper look at the CEO of Darkroom and her manager, Justin Lubliner. Justin Lubliner put up a picture on Instagram with Eilish on August 30th, 2016 with the caption, Billie Eilish is nothing short of amazing. She's captivating, beautiful, and a phenomenal songwriter. I'm so incredibly excited that last night she signed to Darkroom slash Interscope Records and I finally get to work with her and her awesome team. Oh, and she's only 14. So this guy found out about Ocean Eyes through the article on the blog that was shown to him by someone who was an intern back in November of 2015. And she isn't officially signed or announced that she signed until the end of August 2016, nine entire months later. First off, who the hell is Justin Lubliner? And that in itself is an interesting story. He's an individual that doesn't do many interviews and it's hard to find anything on him. He had a story with Hits Daily Double that does a decent job at covering his own come up. He didn't grow up in a particularly musical household. The son of a doctor and a shoe designer recalls being super inspired by New York's hip hop music and culture growing up. Nas and Jay-Z were my favorite artists. Illmatic was my favorite album and DJ Premier was my favorite producer. I remember falling in love with DJ Premier's signature vinyl scratches at 12 and wanting to learn how to make that noise. So my dad bought me turntables for my bar mitzvah and I started collecting hip hop records after school. I became a DJ at 14, playing at hip hop clubs across the city. I became obsessed. When Lubliner was 15, he started hanging out at Def Jam Records. I remember being outside of L.A. Reid's office one day when Kanye and Jay-Z were in a meeting and thinking, that's what I want to do when I get older. A couple of bells should start ringing from just this paragraph. The first for me was his interest in hip-hop, particularly 90s hip-hop in the early 2000s. And I don't know about you guys, but the perception that I've had of Billie Eilish fashion and style the instant I had seen her always came across as similar to that, the baggy clothes, the type of shoes, even the shades. She basically dresses like Biggie a lot of the time. Another thing that made me take a second read was when he said he was outside of LA Reed's office one day when Kanye and Jay-Z were in a meeting. How does a teenager even get into a position like that? And after some digging, I was able to find out. In an article with Billboard, it reads, even at his young age, Lubliner has been chasing this kind of success for more than a decade. Growing up in New York City, he DJed at teen nights and retail stores to earn spending money for sneakers and vinyl records, and soon began managing local DJs himself. 
He sparked a friendship with the son of former Island Def Jam music group chairman CEO L.A. Reid in high school, and spent many afternoons hanging out at the Def Jam office, where he once witnessed Jay-Z and Kanye West stop by, and where he later interned. My interest in music, business, and DJing all came together when I saw L.A. Reid in his office with my favorite artists of all time. Lou Blinder remembers, I had this light bulb moment of, that's what I want to do. The son of L.A. Reid that he's most likely talking about is Aaron Reid, who is the only son of L.A. Reid that is in the same age range for them to meet. And the article tries to paint his come up sort of as a rags to riches story. The odd part is that if you look at Justin's LinkedIn, you would see that the high school he went to was the Horace Mann High School, and the high school Aaron Reid went to was the Dwight School after he had done a year in boarding school. But maybe all the rich kids just run in a small circle because both of these high schools run you 50 grand or more a year. So Justin Lubliner was a rich kid for sure. It wasn't until his time at USC that he figured out starting his own business would be a good idea. And in this very rare interview from 2014, he talks about his beginnings. I um, started working with Nikki and Hardwell when I was when I was a junior in college, and you know I was given the lucky opportunity to start somewhere low with them. Um, Hardwell likes to say with me, start from the bottom now we're here. Um, but it, it was fun. I mean, you know, it, 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 they're the two clients that, that we've been working hand in hand together since the beginning. Um, you know, when Hardwell first started with his new, with his management company um, is when I came on. And I think Nikki was at 17,000 likes on Facebook or something, you know, low like that. So it's been a growing experience for everybody, you know, learning on, on how to develop myself as a publicist and someone who handles a lot of marketing and watching their growth as well. So it's been a great relationship and easy for me to access the consumers and the fans because I grew up with them. Um, having my musical taste evolves and being a fan at Ultra for the past three years. So I really get to understand what these people are feeling and go through it together with them. How do you as a junior in college get the attention of up and coming international dance music superstars like Nicky Romero and Hardwell? Enough to make them your clients? It was, it was uh, you know, for me, I, I'd always wanted to be in the music industry. So I had my eyes set on a goal um, and that was to start my own business within. And you know, early on, I, I was doing a lot of passion projects, everything from internships to starting my own blog. And we had started a blog, you know, pretty pretty early in the stages of online, you know, media blogging. Um, so we had a great reputation for that. And I found myself in the position where I can offer something mutually beneficial to a bunch of these um, managers and agents in that I could post their artists on my website, which at the time was one of the first hype machine published um, electronic music websites. So from there, um, you know, we started managing artists, we started talking to managers, and at the time I realized, you know, quite early that electronic music was such a growing um, genre and that it really was just based online, and a lot of the connections that we had and the ideas that we had were to grow an artist's exposure online. So, you know, utilizing the connections that we had in, in management projects and the blog, we kind of just created from thin air this forward-thinking, fully functional digital marketing PR um, branding, you know, community, which consisted of myself and, you know, leaning on a bunch of my contemporaries from USC where I went to school um, to help me with photos and videos and design concepts and just being in a very creative atmosphere. Um, and, you know, from thin air, we kind of just pushed and pushed and pushed, put pitch decks together. We reached out to a bunch of agents and managers that we were working closely with and, you know, eventually, you know, landed Nicky Romero after, you know, I think four or five months of negotiation. From there, it kind of just snowballed. Um, into something a bit bigger. So that's kind of how we started. What he's talking about here is how he got to manage and break very popular EDM artists like Nicky Romero and Hardwell. And that is the scene that he was working in for a very long time until Billie Eilish. This guy was a hard worker and clever as well. He was working at Live Nation while he was in college and was known as the EDM guy because of his blog Chubby Beavers and how much he would talk about it. Back then, blogs were the best place to spread EDM music since these massive publications hadn't picked up on it yet, and he was able to get a lot of contacts with different agents and managers for these DJs. Eventually, he would get into contact with Hardwell and Nicky Romero, and over four months of back and forth, he finally convinced them to let him work with them, and he took very little commission and it was a trial basis for a certain period of time. And he also did some creative marketing efforts that sort of changed the paradigm of how people in that section of the industry looked at marketing and PR. But, you know, for us, with Nikki in the beginning, it was developing on his social media. Um, 
it was getting him on video concepts, it was, you know, sending people on tour to photograph him and doing videos that were a little outside the box, documentary series, stuff like that, that really made us stand out as publicists because we were offering more services than just PR. You know, one of the things that we started with Hardwell early on, which I get in a lot of trouble for, was we were really kind of like the first people who did like for downloads. Um, and there was a like for download that we had done around Electric Zoo 2012 where we had given away uh, this kind of like Lord of the Rings gift set of a bunch of bootlegs that we had done over the past, you know, five years. Um, and, and a bunch of those were from other artists and they got a little upset. That's when we stopped doing it. But just little things that are now kind of cliche and of the norm, we, I feel like we're, we're you know, in, in the beginning, the first people on top of those. And that helped us with PR and getting things out there. Justin transitioned into more of a consultant role at Casablanca Records, then A&R from the beginning of 2013 onwards. And funny enough, of all people this guy discovers and brings to the forefront, one of the early ones at his new position at the record label was none other than Martin Garrix. So that was really exciting. With Martin Garrix, it was a bit, it was a bit more spontaneous. Um, I'd actually found a video of him on Facebook tagging himself on... Um, one of Hardwell's management team's profile, and it was a it was a video of him in the crowd at an R I am Hardwell show, doing a selfie, and it was like Hardwell's playing my new song, Holy Shit, and I'd heard that song, and I and I immediately you know downloaded the mix, and I saw it said I D I D, and I didn't know what it was, um, but I knew it was a Martin Garrix track, and really really early on, I think this is over a year ago, um, I'd sent that into Universal, and I said, look, this track is not only unbelievable, no one knows about it, it's unreleased, it's called Animals by Martin Garrix. Um, the kid's an absolute superstar. He's got the look, he's got the personality, he's got the energy, and we really got to do something about this. And at the time, we had just lost out on an opportunity because we waited too long. Um, the opportunity was a, it was a guy called Chris Malinchak, and the song was called So Good To Me, which is an artist that I found earlier as well. And I was like, look, like, we need to sign this right now. This is the next m major hit. And you know, from there, right away, negotiations started, started. And luckily for me, one of one of you know, my closest friends in music became his manager at the same exact time. So it's been an unbelievable experience working with him on marketing concepts and A&R concepts and being around the team. Um, and Casablanca was incredibly helpful for the development of animals and plugging it to top 40 when, you know, instrumental tracks really weren't pushing the boundaries at that point. Um, so it was a really successful situation that I'm proud to have helped out in. So we know her manager has experience in really taking smaller artists and bringing them to that next level into stardom, if not superstardom, even though it was mostly with electronic acts, and Billie Eilish was more pop. But another article which was more propaganda than it was just coverage was titled, Why All Eyes Are on Billie Eilish, The New Model for Streaming Era Success. And while the meteoric success of When We All Fall Asleep blindsided many, it is actually the result of years of meticulous artist development and a well-calculated major label effort to build a career that will last. By releasing so many singles leading up to its release, none of which sound too similar, and all of which showcase Eilish's chameleonic abilities, she was able to land on multiple genre playlists and be everywhere at once, says Rukeson. There was a moment where artists and songs were living and dying by what playlist they could be on, he explains. We made sure to be the standout on different ones as Justin Lubliner, who signed Eilish to his Interscope imprint, Darkroom, in August 2016 says, We made the blueprint for how to be an album's artist in a streaming era. This new model only sounds applicable to an artist that is signed to a major label and has a 16-person team working around the clock to make sure they get every opportunity possible. This isn't feasible for your actual bedroom artist with no connections which is a recurring theme they try to paint Billie Eilish and her brother as. And this is common of every industry plan. They need a relatable rags to riches type of story, otherwise the fans will not resonate with the artists. In this case, sure, the album was created in their bedroom, but they have a massive team and connections that no other bedroom artist has, which isn't stressed enough. This is the best part of this Billboard article that takes us to the next section of this video. Before building her core team, Eilish had worked briefly with London-based A&R and creative services company Platoon, a partnership that O'Connell had forged, which Apple acquired in 2018. Though she was Apple's up-next artist in September 2017, 
has a Beats 1 show, Grouples Have Feelings too, and wrote a song with O'Connell for Apple's 2018 holiday commercial. And in a separate article interviewing Justin Lubliner, he even suggests the same thing. Lubliner says that every decision over the past four years was part of a meticulous strategy for making sure that people identified her as a real artist with a unique identity, putting out a body of work. Instead of prioritizing singles, the team focused on helping establish an identity for each individual track off her debut album, forging crucial relationships with Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube Music along the way. For example, Spotify launched a Los Angeles pop-up for the album, which included a separate multi-sensory room for each song. So Billie Eilish was afforded the luxury of being placed on all of these playlists due to strong relationships her team built with every major streaming platform, Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube Music. And we're going to look more into the London-based A&R and creative services company, Platoon. Because remember when I said that there was a period of about nine months between when Billie Eilish was first discovered and when she was officially signed? What happened in this period of time is the question. And we sort of get a hint when it tells us in the quote and she was working with this agency, that she nor her brother ever mentioned their time and what they did for them. But this is far more than just an agency. If you go to Platoon's website, platoon.ai, you're just greeted with visuals in the background and mission possible. There are no details or anything, which is odd of a company like this. It's almost like they don't even want you to know what it is they exactly do. And while many things have come out now, it was incredibly secretive back in July of 2016, when an insider article couldn't get them to spill anything about it, and is the same period of time when Billie Eilish was in the process of signing to Darkroom Interscope. To put it simply, Platoon is an incubator where they give artists the resources, connections, funding, even creative vision to take them from nobody to eventually signing to a major record label and becoming stars. It's an industry plant farm, if you will that was loosely connected in its inception with the most valuable company in the world and is now directly under that company, which is Apple. Over the past year, London-based Platoon has emerged as one of the world's most nattered about thought-provoking new music companies, offering a range of distribution, funding, and marketing services to emerging and unsigned artists. The startup has partnered with arguably the two most anticipated new acts of 2018. New York-based Yeba and UK-based Brit Award winner Georgia Smith. Signings like these have made Platoon's A&R hit rate the envy of the major labels. Other artists in its network with millions of streams to their name include the likes of Mr. Easy, Malik Berry, Gabrielle Applin, and Riley Ritchie, while artists like Billie Eilish and Stefan Don have been incubated at Platoon before being migrated into major labels. All of the artists mentioned above are wired into modern youth culture, and to various extents have wriggled out of the crosshairs of big spending label A&R departments. The question might be, well, if they aren't signing people to a record label, what is the business model here? And what does Platoon stand to benefit from giving these unproven artists everything and more that they would get from a label? Platoon, launched in 2016, has built on AWOL's original principles, enabling artists to distribute their music independently by adding a wealth of label-like services. These include A&R, signing and developing talent, plus marketing, funding, video editing suites, recording studios, and fiscal business management. In return for these services, unlike major record companies, Platoon does not ask acts to hand over long-term rights to their music. Instead, more akin to a VC investor, it typically obtains a minority stake in an artist's own independent business. I do not think that the intention of this business is to own a small stake in these artists' business, but we'll get into why later. Funny enough, Kanye West was talking about this exact business, without even knowing it, when he sent out a tweet in August that said, When I spoke to Katie Jacobs, who was on the board of Vivendi, we decided to create a Y Combinator for the music industry, so artists have the power and transparency to be in control of our future. No more shady contracts, no more lifelong deals. And one of the founders of Platoon replied to the tweet saying, Why see for music talent? Now that's an idea. Tagging We Are Platoon. If you're unfamiliar with what YC or Y Combinator is, 
It's basically a seed money startup incubator started by Paul Graham, who is a brilliant guy, definitely worth following. But these startup companies in Silicon Valley apply to join through a rigorously competitive application process. And then it's like a school that also has the founders of the companies get offered an amount invested into their company in exchange for a percentage of equity that YC gets. Some of the companies that have come out of this program are Instacart, Stripe, Airbnb, DoorDash, Twitch, which was Justin TV at the time, Dropbox, Reddit, Teespring, Quora, Coinbase, and many, many more. But for a company like this to exist, you need someone with not only experience, but connections in the music industry and the entertainment industry, as well as someone with tons of capital to pour into the company. And that's exactly what Platoon did. Platoon was founded by Denzel Fiegelson and Saul Klein. One of the founders, Denzel Fiegelson, was actually asked the same question we all have had in mind. Can you maybe address the conspiratorial suggestions that keep lingering that she wasn't just an exciting organic talent in reference to Billie Eilish, but actually some kind of industry plant, a project cooked up between you and Apple? It was honestly a very serendipitous affair. It was us in our office. Finding her on SoundCloud the same day that two people who were working at Apple on Zane Lowe's team also sent me the link. That was Ocean Eyes, and it was undeniable, and it was only on SoundCloud. The two guys at Apple said, look, we know the managers. Oh, wow, they know the managers. And we'd love to hook you up. You should talk to Danny Rukeson, Eilish's co-manager, alongside Brandon Goodman. Within seconds, we called Danny, and he was like, I need to get this out. Can you help us? From there, it was just natural. She had such a wonderful team. The two managers, Brandon and Danny, are incredible. Her mom, Maggie, is incredible. And then, you know, you do what you do. You take her to LA. You take her into the building and she meets everybody. We introduced her to Zane and Jimmy Iovine and whoever was in that day. So yeah, she got some very early plays at Beats 1, but there was no calculated plot. It was just support. But there was support from all kinds of people in the industry because she was undeniable. Not from everybody, obviously. There was months and months where labels didn't really pick up on it. The A&R people didn't pick up on us. But you know, when any artist gets so big, there's always lots of those stories that come out. Nobody sat in a room and said, okay, together we're going to make her the biggest star in the world. We only sat in a room and said, how can we support you? Isn't it such a coincidence that everyone dis seems to discover a single song on SoundCloud during the same time, both Interscope and Apple? And what he is defining is exactly the suspicion everyone has in their mind. They magically find this one song when they're already connected to the industry. They even said the people at the office knew her management. And then they support her by putting her music in front of an audience of millions upon millions, whilst also trying to make it seem organic while you're doing so. Fiegelson has quite the history in music though. He's the individual who was played in the introductory clip to this video and predicted the entire model of Spotify. He's from South Africa, but got into the music industry in the 1980s. In the 1970s though, he was a bass player in college studying music therapy, and he was playing in all kinds of bands from salsa to core jazz to experimental electronic, and seeing artists like Sting and The Police influenced him to move towards electric bass from having been a jazz purist. It wasn't until the 80s though that he transitioned into producing and managing. He went through the years as a musician himself, and that experience he got from booking shows, driving the van, setting up the gear, making sure everyone got paid, set him up to be a good manager years later. Some of the artists that he managed were Lady Smith, Black Mabazo, Gypsy Kings, Johnny Clegg, Luther Vandross, and Kenny Loggins. But he took a brief retirement when he moved to Hawaii and started an online floral company in the 90s they would ship local flowers into the United States. But in 1996, a massive idea came into his mind, and he saw the opportunity of the internet to help artists have an alternative to record label contracts, and he started a revolution in the music business. He moved back to California and started Artists Without a Label, which is also known as AWOL, 
and it was one of the earliest direct-to-fan CD sales sites, and it was a huge success. Instead of being stuck in a contract and getting barely anything for the CDs you sold, these artists had the opportunity to sell directly to their fans and get paid a larger share. AWOL customers could order CDs online for $10 plus postage. Fiegelson had the discs stacked up in his garage. AWOL artists would keep ownership of their copyrights and receive the lion's share of the financial proceeds. What the experience with Kenny and the children's album taught me at the time was to do the exact opposite of a record deal, says Fiegelson. Instead of a 100-page contract, I created a one-page contract. Instead of the artist owning 15%, the artist owned 85%. Instead of exclusive, I made it non-exclusive. The next phase of Fiegelson's life was in 2001, when he was contacted by Steve Jobs and Apple. He became a music consultant and special advisor to Steve Jobs, as Apple intended to move into music with iTunes and the iPod. He would work with Apple to find and license songs for product launches and promotional videos, and then became a key member in launching iTunes initially, as well as around the rest of the world. He worked on projects like the 30-day iTunes Apple Music Festival from 2007 to 2016, Beats, and much more for over 14 years. So this individual has seen the evolution of music consumption for decades upon decades, and worked right alongside one of the biggest shifts in music with iTunes that helped shift from the physical CD model to individuals buying songs and albums digitally. In 2012, Fiegelson sold his company AWOL to Cobalt Music, the independent publishing company, and he was figuring out his next move when he decided to start Platoon. But the question I have is, did he decide to start it or was he sort of urged and sent to start it? because while Platoon didn't start out as being a company owned by Apple, it now is. And it's very convenient that the individual who helped start iTunes also happened to start a company that benefits Apple Music, and it gets acquired by them too. Fiegelson says himself in a Medium article he wrote, In 2012, AWOL sold to Cobalt, and the original Artist First vision and learnings continue to evolve as I really listen to more and more artists, creatives, fans, and managers. A conversation with Saul Klein instigated the spark to launch Platoon in 2016. At that time too, I had the opportunity of meeting Georgia Smith and her manager after hearing her song Blue Lights on SoundCloud. Once you meet a truly great artist like Georgia, you are inspired and elevated to trust the fearless creative process. Saul Klein himself has quite the history in music, film, and business, who is the business partner to Denzel Fiegelson when they started Platoon and on paper is the perfect partner for him to do business with. Saul Klein was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, but would grow up in London, eventually going to school at Cambridge, and from 1993 to 1995 began working at The Telegraph and spent time working at Ogilvy's WPP, which is a marketing and advertising company. During this time, it was the infancy of the internet, and Klein was trying to get these organizations to think about digital. While at Telegraph, he was fortunate enough to meet the guys that started the company Netscape before they went public. He also met a company Firefly and their founders that were students out of a media lab at MIT. And when he was considering investing in them on behalf of WPP, they asked him why would he do that when he could just join them? Which is exactly what he proceeded to do and he moved to Boston in February of 1995. And from there he rode the wave of the internet. He helped them build up Firefly for four years which they then sold it to Microsoft. He would spend some time working at Microsoft in Seattle, which was then the most valuable company in the world, but moved to New York in 1999 and started the Accelerator Group with his father, Robin Klein. And this was a company dedicated to investing in early stage internet businesses like e-commerce, digital media, and internet services. One of the companies they invested in was Meetup, that's still successful to this day, as well as the company Blogger, that was bought by Google and made them a ton of money. But in 2002, he left America and moved to London with his wife. In his own words, he needed a job, so he decided to start a company, which was a bad idea at the time. This was the dot-com crash, and all of these internet businesses were failing. But while he was in the US, he was inspired by the Netflix business model, 
and couldn't understand or wrap his head around why something like that didn't exist in Europe and the UK. He even looked for teams that were trying to build something similar, but couldn't find any. So he decided to start it himself, and it was called Love Film. The idea was that him and his father would seed fund the business, and Saul would run it for anywhere from one to three years, and then they would get someone else to run the business, which is what they did. Years later, in 2011, Love Film was acquired by Amazon for 200 million pounds. After he handed off Love Film to a CEO to run, he was invited to join the beginning stages of the team at Skype as a marketing executive. He loved the business and believed they could overtake other businesses like Vodafone in the future. But they ended up selling to eBay for 4.2 billion, which is a massive amount, but he felt was a bit disappointing. But he spent a year at eBay afterwards from 2007 to 2008, as well as angel investing in music companies like Last.fm, which was one of the first companies online that would build detailed profiles of every individual user's music tastes and then have a recommendation system in place that would show them new music and artists they haven't listened to that are similar to the taste profile they have built. From 2010 to 2015, Saul and his father founded Local Globe, which operated similar to the Accelerator Group. It was a venture capital firm that invested in technology businesses and raised 45 million pounds in October 2015. And this was the beginning of when he would begin working with and alongside Denzel Fiegelson on Platoon. A very important thing to note is how investors look at business from the mouth of Saul Klein himself. Baseline, investors want to back ideas that can return their fund. And so you need to know what that means. And what that means is you need to know how big is the fund that the investor is investing out of. And in the case of Local Globe, which is the new seed fund we started last summer, it's a 45 million pound seed fund focused on London, which is tiny by index standards. The index announced today they raised a billion and a 1.25 billion of new capital to invest. So 70 million focused on London is really small. But at the end of the day, the calculation as an investor you're making is if I have 10% of your business and I can hold on to that stake at exit, your business to return my fund needs to be worth 450 million quid at exit, about 700 million. Very difficult question to answer when the profitability of artists is nowhere near the businesses that Saul Klein has invested in in the past. On the surface though, it looks like a great support system for artists. In the run-up to launching Platoon in 2015, Fiegelson and Klein held multiple meetings with emergent independent artists to ask what they needed to get their careers motoring in the age of SoundCloud, YouTube, Apple Music, and Spotify. The duo were told time and time again that these acts had a simple plan, building their presence on SoundCloud and social media to the point that major labels would start flocking towards them. The fundamental idea of Platoon then was to offer a new option, providing the functions and expertise that a major label might inject into an artist's career, but with a deal heavily weighed in favor of the talent. We believe that artists do their best work when they have creative and economic freedom, explains Klein. That's absolutely true in the world of software and business, and it's absolutely true in the world of music. Platoon also has its eyes and ears wide open to other creative sectors, books, video education, etc., and will look to apply the same model to those industries in the future. Adds Klein, if you're an independent creative today, the economics have tipped in your favor. There are 3.5 billion people with smartphones in the world. By 2020, that will be up to 5 billion. If I look 10 years out with all of the platforms we already have and imagining those which are yet to be introduced, I just can't see a world of a dominant major label system. None of this, however, adequately explains Platoon's prolific and prodigious ability to spot and sign talent early and to associate itself so closely with a new wave of commercially formidable new artists. Take Mr. Easy, for example. Platoon helped to fund his various projects and create his video for a single Leg Over for under £5,000. Released last year, it's now attracted over 30 million plays on YouTube. 
NBW understands that the aspirational platoon deals sees the company offer career-long support, creative freedom, and marketing firepower in exchange for a minority stake in an artist's independent business. The firm also recently launched its own publishing company, allowing it to cross-pollinate in the expansion of an artist's career. For example, an act can take out a publishing advance and recoup it with their master's income. With Klein's background in mind, these kind of structures are no surprise. We've got a long-term perspective on our artists and how the industry is going to change in the coming years, says Klein. In the venture world, if you find someone with a truly great idea, you have to take a 7 to 10 year view. If they do well, you do well. That's the right kind of alignment. Where Klein says this comparison loses its relevancy for Platoon is at the point of the E word, exit. When a venture capitalist invests in a startup, often it's with the hope that a big payday will come down the line via an acquisition. In artist land, that big check is, as we stand today, typically coming from one direction, the major labels. When I see this and Apple's involvement and the long-term planning that they have, it doesn't seem like the intention is just what it is on the surface level. The reason record labels are able to make money is because they own the masters and they get a lion's share of the recording revenue, as well as other avenues, since 360 deals have become commonplace years ago thanks to Lior Cohen. How is a company that is going to take a minority stake in an artist ever even going to come close to making money? And that's where I think the intention is not even making money with the artist. This is just me thinking. If I were Apple Music, these streaming services do not make their money like record labels do. They make their money through the subscriptions that people buy to get access to the music. Now, what is the issue with these subscriptions? Well, the problem is that Apple Music and Spotify need access to these libraries of music that Universal, Warner, and Sony own. They need to pay them a ton of money in licensing to be able to have that music in their library. And artists can't do anything about it because they don't own the rights to their music. But what if, in the future, the majority of artists were independent and owned the rights to their music? Or what if these artists that they help build up and give exclusive content to on Apple Music decide to buy subscriptions to it. Their fan bases were built on these platforms, like Apple Music and Spotify. They would have no reason to take them off because it's making them money. And it's much harder to threaten to take music off on a wide scale if each individual artist owns their masters. If this is the future of the music industry, then Apple Music will have stronger negotiating power when in talks for licensing deals with the three companies that own nearly all of the music. This seems overly optimistic, but in the words of Saul Klein himself, if you're an independent artist today, the economics have tipped in your favor. If I look 10 years out with all of the platforms we already have and imagining those which are yet to be introduced, I just can't see a world of a dominant major label system. Apple acquired the company in 2018, and the power that Apple Music has to push an artist is insane. All they have to do is put them in all of these playlists that they own, and they have direct distribution to what is now over 68 million subscribers at the push of a button. Platoon claims that their artists do not get any special treatment by Apple Music or playlists, and it's the same as every other artist, but we are not stupid. Why wouldn't Apple Music use their platform and show preferential treatment to push artists that are assigned to a company that they own? After all, they put Billie Eilish as their up next artist, had her talked about on Beats One, they said they put her on all of these playlists spanning different genres, and she became the most pre-added album ever at 800,000, and they gave her an up next mini documentary on top of that. Apple has a host of tools at its fingertips to succeed in music. A music analytics company called Asai had shut down in late 2018 during around the same time that Platoon was announced as being acquired by Apple. They put up a post on their Twitter saying, Asai is shutting down on 10-14-18. Dear Asai user, Asai will be shutting down operations on October 14th, 2018. As of that date, you will no longer have access to our API endpoints, the website, or features such as Asai Terminal, Recommend, Artist Analytics, and others. 
You are welcome to contact us at info at asidetech.com as our Twitter and Facebook accounts will no longer be active. We will do our best to reply in a timely manner based on the volume of emails. From today until October 14, our product will be working as is and we will not be supporting issues with the platform. We've loved watching the artists you've signed, marketing campaigns you've launched, and love of bringing data into this industry you've shown over the past two years. With love, Sony Theakanath, CEO and founder, Asai. What happened was Apple acquired this company and has their founders working for them now. On their crunch base, it says, Asai is an automated machine learning ANR and music management platform. The company builds tools that make it easier to discover and develop talent by aggregating and generating insights on the digital footprints of content and talent on the internet. Asai contextualizes and creates structure for music business folks. Asai has built a recommendation engine to quickly identify future and budding hits. Asai offers two products, a music management dashboard for ANRs to quickly scout and manage talent and an API for services to integrate a recommendation engine into their platforms. Asai was founded in August 2016 and is based in San Francisco, California. Asai was acquired by Apple in October 2018 for under $100 million. The power in that company and the claims they made are really interesting, answering the question that is likely coming to your mind, which is, why would Apple buy Asai? The obvious reason is analytics. The startup's team and technology could be useful for Apple's continued development of its Apple Music for Artists dashboard, for example. The company previously bought British startup Symmetric for its music metric analytics platform, a story Music Alley broke in 2015, although Apple Music for Artists did not launch in beta until earlier this year. Asai could play a role in future improvements to the tool, and that's important for Apple Music since its main rival Spotify is investing heavily in its own analytics and marketing tools for artists. Apple's acquisition of Shazam, which closed last month, this is 2018, can also be viewed through this context. An Apple acquisition of Asai is about more than artist analytics, however. At Midim Lab, Thea Kanath talked about a product called Asai Recommend, which could create algorithmic personalized playlists as well as recommend songs and playlists to people based on their listening habits. That could be useful as Apple continues to improve the For You section of Apple Music with its personalized recommendations and algo playlists like New Music Mix, Favorites Mix, Chill Mix, and Friends Mix. Again, this is an area of intense competition with rivals such as Spotify and YouTube Music. Finally and most intriguingly, Asai had another product that Thea Kanath talked about during his Midim Lab pitch in June, a tool he described as an automated a and web platform aimed at labels, managers, and promoters trying to identify breaking artists as early as possible. Thea Kanath claimed that it could identify up-and-coming artists 10 weeks before they hit the charts by analyzing the data from streaming services including Spotify and SoundCloud with around a 70-30 rate of hits to misses, i.e. it predicted hits 70% of the time. A hit is considered someone you can sign and make a profit out of in some way, or they jump onto a major playlist in some way, he said then. A 70% success rate in guessing hits is insane. And now that information is proprietary, only to Apple, and not any of these other record labels that could pounce on the opportunity. But what use is it if you know something is going to be a hit, but you don't have the resources and creative suite to fully display that artist's music? That's exactly where Platoon comes along. And then in the most recent quote you saw, that Apple also acquired the music discovery application Shazam. So in a three month period, Apple acquired an analytics company that can strongly predict hit songs, as well as other analytics valuable to Apple Music and their system of recommendation. They acquired Platoon, that essentially acts like a record label, but giving artists incredibly favorable deals, as well as funding and creative teams. And they acquired Shazam. Back when they acquired Shazam, the application had over 150 million monthly active users, and was usually used to discover the name of a song you just found or were hearing somewhere. This is another powerful marketing tool because you can now find an artist 
the seed that may or may not become a star through the analytics company, bring them into platoon that nurtures and plants the seed, making sure to water it and grow it. Then you put it on all of these Apple Music playlists, as well as push it to the audience or audiences that you have on Shazam. And that is the market you're going to sell that plant to. This sounds great, but I can show you better than I can tell you with several examples. Isaac Dunbar is an artist signed to Platoon, and the most popular song and music video he has on his channel is Ferrari, released on June 11, 2019, with nearly 2 million views. He's in the Apple ecosystem. If you go to the comments, however, you'll find a ton of people saying they found out about his music through Shazam. Nobody. Not even a single soul. Shazam. When Shazam randomly recommends this to you, I found this through turning on Pop Shazam, and this is amazing. Shazam pop-up thing brought me here, and many more. You can just look it up yourself. Another more recent individual on their platoon is an artist by the name of Aaron Smith. The first easy thing to notice is that his most viewed song on his YouTube channel, Your Turn Now, which is a live session, has 130,000 views and only 451 likes. That type of ratio of views to likes is nearly enough to say that these are not organic views. That doesn't mean they're fake, but they could have just come from ads. The individual has around 5,000 subscribers to his YouTube channel at the time of recording, and on Instagram has about 6,000 followers. It's totally not preferential treatment that he has an entire at home with Aaron Smith session promoted by Apple Music, is it? Or what about the fact that he was on Best New Pop on BBC Radio 1? Or Apple Music wanting to talk to you about the story behind your track Unconditional as exclusive content for their service. Being placed on Apple Music's Today's Hits playlist, we haven't even gotten to Spotify too, where if you look at his about page, every single playlist he was discovered on is a Spotify editorial playlist. And he has 551,000 monthly listeners while I'm making this, and only 7,000 followers. Spotify isn't affiliated with Apple, but from what I've been able to gather, Platoon has access to getting on all of their playlists as well. To contrast it, this is what an artist who isn't an industry plant has on their Spotify page. This is an independent rapper named Bizanji that you should check out. He has 153,000 followers and 1.3 million monthly listeners. And this is about a 10% or higher monthly listener to follower ratio, which is normal. And if you look at the playlist he's discovered on, there's only one that is a Spotify editorial, which is Need for Speed. An artist with this many followers, many more than Aaron Smith, in a normal and fair world would get more playlisting from Spotify editorials than someone who has no fan base, but that isn't the case. Another independent rapper, Convolk, that you should check out, he has 1.3 million monthly listeners and 130,000 followers. There's that 10% follower to monthly listener ratio again, which is normal. A look at the playlist he's discovered on and only one is a Spotify editorial, and it's this Russian playlist. Same goes here. If you're this big, you would ideally be getting more support from Spotify, not less than a no-name artist that happens to be signed to a company that pushes out industry plans and is owned and funded by Apple. This isn't even the fun part. I found the next artist on their roster that they're pushing with the same strong initial push that they gave Billie Eilish, and her name is Holly Humberstone, also signed to Platoon. Just by the look, you're probably getting the same energy and vibe, but if we take a look at her Spotify about page, it reads, in a span of months, Holly has amassed well over 35 million streams on Spotify, performed on Jimmy Kimmel Live, been named Apple Music's Up Next Artist, sold out her first three headlining gigs at Omiara in London, which has a capacity of 300 people, Garnered radio play from BBC Radio 1, KCRW, Beats 1, Triple J, and more, and most recently blazed onto Rolling Stone's Breakthrough 25 chart as one of the fastest rising artists of the month. She's also been championed by Vivo Discover, Clash, NME, BBC Introducing, Billboard, DIY Magazine, Dork Magazine, Coup de Main Magazine, and The New York Times. Taking inspiration from Damien Rice, 
Lord, Bon Iver, Phoebe Bridges, Haim, and everyone in between, Holly's style has an honest and conversational tone which immediately steals your attention, fusing the warmth of the acoustic music Holly grew up listening to with a darker, wonky electric twist. Once again, as you can see, the playlists she's been discovered on are all Spotify editorial playlists, and when you look at her ratio of followers to monthly listeners, it is significantly under 10%. It's about 2%. So how the hell is this girl getting all this press, and it has all happened within the past year? Prior to October of 2019, she was an absolute nobody. As a matter of fact, she released her first song on January 30th of 2020. The whole claim to fame is that Louis Capaldi shared her song Deep End on his Instagram story back in December of 2019. She says on this Facebook post, Thanks so much to Louis Capaldi for sharing my tune Deep End today on Insta. So, so mad. Here's me playing it in my room today. I said the song didn't release until the end of January, so how did he post it in December? Well, she had herself performing an acoustic version. If you go to her channel and the comments on that specific video, you can see people commenting, Louis Capaldi just posted your channel on his Instagram story. If you're not familiar with Louis Capaldi, he's basically a huge star from the UK. He had this really big song, Someone You Loved, that you've most likely heard at least once. But funny enough, it's a strange coincidence that he just finds this video and decides to post it on his Instagram store. And then he brings her on his tour. Her most popular music video on YouTube for her debut song, Deep End, has comments saying, Now Horn from One Direction sent them there from his Instagram story. Doja Cat was listening to this song on live. This song randomly appeared thanks to the algorithm. Some people got it as an ad, etc. She performs her two songs at the time for Jimmy Kimmel, and the music video, or the video I should say, only has 36k views of the performance. She's put on the cover of New Music Daily on Apple Music, and her music on that playlist. Apple Music host Rebecca Judd says, I feel like I witnessed Holly Humberstone's career unfold right in front of me. So did I. She was one of my first ever ascending artists on the show earlier on in the year, when she had literally just released her first ever single. How fortunate. To see her go from strength to strength to now, be Apple Music's up next artist, has been so beautiful to watch. Her talent and songwriting is undeniable, and the way she effortlessly writes about love and life makes her one of the most exciting artists around right now. Humberstone added, being an Apple Up Next artist and being supported by Apple Music is so huge to me. I feel like I'm still at an early stage in my career and just so overwhelmed with love. Really lucky to have such an amazing team of people backing me. I remember watching Claro's performance on Jimmy Kimmel over and over this time last year and thinking how amazing it was and wanted that so much for myself. And a year on, I get to do all this cool stuff too. Thank you so much, Apple Music, for letting me do all this. I'm so full of love and excited to be a part of this. You would think that an artist that is getting all of this press, all of this playlisting, all of these cosigns from stars in the music industry would have a ton of fans, but that's not the case at all. There are SoundCloud rappers that have more fans than her. But this is all the process of building her fan base through these industry plant means. But keep in mind, they also need to make sure to paint that organic come up story like they did for Billie Eilish. And they do a great job of that in her New York Times article. After high school, she spent a year at a performing arts college in Liverpool before dropping out to move back home. By that time though, she was already beginning to work on her own music, commuting to London for her burgeoning career. Eventually, she crossed paths with Milton. She and her friends had been fans of his earlier indie pop band, Dog Is Dead, which put out music around a decade ago. Rather than working in sleek London studios, they collaborated in the basement of his home in Nottingham, building her sound from the ground up. Rather than signing to a label, Humberstone made a deal with Platoon, an artist services company that also placed early bets on Georgia Smith and Eilish. I do think Holly is a lot like Billy, said Denzel Fiegelson. So do I, Platoon's founder in a phone interview. They have a sense about them as to their mood and their emotions and how they write their songs. During the months that Humberstone has been back at home, she's been chipping away at promotional work, music videos, 
social media clips, sometimes with her family helping out behind the scenes. The result has been a DIY feeling rollout, an unintended fitting consequence of being stuck in your child at home as you're on the verge of outgrowing it for good. It's already mapped out for her. She spent a year at art college, then dropped out and moved back home and going back and forth to London, but worked in the basement of her producer, Milton, building their sound up. It's so similar to the whole Billie Eilish story, except the age. It's insane. It screams, we are authentic, and is really easy to get behind if you're a fan, but makes no mention of how much mainstream support she's getting or how she acquired the mainstream support. That always has to remain a mystery because it punctures a hole in this huge bubble of mystery, which is the transition from being some girl who was making music in someone's basement to suddenly on tour with a global superstar. It appeals so much to people because that is how the majority think of life. Their idea isn't that of Kaizen or getting 1% better every day to reach your goals. It's that one day some magic event is going to happen where I get everything I want. There are people in their late 20s and even in their 30s that still one day believe they're going to be rich. But the path they're on makes it impossible for that to happen. This is what the lottery preys on as well. And plenty of music artists think some event like this will happen to them. So they go from unknown to suddenly making millions, which is unrealistic. The majority of professional music artists did not have that happen to them. But this story is presented so much people accept it as the normal thing. Painting this story makes it even easier to support artists that are industry plants because subconsciously people tell themselves, wow, I was or I am in that exact same similar position. Maybe some stroke of luck will hit me too. Platoon has moved into a burgeoning market in music, and that is Africa. For the past three years, Platoon has been striking licensing and service deals with acts in countries like South Africa, Ghana, and Nigeria, offering advances, distribution, and support to 88 African musicians, and quietly becoming a major player amid an industry-wide shift toward establishing a larger footprint on the continent. Fiegelson has also been exploring new kinds of offerings that position the company as a one-stop finishing school that can make artists the CEOs of, well, themselves. I want artists to be able to manage their music on our platform, get services like healthcare, legal and accounting, learn about publishing, touring, how you market, and conquer things like YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Twitch, says Fiegelson. Because if I help them grow their businesses, it's only helping us grow our business too. And we're doing that in all kinds of ways. This is no surprise, and give some sort of support to my hypothesis that Apple is trying to build a wave of self-sufficient artists who won't need record labels, and that will benefit them as well in the long run. African music is very popular in the UK, Europe, and even in some places in Latin America. While it may not have really permeated into the United States yet, it has massive potential, and they're tapping into that potential. Funny enough, one of the new African acts they're working with or basically planting, is Nissi, who is famous African artist Burna Boy's sister. On August 9th, Nissi posted to her Instagram, Thank you everybody, Ignite is trending on all music platforms. It shows it on all these playlists on her Instagram post, but if you go to Spotify, where you can see the actual plays of the song, it only has 38,000 plays. How is it possible that it could be trending on Spotify with that few plays? Not just Spotify, but all platforms. I'm sure some of you watching this are artists that have hit that number or more. Were you trending? If we take a look at her about page, we can see that all of the playlists she's discovered on are Spotify editorial playlists. She has 748 followers and 16,000 monthly listeners, which is about a 4% ratio. But one very clever thing they're doing with her page is that they're putting her on playlists that have a smaller following. And I think this is to grow her fan base in a way that seems organic. If they suddenly put her on playlists with millions upon millions of followers, it's kind of like overdosing it. But regardless, this artist is clearly not hot by any means when you look at these numbers. 
On YouTube, the music video for her song Ignite, released on September 22nd, 2020, has 531,000 views and 462 likes on it. That ratio is entirely off. And it only has 63 comments as well. So they're inflating the numbers for her and will likely continue to do so. It's funny that in the Billboard article it reads, Fiegelson says that Platoon pitches its artists to all digital service providers equally, without favor from Apple, and doesn't get access to Apple Music data beyond what the company shares with all of its partners. I believe the second part of the data and what it shares with its partners. But yeah, I'm quite sure they don't get favor from Apple when Mr. Easy was an up next artist who was one of their signees, Billie Eilish was an up next artist who was one of their signees, Holly Humberstone is an up next artist who is one of their signees, and Victoria Monet, also an up next artist, one of their signees. It also just so happens that all of their artists' entire Discovered On playlists just so happen to be Spotify editorial playlists, even for tiny artists. They have more editorial playlisting than independent artists with millions of plays on their music and hundreds of thousands of followers on Spotify. Remember when I briefly touched on Rory in the beginning of this video? He was the one who wore an industry plant t-shirt for his XXL freshman cover. Well, he was the first signee to the now record label and management company LVRN Co, or Love Renaissance. I thought it was his company from how much he promoted it when he got on. But after Rory's debut album All We Need flopped, rumored to have sold 700 copies first week, things got quiet for him. It was one of the best debut albums of the past decade if you're interested in checking it out. Rory blended folk and hip hop so amazingly well, and it's refreshing to hear even today when everything sounds so similar in the genre. But Rory was never the individual to be controlled, and he said himself when he was trying to get dropped by his record label. Our interview didn't last long, but during our conversation, Rory revealed that after a two-year struggle with his label, Columbia Records and Management, Atlanta's own Love Renaissance, he asked both parties to release him from his contracts. I want out of the label when the people who believed in me transition jobs to be replaced by strangers who don't know me, Rory explained in detail in the follow-up email. I went to Coachella without any support from the label. It was like they were trying to put me in a position of fear and weakness so I could run out of money and they could control me. I would rather die than be controlled. I would rather take my career on a path where I can play with my friends, stay with my family, and remain physically, psychologically, and spiritually well. I'm sick and bored with everything these record labels have been offering fans, he continued. The fans are not having fun. The artists may love the fans, but the management and label don't. So the relationship between the fan and artist is built like God and worshiper, when it should be artists serving the people. Sadly, they tell us to come into this square, oppressive, dark, dingy building, get sweaty and drunk, and be told to put our hands up and jump. I think the fan is worthy of more of an experience. In a series of tweets Rory sent out, he said, Thanks for getting me to where you got me, LVRN, Justice, Junior, Carlin, Sean, Jimmy, Gotti, Trevin, Sean P, Michael Holt, Kipper, Hilson, forever family. Truth is, we just were never the same from day one, and I was always destined for something else, and so are y'all. But I wish it didn't have to hurt so much. I wish y'all would have told me y'all wish to focus on drum and black, and I should sort it out. But yeah, it's, man, truth is, spirit didn't align with y'all to be the one that managed Rory. You could never and would never get my purpose. From what I was able to gather from detailed research and study on Love Renaissance, Rory was the prototype for what they were building, which was their own stable of industry plants that they have succeeded with every single one after him. I initially found out about Six Lack through Rory. I thought Rory had signed him, but they had different plans for Six Lack, who himself was an industry plant. Everyone on Love Renaissance roster is an industry plan. Six Lack's breakout song Problems was initially released on the LVRN YouTube channel on June 5th, 2016. It was only a couple of months before it was everywhere, thanks to support from Apple Music playlisting. 
From Apple Music's inception, Carl Sherry was working there, eventually becoming head of artist curation before he would leave to be head of urban music at Spotify in May of 2018. But during his time at Apple, the first artist he broke was Bryson Tiller. And I'm sure many of you asked, how did Bryson Tiller go from being a nobody to suddenly his first album is an Apple Music exclusive, his first project, and he's everywhere. Six Lack came to Apple's attention courtesy of Carl Sherry, a music journalist who joined Apple as the company prepared for the introduction of Apple Music. Sherry identifies artists with the potential to be stars and champions them within Apple, pushing for their music to be featured on playlists, on the radio, and in commercials. Sherry was instrumental in the success of Bryson Tiller and Chance the Rapper, two acts he met well before they gained mainstream success. Their rise to stardom earned Sherry a promotion to oversee all artist curation at Apple Music. Carl got notoriety for what Apple Music did for Bryson, recalled Tunde Belogan, Six Lakhs manager and a leader of Atlanta music company Love Renaissance. Belogan talks to Sherry every week and introduced him to Six Lakh with a copy of two singles, Problems and Bless Me. Problems stuck out as an inevitable hit. So Sherry placed the song on the mood playlist, Problems, ranked as one of the 100 most popular songs on Apple Music within a couple of days. I've never seen anything that fast from someone no one knows, Sherry said. The song would eventually spend 16 weeks on the Billboard charts, but Logan now considers Sherry a member of Six Lakhs team. With the promotion from Apple, this summer is shaping up to be the biggest moment of Six Lakhs career. Next week, after the performance on Cordain's show, Six Lakhs will go on tour with the pop star of the weekend and hip-hop duo Ray Schremert. He will use data from Apple and its rivals to help decide when to release new music and where to tour. What a privilege he's provided. Streaming services are where you discover music, Belogan said. They are a one-stop shop that gives you better tools to help your artists succeed. There are tons of people who had Apple Music at that time, and Problems was a song by Six Like that you couldn't escape. It was everywhere, similarly with Bryson Tiller's Don't. Three songs released under LVRN for Six Like, and he is suddenly on all of these playlists, is getting all of these write-ups, and everyone is essentially forced to check him out after that. And don't take it from me, Carl Sherry said it himself. The objective is to really start a fire and have a song chart, Sherry says. Every time I premiere a song, I'm putting all my weight behind it to start some momentum for that song and artist. Let's take Six Lack, for example. Even though he's pre-Cosign, Six Lack was an artist that had absolutely no following. I may be extreme in saying that, but nobody knew who he was. And within his first week, Problems got a million streams. That's a metric. Within the first week, a guy that no one had heard about had the number three song on the R&B charts in the iTunes store. He sold 10,000 copies independently. <laughs> and then he was the number six streaming song on the chart. That was back in May. I always joke that Six Lack benefited from an accelerated and advanced Bryson formula just because I was able to do it quicker. But I was reaching out to all these people, like Republic's Charlie Walk, or Atlantic's Dallas Martin, or whoever, and saying, have you heard of this guy? I've never seen a song move that fast on Apple Music. And everyone's reaction was the same. Who is this guy? I've never heard of him, but this song is fire. When I started with Six Lack, I put it on one music playlist called Mood. The playlist started with Rihanna's Needed Me, and then right after that you had Six Lack's Problems. It was the second song. Imagine that, one of Rihanna's biggest songs that had released at that time, if pretty much anyone who had a decent song played after that, don't you think they would get a ton of attention? And two days later I was looking at the charts and all of a sudden I see problems. It was like number 69 or something. That was an indicator. If it's just doing that off one playlist, what happens if I put my whole weight behind it? They are plain as day telling us that yes, I have the power and access to all of these playlists, and if I like something, I'm going to turn it into a hit. It's a plug and play game at this point, and it's worse than anything we've ever seen in music history because this individual has a direct distribution channel, or at the time had a direct distribution channel, to nearly 100 million if on Apple Music. But that's not Spotify, which is over 300 million 
which is where he's currently at now. There has never been direct access to that many people you can put a song or album in front of, ever. Not even close. Radio even back then, there were tons of different stations, and even record labels had to approach all of these different stations and networks. Remember how I mentioned that a ton of these artists signed to Platoon were getting Up Next features on Apple Music? Well, guess who the first was to ever get this? Yes, Six Lack, signed to LVRN, back in April of 2017. Apple Inc. is introducing a program to promote young musicians with a month-long barrage of videos, playlists, and new music, deepening the technology giant's direct investment in artists through Apple Music. The first performer to benefit from the Up Next program is Six Lack, a 24-year-old Atlanta singer who released his debut album last fall. On Thursday, Apple released a short documentary about Six Lack, as well as video of a live recording session taped in Atlanta in an interview on Beats One, Apple Music's radio station. Beats One host Zane Lowe will introduce Six Lack on James Corden's late night talk show Thursday evening on CBS. And of course, and over the course of the next month, Apple will promote Six Lack songs on Apple Music playlists, Beats One, and the iTunes Store. Similar promotions with other artists will follow in the months to come. Apple executives hope the campaign will attract more artists and customers to its two-year-old music service, which has signed up more than 20 million customers since June 2015. With rivals YouTube, Pandora Media, and Spotify all offering support to musicians, Cupertino, California-based Apple is eager to show artists it can help them become stars and to lure fans with exclusive video and music. This isn't much different from what they did with Summer Walker. I won't get into too much detail on her in this video because I made an entire detailed video on her titled The Story of Summer Walker. It will be in the top right cards, you can check it out there. But she had no fans or anything, and then suddenly she's a star on all of these playlists and has features with all of these artists. And yes, she too was named Apple Music's Up Next Artist in January of 2019. The inevitable and tired retort that people instinctively come out with is, who cares if they're an industry plan, if the music is good? That music being good or not is subjective, and if you don't have enough self-respect to dislike the fact that you're being deceived by people presenting to you an organic growth of an artist when they were anything but, then you should at least look at the second order thinking of something like this. There's also the question of, whether or not you care about independent artists who don't have connections, because how are they going to compete when they're in a race with only one leg compared to the luxuries all these artists I've shown today are getting? First order thinking is, okay, so what? I'm getting good music forced onto me. That's great. But second order thinking is, if these entities can tell you exactly what to listen to, then they can also tell you exactly what not to listen to. And now it's a matter of control. We've already seen this happen to two rappers this year, 6 9 being the first, who I did a very detailed video on his downfall with streaming services shutting him down. It'll be in the top right cards. Go check it out. I said he was only the test run in that video, and there would be many more to come. And the second was Tory Lanez. Carl Sherry was one of the individuals 6 9 called out as blackballing him from any playlisting. Take a look at this clip from a conversation Joe Budden and DJ Academics were having on Instagram Live. The part the public misses is a lot of these big time companies, academics, will change their whole business model right before your very eyes. Listen, a few years back, Spotify was all about the consumer experience. Spotify was all about letting, it was all about making the consumer happy. Somehow it went from that to playlisting. Playlisting was the big bet, right? Yep. And then it went from that to something else. When this switches, people switch. Uh, yeah. The goals switch. Spotify at one point was about the consumer and user experience, optimizing it for them, seeing what they enjoy listening to, and trying to give them more of that. But it transitioned now into telling them what to listen to with all of these playlists they're pushing 
And this is a great time to pull up this image or graph. This is called the law of diffusion of innovation. And it's a theory that explains how, why, and the speed at which new ideas or technologies spread. A good example of this was the repopularization of Hush Puppies, the shoe that is covered in Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point. In 1994, sales of the shoe were down to 30,000 pairs a year, and only very small shoe stores like mom and pop shops, as well as thrift stores were stocking them. And this is when the hipsters in Lower Manhattan started buying them up because they wanted to look unique. These are the innovators. They seek what nobody else is doing and they hop on it. They would wear these shoes to the bars and clubs and people started to want them because these hip young adults were wearing them. These are the early adopters, the people that followed the hipsters, some of which were fashion designers that began to feature these shoes in their collections. But then something strange happened. At a fashion shoot, two Hush Puppies executives ran into a stylist from New York who told them the classic Hush Puppies had suddenly become hip in the clubs and bars of downtown Manhattan. Fans were buying Hush Puppies at resale shops in the village and Soho. Designer John Bartlett suddenly requested that Hush Puppies recreate its signature patterns in bright colors for his February 1995 New York Fashion Week show. Next, Manhattan designer Anna Sui called Hush Puppies for multicolored runway shoes. Los Angeles designer Joel Fitzgerald installed a 25-foot inflatable Hush Puppies-inspired basset hound on the roof of his Hollywood store and gutted an adjacent art gallery to create an organic Hush Puppies boutique. Paul Rubens bought a couple of pairs of suede shoes at the boutique. Word spread, the big dogs were barking. Once the fashion shows put them out there, the early majority now hops on them because they follow the trends dictated by the early adopters. And from there, everyone comes. You can see the chasm or the chasm or the tipping point. So this shoe went from selling 30,000 a year to 430,000 pairs in 1995 and in 1996, well over a million pairs. This is exactly how platforms like Spotify, Apple Music really blew up. Apple Music not so much because it had the brand behind it. Spotify had to build from the ground up. Spotify cared a lot early on about giving real diehard music lovers, who were the innovators, the best experience possible. They needed to do so because they had barely any users. These are the music lovers that type in the search bar the exact artist they want to listen to, not clicking on some playlist and seeing what someone else has put on the menu for them the type to scour SoundCloud for hidden gen, to check out Bandcamp and see what new music there is on there. This is the small segment of the population that got platforms like Spotify off its feet and attracted the early adopters. They continued the same approach, but there came a point in time, like Joe Budden is talking about, when Spotify went way past the tipping point, way past the chasm, and if I had to guesstimate, they're somewhere around the late majority right now. Once you pass that early majority, those innovators that were so powerful, meaningful, and important to your business in its inception, and you were trying to satisfy them, become disposable. After all, they only make up 2.5% or less of your base, and they've been using the platform for so long, it's unlikely that they leave. And even if they do leave, who cares, right? They've run their course and served their purpose. And now Spotify, as well as Apple Music, go from optimizing the listener and consumer experience to give them what they want, to telling them what to listen to and dictating that for them. The scales of power have tipped all the way to the other side. And that's where the power comes to blackball certain artists, such as 6 9 and Tory Lanez. It's important to note that Spotify said this exact quote in their statement. We created concern that an allegation might affect artists' chances of landing on a Spotify playlist and negatively impact their future. Some artists even worried that mistakes made in their youth would be used against them. That's not what Spotify is about. We don't aim to play judge and jury. We aim to connect artists and fans, and Spotify playlists are a big part of how we do that. Leaving the fact that 6 9 served his time, and the only quote-unquote crime he committed was that of telling, we go to Tory Lanez, whose surprise album Daystar, while it was number one on Apple Music, trending at number one, 
it received zero editorial playlisting from Spotify as well as Apple Music, and was not even put on the new releases section of Apple Music. Everything that happened to Tory Lanez up until that point in time was an allegation. He was not arrested, nor was he charged for what Megan Thee Stallion and everyone else was accusing him, but also playing judge and jury. Things have changed now, but at the time, keep in mind, there was zero proof other than someone's word. But I want to know what is the rule? Is it beating or shooting at females? If so, then Anneli Chapa has a tweet that is still up where he says, I shot at that hoe before she got pregnant, in reference to his baby mother. He was on the cover of Get Turn playlist on Spotify. He's currently getting editorial playlisting on both Spotify and Apple Music. The same thing with NBA Youngboy, who there's video footage of him throwing his girlfriend against the wall and when she had a black eye, but he's on every single editorial playlist. I'm not saying to remove NLE Chapa or Youngboy. I want them both to continue having success and be placed on all these playlists alongside rappers like 6 9 and Tory Lanez if they have hot songs. Because the way things are going right now, not only is it unfair, it's picking and choosing. And this is where the power comes in. That was two years ago when TDE came in and threatened to pull their music from Spotify. Well over two years ago, two and a half. Let's say TDE tried to do the same thing on behalf of Tory Lanez this year. Do you think Spotify and or Apple Music would comply? I wouldn't be surprised if Spotify said, okay, see you later, we don't care. Because it would be TDE losing out on a ton of money. Playlisting has been compared to radio, but it's way more powerful than radio. It has the music discovery of SoundCloud and radio, but it also pays. So it's blended in with music sales. If you're not getting the playlisting, you're missing out on so much music sales, and Apple Music and Spotify have trained the consumer to not buy music. Check out this clip of Denzel Figelson from 2007 at the same talk I introduced in the beginning of this video. And as, as I know from having the lucky seat of, of, of working um, with a company like iTunes, you know, what we see as the, as the major competition are the people who are, who are downloading for free. And it's, I don't think it's ever something that will go away. You know, free is a very difficult thing to pass down. However, as we provide better and better services for consumers, we'll get them away from free. And, and really that is the key, is to provide a better customer user experience. Spotify and Apple Music, alongside YouTube, have nearly eliminated piracy of music, which was at an all-time high not too long ago. There were several reasons for piracy. The first was pricing. People didn't want to pay for every single album that released. It would put too much of a dent in their pockets. The second was convenience. It came to a point where people would rather just have a digital version of the music to put on their iPod or iPhone, and CDs were a massive pain. But also, people couldn't justify paying for something that wasn't a tangible object like a CD. But over time, Spotify and Apple Music made the customer experience so great, including the three month free trial that Apple Music gave and the free version of Spotify, that even people who used to pirate everything organized their whole iTunes library. They saw the convenience and said, $10 a month or $5 a month if I'm a student is such a steal in terms of pricing and the value is so high that it's worth just paying this instead of continue to pirate music. And that's dangerous because whenever we're sold convenience or comfort, it makes it easier to control us from all things like privacy when it comes to applications like Facebook. And in the case of music streaming, once you've bought into it, it's unlikely for you to go back to how things were. And now Apple Music and Spotify are in control of telling you exactly what to listen to. And it's almost as if they make it difficult to authentically discover something new. And the question becomes, are people like Larry Jackson and Carl Sherry, the ones who get to decide who and what people do or do not listen to. And just keep in mind, if you're the type of individual that doesn't check out playlists, you are in the absolute minority. You're less than 1%. 99% of people just use these playlists because it's convenient. 
It's totally up to their discretion whether they like you or not. And if they do not like you, in the case of Tory Lanez and 6 9 then they can hurt your pockets and reach. Centralized power like that is something the music industry does not need. Because at this current point in time, it looks like gatekeepers and blackballing is stronger than it ever was in history. And I only see it getting worse from here. Independent artists will suffer the most because if an artist is signed to a major record label, then if they're blackballed or not shown any support, the head, being Universal, Warner, or Sony, could make a phone call to Spotify or Apple. They could threaten to pull their entire catalog if Spotify doesn't comply, which is not the same as TDE pulling their catalog. Those big three players own nearly the entire music catalog out there. But if you're independent, nobody's going to bat for you. And what's worse is that these companies, mainly Universal and Sony, own a stake in Spotify as a company. Warner sold all their shares in Spotify, getting over $500 million for it. So in the case of Universal, Sony, and Spotify, their interests are aligned. When have record labels ever had ownership in not only their music, but radio stations as well, which is the playlist, and the music shops, and the record stores? And what's the equivalent of record stores in large scale since streams pay out money? and make up the majority of music industry revenue that continues to go up year after year. At this point in time, YouTube as a platform is the only one that has shown itself to be unbiased in the case of what people perceive artists as bad or good. They allowed for 6 ix 9 song to accumulate views, be recommended, and get on trending, as well as Tory Lane's song to accumulate views, be recommended, and get top 3 on trending. It has come to a point where we as listeners decide to either sacrifice the convenience of Apple Music and or Spotify because what they're doing and continue doing is wrong and hurts the future of independent artists or those that don't have these connections. Because after all, a record label only has stronger negotiating power over an artist who's unsigned when it tells them that they may be self-sufficient right now but they have almost no chance of getting in Spotify editorial playlists unless they sign to them, as if they needed any more leverage. But even if people were in an uproar and canceled their accounts, it would likely only be the innovators. The majority of people don't know, and if they did know, they don't care unless it's harming them. So is it too late? Apple Music and Spotify went from how can we best service the consumer and connect artists with fans to planning artists essentially forcing people to listen to them and playing judge, jury, and executioner with those they perceive as unnecessary and they don't like. We do not and we have never created fake artists and put them on Spotify playlists. Categorically untrue, full stop. A Spotify spokesperson wrote in an email, we pay royalties, sound and publishing for all tracks on Spotify and for everything we playlist. We do not own rights, we're not a label, all our music is licensed from rights holders and we pay them. We don't pay ourselves. This was a statement that a spokesman from Spotify put out in 2017 but what would make Spotify feel the need to address publicly the accusation of not only creating fake artists, but also playlisting them and somehow paying themselves money from that revenue? That's what we're going to explore today. The year is 2020, it's fall, and we had just witnessed both 6 9 and Tory Lanez get completely blackballed from all editorial playlisting on both Spotify and Apple Music. If you're unfamiliar with what those things are or how important they are, editorial playlists are playlists that Spotify or Apple or any other streaming service have either created or currently own and they choose who gets placed on them. They usually have hundreds of thousands if not millions of followers and a placement on just one of the big playlists can accumulate millions and millions of streams for a song. The fact that they would effectively shadow ban two artists made me more intrigued to look into how playlists worked, and I went down a rabbit hole that took me far away from 6 9 and Tory Lanez and into alleged fake artists, 
record label finessing, and the biggest one being how much of a market there was for music that had nothing to do with mainstream artists. It started off like this. I wanted to know how many independent artists were getting slots on editorial playlisting. Big editorial playlist. So I had a friend of mine write up some code. You see, every playlist has a number of slots. For instance, Rap Caviar, one of Spotify's biggest playlists with over 14 million followers and the biggest hip-hop playlist, has 50 slots on it. Everyone is fighting to get a slot, if not multiple on this playlist, if they are rappers or represent rappers. And if you look at the bottom of any album or single, there will be credits and ownership for who distributed the song and who has rights to the song. What I asked them to do was write some code that would give us the following information. Scan through every single editorial Spotify playlist that has over 500,000 followers. We only wanted the big playlists, not the ones that have a couple of thousand. Dismiss any playlists that have this is underscore or I love my genre slash era playlists. For example, there's a Spotify playlist called this is XXX Tentacion or this is Drake and for many other artists. Of course, all of these will be songs by said artist and owned by their label. Some of them are even algorithmic if you start talking about XXX Radio or Drake Radio. They would skew the results. The same with the I Love My 90s playlist or things like that. The code would also list us the songs and artists from said label that were put on these playlists. We ran this for a month from October 24th to November 21st recording the results for each week, and the results were quite shocking. On October 24th of 2020, coming in at number one, we had Columbia Records with 566 playlist positions. Not a surprise, Columbia Records has some of the biggest artists in the world, and in 2020, they had a ton of hit songs. In the top 10, you also see familiar company like Atlantic Records, Warner Records, RCA, big names we all recognize. But at number two is what made me scratch my head at first. What the hell is Firefly Entertainment and why do they have 385 playlist positions, the second most ahead of some of the biggest record labels in the world? The data kept coming in. On November 8th, Firefly was number two again with 358 playlist positions. November 15th, they fell just a little bit down to number three with 339 playlist positions. And on November 21st, they would fall to number four with 319 playlist positions. Still in the top five record labels in the whole world when it came to editorial playlist slots ahead of big players in the game such as Interscope, Epic, Universal, Capital, and many others. I needed to find out what Firefly was, who was a part of it, and why they were getting so many playlist positions. Because I need to reiterate to you, these are not algorithmic playlist positions. These are hand-picked and chosen by people working at Spotify. Firefly Entertainment's website gave me no help. As a matter of fact, it left me even more befuddled. Firefly Entertainment is an independent and modern record label with a proven track record of global success, and proudly, we call ourselves home to a roster of world-class pop artists, producers, and creators from all over the world. Our love for giving people their everyday soundtrack led us to develop Firefly Wellness, a vast collection of instrumental tracks for lifestyle and health. We have a growing catalog of over 7,000 tracks and achieved over 5 billion streams globally. Firefly Entertainment is a global company formed in 2010 with our headquarters in Sweden. Okay, so an independent record label, one that is not under the umbrella of Sony Music, Warner, or Universal, is ranking number two in playlist slots on Spotify. Doesn't make sense to me. And when you take a look at the roster of Firefly, none of their artists currently have more than 2.5 million monthly listeners. And I guarantee most of you haven't heard of any of them. But Sweden, that was one thing that was a slight clue because Spotify was started and still has a headquarters in Stockholm, Sweden, the capital. After looking into some of the artists on the list that wasn't on the website of Firefly, but the one that the program returned us, I have all of these paste bins in the description if you want to look at these artists and the songs that were playlisted. It returned us every artist and song on the playlist. Things got a little weird. 
a lot of these quote-unquote artists weren't really artists. There was a name, maybe some sort of profile picture or avatar that looked like a stock image, and no bio or about section on their Spotify. Yet, they had editorial playlisting and tracks with millions of streams. Here's a couple of examples. Arush Mandal. This artist currently has over 500k monthly listeners. Compassion, a song with 13 million streams. Senses, a song with 17 million streams. Way of Life, a song with 11.5 million streams. Yet there is nothing about this person that is Googleable, no about on their Spotify, no Instagram link to anywhere. It's a ghost. And all of these songs were distributed and owned by Firefly Entertainment. Could this be a real person? Possibly. As a matter of fact, the most recent release on this artist's page called Transcendence no longer has Firefly at the bottom. But with over 500,000 monthly listeners, the songs have an abysmal stream count of under 3,000 each. Some of the editorial playlists that this artist was found on were the following. Sleep, with over 4.5 million followers. Sueño Profundo, with over 1.6 million followers, which is just another sleep playlist. Stress Relief, with over 1 million followers, and many others. How about Eric Reno? 160,000 monthly listeners with well over six songs in the millions of views, a profile picture of some nature, no about page, no information about him on the internet, and no release of music since 2020. Some of the playlists that these songs were on are the following. Deep Focus, with over 3.6 million followers. Ambient Relaxation, with over 1 million followers. And many other Spotify editorial playlists with under 500k followers. The original expose was done in an August 2016 article on Music Business Worldwide titled, Spotify is making its own records and putting them on playlists. Quite a bold claim to make. Multiple cast iron sources have informed us that, in recent months, Daniel X Company has been paying producers to create tracks within specific musical guidelines. We're also hearing that these producers receive a flat fee for their work, in addition to studio and musician expenses, but Spotify holds on to the master copyright. Publishing rights, we understand, may be up for grabs. These fake artists are credited on Spotify with owning their own master rights. That is not the case for Firefly Entertainment artists, which we'll circle back to later. But they don't, because they're made up people. They go on to say, MBW understands that Spotify is instructing producers to create tracks, typically without vocals, which fit certain genres and themes, including jazz, chill, and peaceful piano playing. Hmm, why? Would Spotify be instructing producers to write and record tracks of this nature? Bingo. To appear on some of its relaxing first-party playlists, which boasts millions of followers between them. MBW is 100% sure that these tracks exist. We've even heard some of them. We promised our sources we wouldn't tell you who the fake artist names are, so we won't. But we can tell you that we're aware of five Spotify-owned tracks that each have more than 500,000 streams and one with over a million. Even the majors don't know about this, one source told them. If they did, it would be bound to cause some interesting debate, especially during licensing negotiation time. This was the first public rumbling of fake artists, and I don't think it quite captured the extent to which this goes. The questions that are likely running through your mind are, why would Spotify do something like this? What do they have to benefit from it? Well, keep in mind this was 2016. This has probably been going on since 2014 or 15. The future of streaming was shaky, from the perspective of record labels. Streaming only made up $4.7 billion in revenue for the music industry in 2016, which pales in comparison to the whopping nearly $17 billion in revenue streaming generated for the music industry in 2021, nearly four times over. And the future was also shaky with record labels. What if they pulled their catalogs? There was licensing negotiations going on. What if their monetary demands from Spotify to allow them to keep their music streaming in their library was too high? They would sensibly need something to offset that. Don't put all your eggs in one basket type of thinking. Especially because in 2016, there was a period of time where Spotify was out of contract with all three major labels, Sony, Warner, and Universal, for the 55% revenue share they paid to music rights holders. One huge example of this was when Spotify decided to blackball none other than Katy Perry. 
We will dive deeper into this topic in a future video. But you remember in 2016, the era where rappers and musicians were constantly getting exclusive releases on platforms like Tidal, Apple, or Spotify, and how that suddenly one day, poof, just ended. Well, Spotify, while in negotiations, decided to show how much power they wealth. And when Katy Perry released her song Rise, we'd find out. It was written with the Olympics in mind, and it was set to be the Olympics song, and wouldn't be released on Spotify until a week after it had been on iTunes and Apple Music. It debuted at number 11 on the Hot 100, but it plummeted soon after despite being featured consistently through NBC's coverage of the Olympics. You can't get a better sync deal than that. Rise did not get a spot on a Spotify editorial playlist until a month after it was released, and it was on a 443,000 follower playlist at the time called Spotify Pops Rising for a song that had just flopped a month after and by a superstar Katy Perry nonetheless. Putting it on Pops Rising was more so just making a statement. The single flopped. This is possibly where the whole fake artist thing started. This is my personal belief. Spotify saw what people were searching for on their platform. They saw this massive rise in people looking for mood music, whether it was soothing baby music, white noise to go to sleep to, music to go to sleep to, classical, study music, any number of other keywords. So they began creating playlists for them. At the same time, there was pressure from all these exclusive deals and record labels could have potentially pulled their catalogs. There was only one problem though. With all these playlists created, and there being 50 slots on each playlist, they needed to fill these slots up with tracks. And it looks odd if all 50 slots are by one artist or two. So what I think they did is Spotify, or a company closely affiliated with Spotify, commissioned artists to create this type of music. They bought it from them, they labeled them with quote unquote fake artist names, and threw them on these playlists to satisfy the demand from Spotify users for this type of music. Another company that had a similar output as Firefly Entertainment, although didn't get as much playlisting, was Epidemic Sound. Some of you may have heard of it. In the 2020 data that I collected, they were in the top 10 record labels with slots on Spotify editorial playlists. They're based in Stockholm, Sweden, and are a royalty-free soundtrack company. Basically, you pay a monthly fee to access their music library, and you have the rights to use their music for commercial purposes. The way they do this is by commissioning artists to create music, and they pay them up front for the full rights. That way, they can do whatever they want with it. Well, there was a rumor that Epidemic Sound was another company pushing quote-unquote fake artists. So much so that a record label executive was upset by what they were doing. It had come out that Swedish production duo Quiz and LaRossi were behind creating the music for at least 50 different fake artists. The thought process for people investigating this was, what if Spotify is commissioning Epidemic Sound to create these songs with the intention or guarantee of them being placed on these playlists that have millions of followers? It would be in both of their best interests. Epidemic Sound makes their money from the subscriptions, so this would be bonus money and Spotify could theoretically collect 100% of the streaming revenue since none is given to the artists who originally created it. The CEO and co-founder of Epidemic Sound, Oscar Hoagland, who started off as a music producer himself, responded to these allegations, saying the following, It is correct that some of the composers on your list work with Epidemic Sound. The music that they produce was not commissioned by Spotify, and these are certainly not fake artists. That term is offensive. These are professional composers who earn a living by creating quality music, as is often the case with songwriters and indeed mainstream pop acts. Some composers choose to work under their real names, while some prefer to use pseudonyms. Epidemic Sound has been making music for almost 10 years. Our tracks generate more than 10 billion views per month on YouTube and Facebook alone. Consequently, we receive many requests for our music to become available via streaming platforms. 12 months ago, we started to distribute some of our music via Spotify. This is a great platform for composers as it increases their income and gives them the recognition they deserve. One question is why did they distribute it via Spotify and not all streaming platforms? The tracks are, are of a very high quality and as a result are picked up by the curators at Spotify for their playlists. We and our composers are proud that the songs feature on these playlists. When it comes to the quality of the music, he's not lying. 
There have been plenty of people praising how great the composers were of the classical tracks and many of the other music that is put on these playlists. The one thing that was slightly fishy at the time was that Epidemic Sound, like I said, was only on Spotify. Why would they limit themselves to just one platform when they could distribute it to Apple Music as well? And if they weren't directly commissioned by Spotify or had some exclusive deal with them, they would have no reason not to have it on every platform. Since then, things have changed and their catalog is available on Apple Music. But that doesn't mean there wasn't a link between Spotify and Epidemic Sound outside of them both starting out in Sweden. In 2014, Epidemic Sound received a $5 million investment from a Swedish venture capital firm by the name of Creandum. This company has invested in many technology companies and apps, some really big ones being Depop, that started off as a clothing marketplace between users, Klarna, the company that allows people to split payments when they buy products online, and Kahoot, the online learning platform. But the biggest of all, in our case today, and what is a definitive tie-in, is that in 2008, Creandum was the first big investor to put money into Daniel X company Spotify. And if you go to the Creandum webpage, he has a big header there, as he should. They're proud of how big that company has performed within their portfolio. This would be the part in the video where someone who's more willing to make a big reach would say, this is a strong connection. Creandum invested in both of these companies. They can work amongst each other and help Epidemic Sound with more playlisting and revenue, while also sharing in that revenue without having to deal with the major record labels. I don't think that's the case, though. If anything, Perhaps someone just linked them up and Spotify and Epidemic Sound had an easier time working together because Creandum is not a music investment firm or even a firm that only invests in music related companies. Their companies are across various industries from insurance, finance, electric vehicle chargers, grocery delivery, automotive trading, a digital veterinary clinic, and the list goes on. If it was just music based, I would be more willing to go with that reach. But with this information, I'm just not. Not to mention Creandum has since exited working with Spotify and cashed out. They are still invested and involved with Epidemic Sound though. Where does this leave us? Well, this left me at an impasse. There was no more information available to dig up about Firefly Entertainment. This idea was unfinished, so I just sat on this video and script until now. A Swedish newspaper, DN, did a story on how Firefly Entertainment makes their money and how much money they made. This is something that's made public in Sweden due to their laws, even though Firefly Entertainment is not a public company. And like I showed you guys in the data earlier, Firefly is still top 10 with the most playlist positions in the current year. In 2020, Firefly Entertainment generated over 65 million Swedish krones which converted to $6.2 million. This was a 67% increase in profits from the previous year, which is outstanding. Keep in mind that there are some outside elements such as the pandemic perhaps that likely made mood music and their playlists a lot more popular and in demand for that year. This article also compiled a massive list of 830 quote unquote fake artists connected to Firefly and nearly 500 of them that were getting slots on the major Spotify editorial playlist. Theirs is 2022. The list that I'm linking of some of them supposed fake artists in my description are from 2020 as well. So you have 2020 data and 2022 data. DN was also able to look into STIM, which is the Swedish music publishing body and found that the music created by over 500 of these fake artists was created by only 20 songwriters. They also claim that they found one composer who's the creator of the music behind 62 fake artists, cumulatively 7.7 .7 million monthly listeners between all of them. Firefly Entertainment CEO Peter Klassen finally responded to this new information with a statement. There is no direct relationship with Spotify or any other way that could affect the playlist. As for the number of songs on Spotify's playlist, we defer to Spotify, which controls the process for how songs get on playlists. And we would also like to strongly deny that there would be any kind of connection to Nick Holmston, who left Spotify in 2019. That would affect our business. Who is Nick Holmston, you ask? Another connection. This is tighter than the previous loose threads we were trying to tie a knot to this theory with when it came to Epidemic Sound and Spotify. Nick Holmston was formerly a Spotify executive. 
their global head of music to be exact. And DN made the claim that he had a close personal relationship with one of the founders of Firefly. That is what Firefly's CEO was trying to push to the side. But it's very difficult because even if this wasn't true and Nick Holmston left his position at Spotify in September of 2019 to work on his new company, this new company's relationship with Firefly Entertainment doesn't help either. Nick Holmston's new company is called TSX Entertainment. In a Variety press release, the following was said. Former Spotify head of music Nick Holmston has unveiled a plan to create a playground for artists in New York's Times Square, where musicians will be able to perform concerts, meet fans, sell merch, and create other experiences. Plans call for the development, which will include a street-facing stage and a retail space to open in 2022, pending pandemic-related restrictions. Holmston has joined forces with Fortress Investment Group to create a new entertainment company called TSX Entertainment that is executing the venture. He declined to reveal the amount of Fortress's investment. This is a vision of Disneyland for music meets Las Vegas, he said, adding that a digital component will amplify that moment globally. They're likely adding something to do with the metaverse since they hired DJ Ski to that position. But the connection here is that on Firefly Entertainment's site, they made their own press release announcing their partnership with none other than TSX Entertainment. The future is here and we're proud to announce Firefly Entertainment as one of the partners and investors of TSX Entertainment in New York. One of the most exciting and innovative happenings in the entertainment industry. Facing the busiest part of Times Square, TSX with its 46 story tower will be the future platform for the entertainment industry from music and beyond. From tomorrow's rising stars to icons of our time, TSX will be the massive megaphone over one of the busiest places in the world, with a stage fronting Times Square, hotels, retail space, food and beverage, TSX creates the space for artists, fans, and the industry to meet, grow, and build history together. If you're thinking about releasing anything in pop culture, I'm not just talking about music. If you want to cut through, you really need to think about how do I make that moment the biggest ever? How do we create the biggest megaphone ever? We do it at the most traffic corner in the universe that everybody knows. Times Square is one of a kind. Hell, what a partnership statement to make. If this isn't proof enough that Nick Holmston clearly had a strong relationship with Firefly over the years before he left, I don't know what is. It isn't definitive that he was giving them preferred playlisting or that he paid Firefly to create songs for these playlists, but at the very least, it looks like that when you put all of the other fishy pieces together. Firefly isn't the only mood music company that's creating fake artists, though. Epidemic Sound, which we covered earlier, is another, but Chill Me is one that we need to talk about. On March 27th, another Swedish paper, SVD, did an expose on Christer Sandlin, or Chrysler. On Spotify, 2,500 songs of his label's catalog have a total of over 2.5 billion streams which is on average 1 million streams per song. The annual revenue reports say that for the past five years, Chomi has generated anywhere between 540,000 US dollars to 1.7 million. But the question is, were all of these songs and artists created by one man? Well, if we were to follow Kanye West's formula of five beats a day for three summers, that would leave Sandlin with 1350 songs. And assuming he's making more songs than just in the summer, it's all the way possible. The most important publishing in this piece was that SVD stated as fact that Christer Sandlin and his company Chomi was commissioned directly by Spotify in 2015 to create instrumental music for their chill and mood playlists. They went on to say, these tracks soon appeared in playlists specifically designed to be in the background when studying, meditating, or sleeping. That's all we needed to know right there. Everything lined up. If they were paying Chomi, or at least requesting music, then it makes perfect sense similar deals were put in place for Epidemic Sound and Firefly that got way more playlisting slots and a bigger catalog of music.